Good evening. I'm Kalamazoo Deputy City Manager Jeff Chamberlain, and welcome to the City Commission meeting for the City of Kalamazoo of August 17th, 2020. Tonight's meeting is being streamed live on the city's Facebook page and the City of Kalamazoo's YouTube channel. You can also listen on your phone by calling area code 269-552-6425 and entering meeting ID number 9451202822 when prompted. And also you may leave a three minute public comment for tonight's meeting by calling area code 269-226-6573 and uh, just as a reminder, we, we do have one public comment per person uh, per public comment period. And with that, I would like to turn the night's meeting over to Kalamazoo City Mayor David Anderson. Thank you very much, Deputy City Manager Jeff Chamberlain. I appreciate it. So uh, welcome to tonight's meeting. I'm calling this meeting of Monday, August 17th, 2020 of the Kalamazoo City Commission to order. Clerk Borling, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Cunningham. Here. Commissioner Hess. Here. Commissioner Knott. Here. Commissioner Pradle. He is here. Commissioner Urban. Here. Vice Mayor Griffin. Here. Mayor Anderson. Here. Thank you, Clerk Borling. So for our opening ceremony tonight, we have an invocation that is gonna be provided by the Reverend David W. Zomer from Bethany Reformed Church. Pastor Zomer. Good evening, I'll say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for gathering these counselors together for each council person and their gifts that they bring to this table and to our city. We ask that you bless them with patience and with wisdom with softness of, of speech and courage when needed. Thank you for the ability for them to serve the people of Kalamazoo, no matter who they are. Amen. Thank you. Uh, no proclamations tonight. So at this point, we uh, go to the adoption of our formal agenda. Now, uh, just reflective of some conversations we wanna have I, I think we are a, a proposing a somewhat of an adjustment from our normal agenda tonight. So commissioners, you have before you the agenda for tonight's meeting. Uh, Manager Ritzma has, uh, I, I'm looking at this agenda. Do you have a change that you would like considered uh, for the order of tonight's meeting? Your Honor, I think Scott Borling is better able to explain all right, Clerk Borling, please. Yes, so the idea was was put out there that perhaps the commission might want to um, take up its action items before we get into uh, hearing public comments and, and receiving uh, some reports and updates. And um, if the commission wants to do that, uh, a way that would be relatively easy and clean to to do it is to um, to have a motion during this adoption of the agenda, or you know, if there's a consensus, um, to move public comments to after reports and legislation. The city manager could uh, give the updates he wants to give during reports and legislation, and then do public comments, and that would allow then um, the the action items to be considered first. So if that's if that's what the commission wants to do, that would be a relatively clean way to do it. So. Just to be clear about that, Clerk Borling, then, would the motion be to amend the agenda to switch the order of items D and E? No, it would actually be a, a motion to amend the order of business to move public comments to after reports and legislation. Okay, and reports and legislation then is item what? Uh, currently, reports and legislation is item I. I. Okay. And so, just for clarity, then, what we are proposing is to move public comments to where? 
to move Can I public. Interject Go ahead. Um, I, uh, just to interject, Mayor, uh, I would like to um, place a motion and just to make it simple, uh, I don't want to move public comment until after we make our decision. I don't want anybody to feel like their voice wasn't able to be heard. So I would just move to change um, the graphic package public hearing to before communications in the agenda. Okay. So public hearing then is, is uh, item what? Vice Mayor Griffin? It's item E. It would just be moving item E, what you said initially, moving item E and before D. Okay. So the suggestion is, is to move item E, communications, ahead of or item D, is that correct? E, the public hearing. That's move. D. Move that up before communication. All right. I mean, move it further down the agenda. I'm sorry. No, no. What I don't want to move it further down the agenda. I understand we're going to have conversation, and between that and public comment, if we keep the agenda the way it is, the conversation with graphic packaging, from my understanding, will not come until afterwards. Okay, so I what I want is a clear motion. Yeah, can I jump in here a second? I'm sorry. Um, yes, please. I think uh, it would be best to move public or uh, public comment uh, right after H1 of the regular agenda, because we've got other folks here for things on the consent agenda and regular agenda. And that way the public comment will be before the uh, first reading of the ordinance. And then we can proceed from there. So I'm suggesting F be moved to a after H1. I so move. So there's a I motion. I, so there's a mo motion to move item F, public comment, to after, to H1, is that correct, city manager? After H1. After H1, yep. After H1. Point of order, I think the vice mayor still has a motion on the table. Sure. Okay. I appreciate that, um, Commissioner Prado. Um, so possibly I was misunderstood about the direction and the need for a motion. Um, what needs to be said to clearly just allow for the group that's here to be able to present what they need to present. And then we continue on with the business that we need to take care of. Let me interject at this point, I, I, the group we're talking about is it the group from graphic packaging Yes. 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 Okay. Now that is a public hearing. So we've got to permit public to comment on that uh, matter. Right. And currently it is scheduled after communications. I don't know what there's going to be in the way of communications. My understanding is that if there's any discussion about the events of the weekend, that is going to take place under the city manager's report. There is some concern that if we start public comment before we get to the consent agenda, because there may be a lot of public comment, we might not get to the consent agenda until much later in the evening or early tomorrow morning. So the suggestion is uh, if there is not going to be any communication and I, the manager probably can inform us on that, then there is no need to, to move communications. We can have the public hearing involving the graphic packaging matter, and then we can proceed, if you wish, to move public comment, as was suggested, between uh, the, the two regular agenda items. Now, I, I would point out that the two regular amended items are, um, one is the, the uh, approval of the Parkview Hills um, 
neighborhood plan, and the other is the two ordinances regarding uh, non-discrimination. Those ordinances are not going to be adopted tonight. And so the, it is possible for the city commission to introduce them and listen to the public comments after they're, after they're introduced. Um, I don't know that the, you necessarily have to break up your regular agenda to insert public comments before you discuss the, the ordinance. So the, 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 the initial suggestion made by the clerk was to move public comment to just before uh, uh, our unfinished business, which is item J and after the city manager's report. So Vice Mayor, I understand that you made a proposal and there's obviously very specific intent. That was something that we had talked about earlier, which is how to have an opportunity for, for us to have a conversation, correct, as a commission? Is that the intent? And then yeah. where appropriately public comment should be relative to that? Well, yes, the initial, the, the initial point was where are we going to have a conversation within this meeting about the events that happened this weekend and where uh -huh. that was going to be placed and how that would affect the agenda. I right. realize that that could be lengthy and I'm fine with that. But if there are, are people or if there are things that need to get presented ahead of time, and perhaps I was confused about the order, I was under the impression that that discussion was going to take place earlier on in the meeting, thus a need for a change in the agenda. Um, but it sounds like there was not a plan on to have that conversation until the end of the meeting section I, which would be city manager's report. Um, so I'm just unclear where that conversation is going to take place. I mean, I, I don't want to stretch this out any longer. We, we have things we need to get to. So I guess, um, you know, I'm opening the listening, what anybody else has to say, I can take that motion back off the table. The, the, the agenda can stay the way it is, as long as we have space for that conversation, uh, where it gets placed, you know, is where it works best for everyone. All right, so I am open to suggestions about what makes the most sense in terms of taking care of our business and still giving ourselves, you know, a an opportunity that we don't always give ourselves, which is for community discussion, you know, commission discussion earlier on in the meeting. Um, my only question is, will there be public comment about the graphic packaging? And should we wait to hear that before we vote? I don't know if we're going to be have been able to separate out comments on the graphic packaging portion. Deputy City Manager Jeff Chamberlain? Yes, sir. They are separated out, and we do have... Uh, four comments so far that have come in tonight for the public hearing. Okay. Okay. So that's helpful. Thank you. So that said, is there a motion? Do we need to make a change to the agenda? Vice Mayor, are you staying with that motion from previous? So I guess to get clarification, where is the conversation going to happen? I think that would be the determining factor of whether or not we need to motion to change the agenda or not. Okay. And I, I can have that, we can have that conversation if we want it earlier under communications or back in my uh, city manager's report. Those would be the two good opportunities for that. Vice Mayor Griffin, do you have a preference there? Communications is item E. E. D. 
Vice Mayor, you're muted. Communications is item E. Okay, and your communications is item D. So you're asking me whether or e. not to do it. You said E. Yeah. E is in yes. It's in Mount Everest, which it seems like what we have to climb just to get our uh, agenda set for this evening. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't mean to throw be thrown off, but E is not showing that way in my in my packet. So it's just throwing. Oh, I'm me sorry. Off Okay. Uh, which may have been my problem to begin with if my packet didn't show. show Maybe up. mine's wrong, Vice Mayor. Okay. Um, can In I just public, suggest, public can I just suggest that um, City Manager Ritzema, uh, we have that discussion under the City Manager's report and follow through with all of our business and public comment to begin with. So we have the public comment as we work on our discussion of the weekend's events. That's a suggestion. Are people comfortable with that? I mean, I don't wanna just come in and just say, this is what it is. I'm not the only one here. Does anybody else have any input on how we go about having this discussion? Cause we're gonna have this discussion and uh, what I don't want to happen it is there to be, oh, we have to hurry up and get this done or uh, all of that, because if we have to take the time, we have to take the time. But I also acknowledge and we have the separation of the public comment, you know, so that's why I'm, I'm not just coming in and just saying I'm trying to see, you know, what other and thank you, Commissioner Hess and Commissioner Prado. I know you all have lifted up what you think. So. Yeah, I think for the public as well. I think part of our confusion is that our agendas are not matching, you know, the public agenda that Doesn't we're seem like I'm it. sitting now and it's not matching with what I think what you're looking off mayor. So I apologize to the public that we're both, that we have that incongruity. Um, you know, I'm with vice mayor in terms of just making sure that anything that we're going to vote on, that we have that opportunity to hear public input beforehand. So if it is at, later in the agenda, I'm totally fine with that as long as again, uh, to echo what, what Vice Mayor lifted up, I just want to make sure that we're not going to be rushed. All right. So I need a motion. If, if I may, I would, could I suggest that you, the, you move public comment just before the regular agenda? This would permit you to have the public hearing uh, on graphic packaging adopt the consent agenda, and then have public comment before the regular agenda, and that would also take place before the manager's report. Well, uh, I, Mr. Urban. Well, I think we wanna hear the, the city manager's report before the public comment. Uh, that's, that's, a, a, that's gonna shape a lot of public comment uh, that hasn't already been recorded. Uh, so I, I think we wanna move that up to, as well, don't we? <clears throat> I mean, we're, we're going to be here for a long time. So let's just uh, relax and uh, find how we can do this most uh, uh, credibly. So I'm looking for some clarity. Clyde made a proposal, which was to move public comment to before the regular agenda. Is that correct, Clyde? Yes. That would have been after the consent agenda then. Correct. Okay, so then to simplify, can we make a motion to move the city manager's report earlier in the meeting and move comments right before the regular agenda? Okay, I, but given, given what the vice mayor's proposing, I suggest a motion that the public hearing take place first with graphic packaging. Secondly, that there be the, I guess the, the city manager's report at that point, that you proceed then to the consent agenda, then public comments before the regular agenda. 
That sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. So does do the words that sounds good to me, does that mean you're making a motion? Yes, it does. Okay, motion made by Commissioner Urban, and I heard a mm-hmm. Does that count for support? Support. Is that Vice Mayor Griffin, or was that? Okay, support, where do we have that? <laughs> One, I think two, that was three, Commissioner Prado. <laughs> oh, yeah. I see a hand up. I, Commissioner Cunningham put his hand up. I saw that first. So, okay. I, all right. So there's been a motion made and supported, and I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to need. I'm going to make sure you're going to have to keep me on track to get us through this in the order that we have decided on in our third or fourth version of this. So, that said, there's been a motion made uh, and supported. Uh, Clerk Borling, will you call the roll on that, please? Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Knott. Yes. Commissioner Pradel. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Okay. All right, Commissioner. So the agenda has been modified uh, and for this evening, and we have now agreed on that. So now I'm going to do something else again, which is going to throw us off just for a little minute here before we go on. I just want to make some quick statements myself, uh, re just related to Saturday, and I, I know we'll have more chance to talk about that. So I'm exercising a little unprecedented license here. I guess I apologize for that in advance. But I just want to say this. Number one, I want to make it absolutely clear to everyone who's watching, and I'm speaking for myself, I'm speaking for this commission, I'm speaking for a uh, city administration that we in no way support the views or the actions of the proud boy uh, group that was in town over the weekend. We are 100% uh, opposed to the views that they espoused. I wanna go further and say that there was no steps taken by anyone in administration or me as the mayor to approve a, a permit request uh, facilitate uh, this group coming to town. Uh, this group uh, made that choice to come to town. There is no permitting process that is required for individuals to come to town. You know, related to all that in the difficult things that they espouse, I just wanted to, to be very clear about uh, the First Amendment as I understand it, and luckily we have an attorney here with us, but just make very, very clear that we have a Bill of Rights to our Constitution. And the first of the, the 10, what's considered the Bill of Rights is called the First Amendment. And it is relate, very short. Uh, it, it relates to uh, prohibiting, uh, you know, bridging the freedom of speech, among other things, uh, worthy of a read. Uh, is this uh, one of the Bill of Rights that has always been uh, equally and fairly enforced, not necessarily, but I think the words are profound and important and are worth supporting. And no matter what organization that you're gonna find in this country that might be considered on one side or another of the political spectrum, like the ACLU, uh, they will fight uh, and to preserve the rights that all of us uh, are granted under the First Amendment. This was the case for that group that came to town, no matter how abhorrent those views may be, uh, expressing of those views is protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. That's my piece, I appreciate it. And then next on our agenda here is, we are going to public hearings, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, there are no communications. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I might have got my agenda might be a little off tonight. All right. So under public hearings, this will be a hearing to receive comments on a resolution approving a request from Graphic Packaging International, LLC, for a PA-198 industrial facilities tax exemption certificate for 12 years for a real property valued at, this is the value of the property now, $191 million. Before I open the hearing, are there any presentations from staff or the applicant? Uh, not from staff, Your Honor. Uh, we have staff available here to answer any questions. 
I don't know if the um, applicant would like to make a presentation or their representatives from Southwest Michigan first. Nice. Hi, this is Andy Johnson with Graphic Packaging. Can you hear me? Mr. Johnson, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, if I could, um, I'm, um, I'm with uh, Graphic, I'm uh, the Vice President of Government Affairs and Sustainability, and we'd just like to, uh, to make one short comment, if that's okay. Uh, nice on, on behalf of, great, thanks. Uh, on behalf of Graphic, uh, we'd like to extend our appreciation um, for this consideration of this application of the uh, industrial facilities tax exemption certificate. As many of you are aware, uh, we are in the middle of a $600 million uh, expansion project to redevelop a vacant brownfield site <clears throat> adjacent to our Kalamazoo board mill and invest in a coated recycled paperboard machine. They're making tremendous progress, even with the, uh, the considerations around COVID, and uh, we are committed to meet our goal of producing commercial um, recycled paperboard off that new machine in 2022. Once fully operational, that new state-of-the-art uh, code recycled machine will have an annual capacity of approximately 500,000 tons. It'll significantly increase our mill's production output and uh, um, on successful completion, it'll really position Michigan and Kalamazoo as um, the largest um, location manufacturing code recycled paperboard in North America. Um, it will represent 40% uh, market share in that recycled uh, paperboard in North America. Um, <clears throat> we, um, we will consume approximately 900,000 tons of recycled paper from the region. Uh, so it is a really good uh, story around sustainability for Michigan and, um, and our company. Um, coated recycled paperboard is used to manufacture cartons for dry grocery products like cereal, tissue, baking mixes and N95 masks. These are essential products that are so critical during this time. Uh, it's designed to be the largest and the most efficient uh, paper machine uh, uh, and uh, position graphic is, a, um, is a, the company has the highest quality code recycled paperboard in North America. <clears throat> and it will be most uh, technically advanced benefiting um, our customers, our employees, shareholders and in the surrounding communities. Uh, we're proud of the project uh, we'll build on a long relationship we've had with Michigan and the city of Kalamazoo, and it, it will result in retention of safety focused high quality manufacturing jobs in the state and community, and we anticipate to increase the number of employees at the mill. I run 25 employees. Um, we've already hired 15 of those 25 um, as we stage to go, go to the next phase and, and commercialization of that, that machine. Um, <clears throat> we also are uh, utilizing Michigan talent um, for the construction and about 98% of the contracting workers working on the products to date are um, Michigan residents. Once it's finished, we, uh, we believe that uh, and anticipate the city of will be will benefit with um, about $800 million annually in economic impact um, because of the size of the project um, and the amount of activity up with that machine um, in addition of uh, new employees. Um, over the next control over the construction period, we think that's going to contribute also about uh, two billion dollars to the state of Michigan, um, with the construction um, uh, consuming a lot of uh, Michigan talent and also um, bringing in, bringing in some um, uh, outside uh, talent that may be necessary for spe specialized activities. So, with that, uh, we'd just like to say thank you and um, and appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I appreciate that. So I'm officially opening the public hearing to receive comments on a resolution approving a request from Graphic Packaging International LLC for a PA 198 Industrial Facilities Tax Exemption Certificate for 12 years for real property valued at $191 million. Deputy uh, City Manager Jeff Chamberlain, are there any public comments on this item? Uh, yes, sir, we do. We do have a few public comments. And if, uh, if the speakers from Graphics Packaging could just stay on the line in case there are any questions. Thank you. We'll cue the comments up, sir. Hi, this is Brandi Crawford Johnson. I am a taxpayer resident in the city of Kalamazoo. And I'm calling to say that I don't think that Graphic Packaging International should be getting another tax break because they have not put in pollution prevention measures such as 
carbon capture to capture the toxic chemicals and toxic gases that are being released from their facility. I also don't believe they should be expanding where they are located. They should have been located very far away into an industrial area that is not close to residences because the odor and the chemicals are causing respiratory issues for the majority of the neighborhood. We cannot breathe. It is ruining our enjoyment of our property. The smell is terrible. We're finding out that the smell is a toxic gas known as H2S and that it's very toxic to humans and their health. And pollution prevention and carbon capture should be the main priority of Graphic Packaging International because if they want to be located here, they should care about the health of residents, just like the city of Kalamazoo should care about health of residents. So please do not approve this tax abatement until you have proof that Graphic Packaging International is using carbon capture on their smokestacks and anywhere that any toxic gases or toxic chemicals are being released. Thank you. Yes, this is Ron Kitchens, the CEO of Southwest Michigan First, calling in support of the graphic packaging um, tax exempt certificate. Um, graphic packaging is a long standing company in the community looking to invest $600 million in their current paperboard operations. This ensures our 100 year legacy of paper making in the community and creates North America's number one paperboard facility with more than 625 employees based in the city of Kalamazoo at both their mill and carton plant. Graphic packaging has a long commitment to workforce development, working closely with the K-12 schools, Kalamazoo CTE programs, career technology education, as well as Kalamazoo Valley Community College and the paper program at Western Michigan University, which is the oldest and most prestigious paper program in the nation. We continue to be in support of this project, which will employ more than a thousand people during the construction period and will take two years to build. It's one of the finest facilities in the nation. And we want to mention that you know, it also cleans up the area of the former Checker Motors facility that many of us thought was so polluted that no company would ever be willing to take that on. So graphic not only serves the purpose of job creation and forwarding our mission, which we believe that a job is the greatest force for change, they also become environmental stewards and continue their legacy. So for all of those reasons, and for the hundreds of jobs this will change, this will create in our community, we ask for your support. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is James King. I live over on 1717 Union Street in Kalamazoo, Michigan, on the north side. And I don't think graphic packaging should get no tax breaks because the gas smell is still over here and it's more like an electrical smell. So I would be pleased if you guys would not give them a tax break and give us homeowners tax breaks. If anybody should have tax breaks. Uh, I just want to say that. Thank you. And you have a blessed day. I do not feel graphic packaging should be exempt from taxes and my taxes to go up when all this pollution needs to be taken care of first. They need to pay our taxes. Graphic Packaging International is currently polluting the north side and parts of the east side with an odor that has been upsetting residents for years. And I don't think it's fair to give them a tax break when we can't even hold them accountable to stop polluting our residents. Hi, my name is Khadija Brown and I live in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I was wondering how would this proposal benefit or not benefit the, the black and brown communities here in Kalamazoo, what, what resources would it bring into our communities um, or what uh, gentrification process will happen if you all were to come into Kalamazoo? Thank you. So, Deputy City Manager Chamberlain, are there any other comments? 
Uh, just no, sir. That was the last one. Thank you. That's the last one. All right. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing. Commissioners, the recommended action is a motion to adopt the resolution. Is there a motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, is there an opportunity to allow um, Mr. Johnson to answer some of those questions that were asked? We could do it after the motion. Okay. Uh, so moved, Mayor. Motion made by Commissioner Cunningham. Support Second. by Commissioner Hess. All right, so commissioners, is there any discussion? Uh, uh, Commissioner Andrew. Urban? Well, I'm sorry, no. Commissioner. Who wants to go first? Yep. Commissioner Cunningham, go ahead. Um, can we, if um, the representatives from graphic packaging are here, if they have time, do they mind speaking to some of the concerns that the community has? Good question. Mr. Johnson, are you or someone else available for to respond to some concerns? Hi, this is uh, Andy Johnson. Sure, I can uh, um, address a couple of them and then my colleague, Rusty Miller, who's who's on the line can also. Um, in regards to um, uh, several of the comments that were in regards to orders, and we understand our responsibility and we are actively involved to address order concerns um, with a uh, task force. Um, that small team um, is is uh, been identified uh, um, to, uh, well, it's represented by not only graphic, but also a uh, representative of the wastewater treatment facility. And there's a concern resident that are part of that. Um, what we are doing as a group is really trying to isolate the source of the orders uh, so that appropriate actions can be taken place to reduce and eliminate them. Um, and we believe in the past it's too convenient to identify the mill as the order source. There, there are other sources um, that uh, are generating orders, and the, and the group has agreed that a factual approach is necessary to understand the sources. Um, some sensors have been purchased and positioned strategically to assist in understanding the source of the orders. And the team is using modeling software called Enviro Systems to determine uh, the potential location of, of the orders when um, they're detected. Uh, with a system um, being active, um, we have conducted analysis of three recent order complaints in May and June of this year. Um, we've collaborated with the city uh, and we modeled the potential sources and determined that the source uh, could not be from the mill or the city waste treatment facility. Um, and uh, so in that process of us um, working um, with, the, um, with the task force, we are starting to isolate and identify where could some of the sources um, be located. So, so we are actively involved. We've also, um, our, ourselves as an organization, we are buying some sensors to help um, um, enhance the process of identifying these orders and um, and uh, trying to um, find the sources. Um, if there's a source um, that um, is identified um, coming uh, from uh, graphic packaging, um, we, will, um, we will do our part and address it appropriately as we go forward. Rusty, do you have anything more to add on that? Nope. Andy, you covered it well. Thank you. I would I would like to ask additional. Well, go ahead, Commissioner Cunningham. You have a question. Um, actually, I, I want to go. I have a question for um, Director Baker, and then I, I had a follow up question for Mr. Johnson. Uh, is that okay, Mayor? Sounds great. Okay, uh, Director Baker, can you definitively say yes or no on <clears throat> whether or not the uh, pollutants that come from this factory are at above or below acceptable levels at this time? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I, I think at this point, uh, it'd be inappropriate for me to comment um, just citing a lack of data or, or evidence. Um, we, we've got a, uh, a task force, a working group together uh, we've got sensors out in play to identify uh, sources of odors and also to do regression analysis to determine 
uh, where those odors are originating from. Uh, so, you know, we're still in, in the data collection uh, phases of that. Um, I, I'm not an air regulator and, you know, I can't cite you what air regulations are for different industries uh, to be able to, to scientifically uh, put that in perspective in terms of, you know, if we've measured uh, X, Y, or Z at our, our particular concentration, um, is that a violation of Clean Air Act? Is that a violation of, you know, Michigan Part 5 rules? Uh, I, I don't have that data in front of me, and, and I'm not the regulator. Uh, I, I will say that uh, we've ha made tremendous uh, progress over the last few years uh, from it, you know, essentially not having an odor uh, response group to actually uh, not only do we have the task force in place now, uh, but we also have the ability to respond to odor complaints real time and uh, historically. So we can enter in, um, if a, a caller gives us a date and a time, we can enter that information in uh, to our software package and we can do a regression. Uh, one interesting point is that um, you know, Mr. Johnson uh, was uh, uh, discussing uh, three odor events, I believe, in, in May, May or June, uh, and we did some analysis on those, and uh, those came back to endpoints that were not the waste treatment plant and were not graphics packaging. So uh, there's there's a lot of work yet to be done, and you know we're we're in place and, and dedicated to doing that work. And, and I think we've got a great team behind it right now. So I'm just gonna jump in real quick here, just before you go on. So the, Mr. Baker is the director of, of public works, services. Sure public services at the city of Kalamazoo. All right, so I wanna make sure that everyone knows uh, Mr. Baker works for us at the city. Commissioner Cunningham. Um, please forgive me, I, I got a line of, of questions. Uh, so Director Baker, uh, I know that earlier this year, we approved funding for some additional measures to uh, reduce smell in our community. Um, you don't have to go into the details of that, <clears throat> but where are we in the timeline of, of that, uh, that, 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 that approval? Yeah, thank you. We have um, construction in place right now. We've got units that are essentially being bolted to the ground, there's piping uh, and additional appurtenances that have to go with those units. Uh, those units are scheduled to be operational, uh, hopefully before Christmas. It's kind of end of the year, uh, right? You know, when winter hits, that those units will be operational. Um, an odor control study or an odor study that we commissioned uh, also identified additional improvements. Those additional improvements will be. Uh, going into the capital program in our uh, phase to begin their engineering next year with construction to continue. So uh, essentially we've got things that will be coming online uh, at the end of this year. And then we've got additional construction that's going to happen uh, next year and, and the year after that. Um. So, Mr. Johnson, uh, I, I ran my campaign being pro-business, uh, and so opportunities like this, I, I, I actually get excited for, um, but I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the fact that uh, the smell in our community has been a concern of mine, being a born and raised citizen uh, of Kalamazoo, on the east side of Kalamazoo. Um, I know that this task force has been in play for about four or five years, uh, with everything that you know, Mr. Johnson, how soon or how long do you think this process will stretch out in regards to identifying the smell and then um, and then and then stopping? It? And I ask because resources in the community are, are, are stretched thin, uh, and I know that the two major players uh, in this process is both the city and the uh, you know graphics packaging. Um, and, and so, you know, I find this as an opportunity to provide protection to the community through your resources. Um, and that was, that's kind of my line of thought towards it. Um, so can you give me some, some insight on how you feel this timeline will play out as it can, pertains to concerns around both uh, what may be toxic scenarios and the, the smell in general? 
Sure, uh, and thanks for the question. Um, so, so the commitment from our perspective, not only the supporting and working um, with on the task force, we've um, and I've mentioned that the additional sensors they'll be in here by the end of the year. Um, we also um, have retained uh, an independent firm that specializes in order evaluation, and they've initiated initiated an uh, order investigation study um, that um, is required as part of our. Um, care for remaining with uh, with Michigan's Eagle. So that will be available uh, in the fourth quarter, targeting sometime around, I think it's November. So we'll have uh, uh, more sensors. We'll have more data uh, there. We'll have that investigative report uh, by that, that third party um, in, in, in alignment with requirements for the air permitting. And uh, that'll be done here by the end of this year. So um, so there'll be more uh, more facts and more data for us to understand um, um, how to really uh, take the next steps on how you uh, address those issues. Uh, and, and then a follow-up question. If this resolution gets turned down today, uh, what would be the impact um, on your organization moving forward? Well, there's certainly a financial um, implications around that because we um, we were um, um, as we entered into the agreement to select uh, the expansion at our Kalamazoo Mill, uh, this was part of an incentive package that the community and the state put together. So, so that certainly would be um, um, a you know a gap in the overall commitment we were expecting from from the community and the state. So, um, so you know financially, it it does have some implications for us um, uh, going forward. Um, and so, all right. Um, I yield the floor. All right. Other commissioners, Mr. Urban. Uh, yes, sir. I have a question for Mr. Johnson. Um, it seems to me that uh, uh, since you're predominantly in the business of uh, manufacturing just one product, you probably have a pretty good idea of what raw materials and uh, uh, material and uh, pr uh, processes that you use, and you probably have a good idea of the profile of the kinds of uh, emissions that come from those uh, operations. Uh, uh, have you uh, uh, sampled your own stacks and generated profiles of uh, uh, odorous compounds and toxic compounds leaving your stacks already? Do you have that information? for your present uh, facility. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna re uh, ask Rusky to weigh in here, but just before you do that, um, you know, uh, we're regulated um, and obviously, as you mentioned, um, running several mills, we, we understand uh, the process. Um, in regard to the, um, um, you know, the, the situation with what we're measuring, I think Rusty would be the best one to answer that. He at one time would run the mill. Okay. Can I hear yeah. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Miller is uh, Mr. Miller is going to answer. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I'm Mr. Miller, graphic packaging. I I don't know all the uh, details, Mr. Urban. You know, re required to do uh, you know, to do annual uh, reporting of our emissions, and we have a we have a five R report that we uh, we submit, and it's it's you know, all there in the. You know, goes to Eagle and EPA, and it, and really all of our mills do that. But that's that's the typical reporting you know, that we do for for uh, you know for our um, you know required that has all you know different chemical constituents and emissions. Okay. Uh, so so this uh, these these this measuring and reporting is is uh, done uh, as needed as required by by regulation. Yeah, it's, it's typically most of it done annually. Okay, is this monitoring done continuously? No, uh, most of these are not uh, continuous. It, it, it's a list of uh, of emissions and uh, you know chemical consumptions that occur you know occur in the process. Okay. Um, so uh, presumably uh, the, the list of of, of Compounds that are problematic are, is probably a, uh, a, a a secret, a trade secret. So I, I won't go there. But um, 
uh, presumably you know them and the and Eagle knows them. Uh, so uh, uh, it seems like the public should be able to make an assessment of just how dangerous those are. Uh, we have to separate uh, odorous uh, uh, annoyances from toxic effects. Uh, they often overlap in the public mind and they certainly have real effects on property values regardless of toxicity. So this is a serious business and we're, um, your uh, uh, operation uh, happens to be in an area that uh, uh, could be uh, 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 characterized as uh, uh, an example of environmental racism uh, by some people. And the city itself is implicated in this, and it's been implicated since the 1970s when Upjohn was generating far, far, far more odorous uh, emissions down to the sewer uh, sewage plant than, than you guys are now. So this is, we've been through this before. And uh, I, I, so I know um, much, if not all of this problem can be really uh, uh, alleviated. So, uh, when everybody else has asked, asked their questions, I'd like to have uh, the floor again to uh, propose a, uh, a modification to the, uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the motion. Thank you. Other discussion, commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Knott. So I guess I appreciate that there's, you know, this task force, I, I'm a little bit confused how long the task force has been convened. Um, having served on the commission now for a few years, I'm aware that this subject matter has come up repeatedly as it relates to the stank, you know, near the, the corners of Riverview and Patterson. And it bleeds into the north side and it bleeds into the east side. And on a really good dense foggy day, it bleeds into my home you know, several, several blocks away over on Forbes Street. Um, and we've been talking about this for a while. And at one point I was told, Shh, this is a sensitive subject because of our relationship with graphic packaging. I've been told that, you know, the wastewater treatment center has the technologies in place to deal with, with smell. Um, and so I guess I'm just confused why we would even consider a resolution like this right now until we have the data and we understand the source of the smell. Um, because this is, this is not an isolated incident. We have a large chunk of our community, particularly in the summer months, that um, it's offensive to be outside. Um, and we have folks that don't have the, the luxury of air conditioning like I have. So you open your windows and you're out on your porch and it is a debilitating smell. And yeah, I don't know where Commissioner Urban was going with his comments, uh, but it's hard for me to accept that we just can't figure out when there are two major um, industries over in that area that would be, um, uh, I guess, potential sources of the smell, the treatment center as well as graphic packaging. Um, so I'm right now in a position to say, let's pump the brakes until we have the data. We understand what's being put into our air and what the source of the smell is so that we can mit mitigate that um, and not manufacture any more of it. Thank you, Commissioner. Not other discussion. Um, I, I don't have any questions to ask. I just want to just voice my comments similar to what Commissioner Cunningham, uh, Commissioner Knott have just lifted up as a lifetime resident, born and raised on the east side, that smell is something that you just can't get past. And so for me, um, you know, I haven't been on here as long, but I do recall a conversation where this topic came up before. And so without clear time frames, without clear concrete um, information about what this is going to do to the community because I'm, you know, I'm in favor of, of creating jobs as long as they're, you know, equitably, equitably available to the community at large. Um, and there are various things that come with that. Um, but I'm not willing to sacrifice health um, for, for jobs. And so I believe that there's probably a way that we can work this out. I'm not sure what that is, um, but I just wanted to uh, share my thoughts at this time. Thank you, Vice Mayor Griffin. Commissioner Hess. I agree, uh, Vice Mayor. And I'm wondering if uh, Director Baker could speak to that and, and the process moving forward of how we are going to look into those issues of um, with EGLE and with the Environmental Protection Agency. 
just before we go answer that, and Director Baker, I presume you could provide an answer. We've been using the term Eagle. Would we please explain what that is when we're talking about Eagle? I'll go ahead and explain Eagle as, as I attempt to answer some of these questions. I think we've got a few questions outstanding. Um, Eagle is the uh, Michigan Environment, Great Lakes and Energy uh, Group. They're essentially what we used to call um, Michigan DEQ or the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, they underwent a, a name change and essentially that's the agency that regulates uh, air emissions uh, in coordination and cooperation with the EPA. Uh, so kind of transitioning into some of the, the questions, um, there's a lot of history uh, that we're dealing with also, um, even recent history back at, at time period around 2008, I believe, uh, the Department of Public Services was engaged in a, in a pretty in-depth odor study at that time uh, with uh, collecting air samples and, and sending those off to independent labs, um, even having odor panelists uh, where air samples were collected um, and then uh, kind of given uh, to participants in, in, a, in a blind or double blind uh, review of, of the odors. Uh, that uh, was b before my time, but I uh, have reviewed some of those reports. Uh, there was no conclusion uh, with that. Uh, and what we've also been seeing with some of our regression analysis and some of the work that we've done with in, in viral suite systems is that um, there's a lot of times that we reach an endpoint uh, to the river itself. Um, if we understand the flow of the river, uh, it, the flow of the river is north and it kind of makes a turn, uh, you know, right downtown and, and turns and, and heads north. Uh, there's a lot of odors that follow the valley and there's a lot of organic uh, things going on in the, in the river itself. Um, so I'm not saying that the uh, river is essentially a cause. I'm just saying that there we are discovering more than two sources of odors, uh, you know, one being the wastewater treatment plant and, and also uh, graphics packaging. So it's, uh, we continue to work on that data and we continue uh, to work on solutions. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner House. Commissioner Pradle. Yeah, I apologize if I missed portions, I had to move my location, so I was um, spotty at times with with hearing the answers as well, but just to kind of echo off the other commissioners, you know, I grew up on the northeast side of Kalamazoo, um, you know, right off Mount Olivet, and I know even growing up, it was an issue. Um, you know, if I miss this, I apologize, but just curious in terms of have, since you've taken those steps for controls, and you continue to take steps for controls, um, have you found there have been improvements as you've, you know, implemented those controls? Who are you asking, Commissioner Prado? Um, I mean, it could be either Director Baker or, or Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson? C certainly, the, um, um, the the controls, uh, well, let me, let me step back. We have, um, um, over the years, have um, uh, implemented certain capital investment projects in our mill. Um, that would address any potential orders uh, and uh, and that's in, in place now um the sensors have been haven't been in very long and so we're still in the, in the data collection phase right now to really understand you know types and sources of orders and so um and in the last three as we mentioned the last three uh, order complaints um were not um, um, identified as coming from graphic packaging. So we still have some more data collection that we, we, you know, we need to get the, the, those order sources. Uh, you know, if they're, they're, if they're identified as graphic, then we can understand what the order is. And so that's still an ongoing process um, of, of utilizing the latest technology to understand the orders. Do you, do you have a sense that you feel like graphic packaging is committed to uh, as those sources are identified to, you know, rectifying those as, as, as swiftly as possible? Yes, 
Yes, uh, we've uh, we've made the uh, the commitment that that when we went through the process of talking about um, the location of the new paper machine, because uh, we were looking at other locations, uh, we said that um, um, when we identify uh, and understand these these orders, that we it'll be a part of our our capex program to be able to address them. Yeah, you know one one other ask I would have of you and your team is you know as you uh, formulate solution and identify identify sources to uh, you know, please involve the community input, uh, the neighborhoods and the surrounding areas that we identified, um, you know, to, to get, uh, you know, citizen input and, um, you know, uh, just counsel in terms of what they're experiencing and uh, if they're experiencing any improvements. Certainly, we'll take that feedback. I think it would be good for the task force to, uh, to be able to uh, get that type of feedback so they can um, make, a, make adjustments to their strategy. I think it's important that, you know, people from the company get to look, you know, people in the eyes that are experiencing this. And it, it certainly adds a, you know, much more human element that you understand the people who are, who are complaining. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, Commissioner Mayor Erickson. Erickson. I'm sorry, Manager Rispa. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor Anderson. I just want to jump in here and, say I think we're conflating the things that are here tonight with the odor issues. Uh, the task force has been go ongoing um, the at least a year um, and we just heard a commitment from the company to keep participating in that. The, um, there is a representative from the state, a regulator on that task force I've been told and that um, you know, that's where the odor issues are going to be addressed. The package that's before the commission tonight is for the expansion of what you heard as the project. And um, it is a complex financing structure. You know, you heard state incentives. Uh, this also was uh, approved by the county brownfield uh, reinvestment authority. And so um, this is part of a package that was presented to the county, or I'm sorry, to graphics packaging. And, you know, it, it's for the expansion. So, um, you know, commission can, you know, decide what to do, but I just wanted to make sure people were aware that the work of the older issues are really going to be accomplished on the uh, task force side. Commissioner Cunningham. Um, and I, I think right now I'm at a place where I would like to know better what are my options. Um, so Clyde, I know that I motioned to move this forward and we have to vote on that. Is there ability to do a postponement for two weeks out? And then I'm not sure who necessarily after uh, Clyde kind of responds to that after that, then I don't know who next from the city would be able to speak to what that looks like uh, administratively, uh, the impact of it. Attorney Robinson. Certainly to answer the Commissioner Cunningham's question. Yes, you can postpone uh, action on this for two weeks. That is a parliamentary tool that you have at your disposal. All right, and then to city staff, how is that, how does that interrupt you guys? Um, how does that interrupt you guys as it pertains to the administrative process? And Jerisma? Yeah, I would, um, I mean, the task force work is, continuing and will continue um you know if if there's some idea that the delaying the approval of this uh resolution tonight will help you know solve anything i don't think that's gonna be the case um and you know obviously the commission can decide what to do relative to the tax abatement or not but uh from the staff perspective of actually a few weeks, because we have a extra Monday in there, um, is it gonna matter, you know, relative to this? Um, I mean, the task force work, I mean, that's ongoing. 
uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, the, if it's a postponement until our next meeting, and the reason why I'm advising this is because I'm not sure that there will be four votes to much push this opportunity forward for you. Um, and although, uh, you know, I, I'm personally conflicted right now, uh, you know, I would like to have an opportunity to actually sit down and get a better understanding of how we can move forward. Um, so can you give me some insight on how this may affect you? Um, you know, it's just a postponement of two weeks. And um, as long as um, we meet the milestones that are required for the application, um, you know, that's, that's certainly um, uh, workable with us. Um, I, I just need to understand what the expectations are. What, what would you look for in two weeks uh, to, for more clarity, I guess? So I know for me personally, I would like a better understanding on this timeline as it pertains to the olders in our community. Um, I know that there's a separation in, in, in kind of what's going on, but I think it is still congruent in, in our ask. Um, and, and so for me, uh, I need a definitive, I need more of a definitive timeline so that I can have a better understanding of, you know, when a year comes from now or two years or 10 years, when uh, I'm sure, you know, it's pretty common that another tax request, another request comes across our our, um, our table, uh, probably from graphics packaging. Tax break is requested from graphics packaging. Um, and, and that way I, we can definitively have a benchmark to say, well, the plan was this, uh, and it looks like we did meet that and exceed that, or no, we didn't meet that or, or, or exceed that. And then, you know, maybe my colleagues may have further insight on, on what they would like to see um, as it pertains to that. Um, and then I, I'll allow my colleagues to speak, but I had another question for Clyde uh, on how I should word this um, potential motion that, that I would like to. Uh, so I'm I, sorry, Mayor, can I just jump in here real quick? Yes, I, please. My previous comments, um, I don't want them taken to make or to sound like we can't do anything as admin. Hearing Commissioner Cunningham uh, talk, we certainly can get them to at the table with us, talk about a timeline with the task force and kind of create those milestones. That certainly could be done, you know, between now and the next meeting. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, that's clear. Uh, thank you, Manager Rispa. So I've seen other people leaning forward here. I see uh, Commissioner Urban's had his hand up as well, Commissioner Urban. My hand up, here we go. Um, well, uh, it seems to me that uh, in order to, to be fair to graphics packaging and to be uh, responsible to our uh, uh, citizens in the city, we need to uh, be very clear about what graphics packaging is doing, uh, contributing to the problem and what uh, they're not doing. It's not fair for graphics packaging to be punished for what the city of Kalamazoo and its wastewater treatment plant is doing. Uh, though right now, it's still very conflated in most people's minds. And so before I'm inclined to uh, move on this uh, uh, request for a tax abatement, I, I would like to uh, uh, learn from uh, the administration and graphics packaging how uh, you can convince me at least, maybe the other commissioners as well, that uh, by the time this plan is ready to start up, that you will have uh, uh, a, sure, a sure enough way to control the odors so that uh, the blame can't be put on you. Uh, at that point, you will have earned your tax abatement and will be happy to give it to you. But until then, uh, commitments made by others without consulting the city commission might have been just a tad premature. Thank you, Commissioner Urban. Other comments? So, Your Honor, just another thought. Yes. You know, we we'll, we can have those meetings with the task force and graphics packaging. Uh, what it, another option is to have a presentation made by the task force at a commission meeting so that everyone's hearing the same information with timelines. Uh, that's going to take a little more than probably two weeks, but I think 
to get to where we want to be regarding the odors and all of that, I think that would help a lot in in moving us forward. I agree. Appreciate that. Uh, Clerk Borley. Just wanted, because we're talking about deadlines and uh, can we postpone or not, I just wanted to offer that ultimately a, a tax abatement certificate is issued by the state tax commission. And in order to uh, be effective for the 2021 tax year, that abatement would have to be approved by the end of the year. And the tax commission has kind of set a deadline of October 31st for applications to be received in order to guarantee processing for this calendar year. So October 31st is kind of the, the deadline. Uh, the, we have to have the application up to the state by that date in order to guarantee processing by the end of the year. So it's in place for the 2021 tax year. So I just wanted to offer that. It's very helpful, Clerk Borling. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Knott. Thank you. I, and Clerk Borling, I appreciate that comment. And perhaps the silver lining in us delaying, whether it's two weeks, I heard the city manager say he needs more time. And I would agree with that because we know in two weeks we'll have the um, final reading of our ho housing ordinances and that's going to be a packed agenda. Um, you know, maybe the silver lining is this is going to force our hand because, again, this is a community that has dealt with a suffocating and just debilitating smell for many, many years. Um, and so I'm comfortable, again, slowing this train down until we have more information, including benchmarks and data so that we're not expanding and making an already terrible situation worse for this section of our community. Any other comments now, discussion? Or you about to make a motion, Commissioner Cunningham, or just other comments? Comments and motion. Okay, if so I'm just gonna act quite. Okay, just a quick question. So, uh, Clerk Borland, I just want you to be ready to help us with dates if there is a postponement proposed that we will have some specific dates that we can postpone it to, if you'll be prepared for that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I want to say two things. One, uh, I did have opportunity to speak to one of the individuals who serves on these task force from the community, the citizen actually. And, uh, you know, he voiced his concerns to me. And so, uh, you know, I just pretty much said that I would reach out or, or during this conversation, I, I would speak to some of my specific concerns. And so I, um, I also want to build up graphics packaging by saying that they do bring in a lot of diversity. Uh, although they recently let go of one of my close friends. Um, but I will say that they, they do a really good job with bringing in individuals from our community to be employed there. Uh, and, and for that, I am appreciative. Um, so I guess, uh, Clyde, how would I word the, because I know we already have a motion on the floor. How do I word stepping back from that emotion and, or making, an, how, do we, how do I amend that emotion and then to Scott, are you advising not in our next meeting, but the following meeting? Well, uh, let me have this. Let, let me answer your, your questions. Okay. Um, you, your next meeting, your next regular meeting is September 8th. That, because that is basically three weeks away, we have a, a fifth Monday this week, in, or this month in August. And because the first Monday is Labor Day, our next regular meeting will be Tuesday, September 8th. Following that would be Monday the 21st of September. So that's those are your next two meetings. Now that said, the the main motion, and I want to make sure it's, it, everybody's clear, you had tonight was the public hearing, and then you're taking action based on what was had at the public hearing. You close the public hearing. So the public hearing is closed. There won't be a reopening of the public hearing because the question before the commission this evening is, should you grant this uh, tax abatement? That's the question on the floor before the commission. What Commissioner Cunningham has asked that it be postponed until a future date for consideration. Therefore, the, the proper motion is, I move the question be postponed until, then fill in the date. You want it to be the 8th of September, the 21st of September, uh, the first meeting in October, which is the 5th knowing that we've got to act on this before the 31st of October. Okay. 
Thank you, Attorney Robinson. And then I guess this might be for Scott and Jim at the same time. Uh, Jim mentioned that maybe a presentation would be the best route from that body. Um, and Scott, you mentioned the timeline. Uh, so with you being a kind of the master of agendas, uh, is there a certain date that you feel we should zone in on? And then Jim, I guess you will follow up to say whether that would be a time enough for uh, presentation and organizing on that piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, Manager Risma, do you have a date that you think oh. would be preferential? Yeah, I, I think the twenty first will be be fine for September twenty uh, first scheduled, and then follow up at a commission meeting. Appreciate it, Manager Risma. That sound okay, Scott? I'm not sure. All right. Yes, it uh, does. So I motion that we move. We postpone or. I move that we postpone the motion that is on the floor until September 21st. I see Attorney Robinson shook his head. So you, you nailed that one, Commissioner Cunningham. Is there support for that motion? Support. Supported by Commissioner Urban. Any further discussion? All right, so I just wanna make, uh, I wanna make a couple comments here related to it. Uh, first of all, uh, not unlike, you know, what Commissioner Cunningham had to say, uh, it is very, very important that we have good jobs in Kalamazoo, and it's important to us that we have good jobs that are offered to the uh, to our diverse community here in Kalamazoo. And these are good jobs that support, uh, provide living wages, and help people build the lives they want to live. So that that is very, very important to us, I believe, here in the city and on this commission. Additionally. Uh, this is a huge investment in the city of Kalamazoo. This, a city this size, we're talking about new building here. This is provided, you know, unfortunately, this this is, we talked about different kinds of tax breaks. This, this is particularly the industrial facilities tax exemption. So this is not a tax break that one could use for uh, residential tax breaks and that sort of thing. It is specifically uh, PA 198, which provides this opportunity for a tax break on new investment, not existing investment. Uh, but that new investment still adds to the tax base in the city of Kalamazoo, which is so important also. So I don't want that to be lost in the discussion. Uh, also, I did have the opportunity to actually attend a meeting of this task force, which happened uh, way back in the distant times so when we could actually have meetings. And it was uh, somewhat sponsored by our own Environmental Concerns Committee here uh, that we've asked to, to uh, bring the, address these kind of issues for us. So that committee was involved. Uh, I thought it was a very good presentation that the task force made back at that time. Uh, I think that was early in the year this year. So I'm looking forward to that again. I know that process is already in place. So that said, uh, Clerk Borling, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Pradle. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Knott. Yes. Uh, thank you, commissioners. The motion passes and Mr. Johnson and uh, Mr. Miller, I appreciate your participation. I see uh, Ms. Bland, you've been here as well. So I appreciate that. Um, uh, we'll, we'll move ahead uh, over the next uh, month or so here and make sure these things uh, happen in a timely fashion so uh, people will feel more prepared uh, when this comes back on our agenda. Thanks again. Now, okay, so I'm going to need uh, help here from everybody. Uh, that motion has passed. Um, and am I correct in saying now that the next item on our agenda is communications. It is the city manager's report. City manager's report. Okay, thank you. Manager Ritzma. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we had a really difficult weekend this weekend as a community and um, as a city. And um, I want to state or restate what Mayor Anderson said at the beginning. Uh, 
we do not support the Proud Boys and, or their ideology. Um, public safety doesn't support that I ideology. Um, and the fact that they came here was very, very unfortunate. With that said, I, I want to really emphasize that, um, you know, we, through every situation, we, we try to learn. And with this situation this weekend, you know, we're going to learn from it. And I want to first say that, you know, preparations have been made with or were made for this e uh, with event on Saturday, you know, with the understanding that uh, there it was going to be a peaceful protest. Now, I understand, too, that the Proud Boys have a, a history of violence um, and we were prepared for that. Um, and the plan was executed by public safety based on what we knew at the time happened. Um, so with that said, I know there were arrests made that shouldn't have been. Our officers were doing their job the best they could at the time under the circumstances that were there. In hindsight, sure, we, we shouldn't have arrested people from Kalamazoo and should have arrested Proud Boys. Uh, we, we have the ability to go back and we are looking back at video to identify and follow up with charges if there's the need for that. And we will do so if, if we're able. Um, again, learning forward on this, we're gonna include more uh, input at the beginning. Uh, we met with the organizer from the counter protests uh, in good faith with a good understanding of what could happen. Um, unfortunately, there were some um, armed folks that showed up uh, unbeknownst to us um, with the counter protesters and that certainly made things uh, more challenging. So I want to just start by indicating, you know, this, this is not, nor it should be on any officer out there doing their job. Um, I support the chief, I support public safety and what they did, understanding that we have a lot of learning to do and work to do. And, you know, we're committed to doing that. And, uh, and I just wanted to open up with that and then uh, turn it over to any questions. Unfortunately, the chief, was not available tonight, so I'm going to stand in. Uh, we had an hour and a half press conference yesterday. I hope um, you all were able to to uh, see that. Our intent there was to share as much information and answer as many questions as we could, in, even from some of the uh, uh, counter protesters or um, Black Lives Matters uh, folks. They were they attended that, so um, I'll do the best I can. So, commissioners, do you have questions for Manager Ritzma? Commissioner Pradel. So, I want to start this off by just saying that, um, you know, I know this is a complex situation, and I, you know, I feel that one of my utmost duties as a city commissioner is to make sure that the community's uh, voices and questions and concerns are conveyed, and. I think it's important that even though we know that a number of us do that, you know, behind the scenes individually um, to the best of our ability, that it's important that we not just be the ones that hear those answers, but the community at large be the ones that also hear the answers. Mm -hmm. I want to be abundantly clear that I mean no ill intent by asking these questions. It's not meant in an adversarial capacity. You know, if there are any of the men and women who serve on our police force watching this, you know, I want them to know that. I know and I recognize how hard this job is right now. And there are times when there feels like there's probably an impossible task ahead to uh, manage and juggle all the things that are being asked of you. And I know that in the same regard, in the same vein, the social justice warriors in our community who are you know, working relentlessly to um, 
you know, champion progress are doing the same thing, uh, doing their best, um, trying to make the community a better place. And uh, so I just want to acknowledge that just so it's understood that I'm not coming from an adversarial perspective. I'm coming from a perspective that I think that, that we need to be able to uh, learn and grow when we make mistakes, you know, acknowledge and celebrate successes. But when we screw up, we need to make sure that we acknowledge it. And when people have questions, we need to make sure that we ask it. And so, um, uh, you know, I just wanted to precurse that before I ask those questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Jim, would you mind just kind of sharing a little bit in terms of like what other jurisdictions were involved and just kind of confirming what other jurisdictions were involved? But then also, can you kind of just scope out for us in terms, you know, we heard about there being 110 officers, but were all those officers in one proximity together waiting to act if things became violent or were they all kind of strategically placed in various places. I know some people have, you know, lifted up and expressed the concern about the six to seven minute gap between when, you know, the, the violence commenced to actually seeing, um, you know, the um, officers in the line to uh, disperse the crowds. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, to answer your first question about jurisdictions, um, we had the city of Portage, public safety there, representatives from them, uh, the sheriff's department and Michigan State Police and Kalamazoo Township. And then of course our, our officers. And I'm gonna just hold this up just to show and how this, this can be on our um, you know landing page or it's available. But this is a map of the um, the layout of the Arcadia Festival site and it kind of goes in and out there. I apologize for that. Um, those red circles are staging areas for our officers. Or So what happens is when we come, when an event like this happens and we call in other jurisdictions, um, there's certain roles that they perform. Michigan State Police were there for their bike unit they have a bicycle unit that does crowd management, and they also had reinforcements, you know, from uh, as, in terms of officers on the ground. Um, those units are are placed strategically based on where we know, we feel at the time things are going to occur, or as they're evolving could occur. So we had units stationed around the festival site, not all at one location. And so, you know, things were very fluid, occurred very quickly. I was actually on Water Street with Assistant Chief Vanderweer um, observing all of this. And, you know, I heard the call go out for, you know, for them to go in. And it was, it felt like a long time, you know, even watching it on video, but, they were deployed as planned and came in as planned um, in those areas that I uh, identified through this map. So just to make sure I'm clarifying, so they were all in different places, then had to convene somewhere together to start yeah. march marching towards the crowd. So they weren't all staged in one 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 area. Right. Before. They were staged throughout the, you know, around the location. Okay. There was a some commentary as well and some uh, residents also lifted up that there, uh, this was also alluded to during the press conference as well, that there was a red van that was trailing behind um, the Proud Boys as they were marching down the road. Uh, what capacity was that red van there? Was it to protect the Proud Boys or was it more in a posture to monitor the Proud Boys? I, Commissioner, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, I saw the van. I didn't through what occurred, I didn't see what they were doing. Um, so, you know, we could certainly go back in video, which we are, and try to understand what the purpose was for that ban. Okay. Can you walk will, us? I'm oh, sorry, sorry, I will say it did appear to be tied to the Proud Boys. And that's not, that was not our ban, you know, it, a public safety's ban or the city's ban. That was, um, it did appear that it was tied to the, Proud Boys, I don't know in what role, you know, that band was supposed to serve. Can you do a little bit to walk us through that six to seven minutes, what it looks like when the second that uh, 
indication of violence is triggered to what that looks like in terms of the response. You know, we see just a gap in time and an absence of people, but it would be really helpful. And I think the public has asked a number of capacities to just, if we could get a better timeline or a sense um, from a strategic perspective or, uh, you know, what that six or seven minutes looks like behind the scenes. Sure. So um, again, having been there, I heard all of the radio traffic and observed, you know, what was going on. Uh, the initial altercations occurred on Water Street uh, at the corner, really at Water and Edwards there. And, um, and at that point, the call was made to send in, you know, our squad units. And so um, they were deployed at various locations, uh, one being, you know, further down Water Street coming towards Edwards. Um, there would have been a unit over by, um, let's get over by uh, the other side of the festival site. Uh, also on Michigan Avenue, I believe there would have been a unit coming in. So it, it was, and so the event started there, but then it, it turned and went down Edward Street. Um, and so at that point, the public safety was uh, you kind of closing in on the situation. Um, and they, they also were thinking about other places that may need to be um, where deployment may be needed. And the call was made that a certain unit went over back to the Radisson because we felt they may go back there. So, um, you know, it was a very fluid situation. Can you speak uh, a little bit as well about what, what is the trigger point? Was Is the trigger point for public safety to start responding the second that we noticed that the crowds were starting to converge towards each other or was the trigger the second that the first fist started flying? So I, from what I observed, the trigger point was when the altercation occurred. Um, that would have been the time, you know, to deploy. Now, you know, should we or could we have had uh, units there beforehand? You know, that's something we will need to learn and understand, you know, through after action review. But, um, you know, that would have been the trigger is when altercations occur. We were following them, you know, behind with, like I was there, Assistant Chief. I know Assistant Chief Coakley was there. You know, we did have, and we did have eyes in the, in the air. Um, we had officers staged on the top of the new building, Catalyst Building, that's there on Water Street. And um, we also had a sniper deployed. I think you can probably understand the frustration from the community when they see that nine individuals were arrested. And of the nine individuals, none of those individuals were deemed Proud Boys, you know, as part of that um, violence that erupted. Um, you know, I think anybody who's watched the video saw that there was violence occurring um, all over the place. And certainly uh, the Proud Boys were very much uh, instigators, very much in violent postures, very much doing violent acts. Yep. Um, clearly had um, made several traffic violations, whether it be blocking the street with their vehicles, whether it be marching down the street without a, a, a parade permit, whether it be coming out of the parking structure without uh, uh, license plates. So how how do we reconcile that with the community and reassure them that you know justice still can be done for the people who uh, perpetrated these acts in our community? Yeah, so um, I think the chief put it best yesterday in the in the press conference that you know the goal is to protect the community and restore order, and they that was their plan, and they they executed on that plan. I guess in hindsight, you know, being more um, uh, anticipatory about the uh, actions, uh, we could have, you know, been maybe deployed better. But it's um, it's really a case that, you know, we're we're going to move forward with learning from the event. Um, you know, we haven't had uh, permits required for other marches. Uh, since you know COVID and and all uh, this other protest uh, has occurred, and so uh, it it wasn't 
required here as well. Obviously, that's a policy decision that we could revisit or visit and see if there's anything that can be done, you know, from that standpoint. Um, as the mayor indicated, you know, there is a first minute rights to, um, you know, any group that comes into town. So we've got to be mindful of that. But, you know, we're certainly open to exploring any policy changes that could be made and, uh, and work that way especially injuring and harming our citizens, certainly. Um, you know, probably one of the two things that I'm having the absolute most difficult time reconciling in my head, um, about the nine people who were arrested, uh, one member was um, part of the um, National Legal, Legal Guild uh, and as a public observer, um, who had clearly de defined green hat that labeled on his hat um, and was arrested. Uh, another member of um, credentialed media uh, was arrested and identified. In both these instances, uh, they were identified. In fact, I had an opportunity to speak with both individuals yesterday, and I asked both individuals, were you both clearly identified? In both instances, they said yes. I asked them if they both clearly identified themselves. In both instances, they said yes. Um, and the thing that I find, you know, I understand that in these kind of like tense situations that things happen quickly, mistakes can be made. Um, you know, you might get yourself into a situation where somebody's arrested and then you re realize, oh my gosh, I made a huge, uh, huge error here. You know, I just arrested a member of the media or, oh my gosh, I just arrested a volunteer who's here as a, you know, impartial observer to keep um, people safe during the protest. But what the part that I'm struggling with understanding is those people were clearly identified as um, should have been protected uh, citizens of that day and really are the guardrails of our democracy. And not only were they arrested, but when that mistake was made, they were then lodged in, in detention, um, uh, in jail, and then spent time there, even though, even though after that, it was known that they had, um, you know, been, uh, people who should not have been arrested. And so I'm just curious, um, you know, what your take is on that and, yeah. and really, in terms of like both acknowledging it in both those cases, not just the media, but also the you know public observer, but what we can possibly do to make sure that there is never a member of either that are ever arrested in our community. You know, just to put into perspective, um, the legal observer, that organization in Michigan has existed for almost 60 years. And one of sure. the things that they had expressed is to the best of their knowledge, there's only been three instances where one of those members had ever been arrested who's been identified in that, that clothing. And so not only did that happen on King Kalamazoo on Saturday, but a member of our media on the same day was arrested. And so I'm just wondering, you know, from your perspective, you know, what do we do to change policy or training to make sure that that never happens again? Yeah, so Commissioner, that's a very good question. I think um, just in terms of the individual situations, um, I know public safety is going back and reviewing body cam footage, you know, to see what transpired leading up to that arrest. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there as far as each individual arrest goes. Um, the chief apologized, and I'm going to restate that here for anyone that was arrested um, locally. And um, like you said, an identified role, um, you know, they, as part of the pre preparation for the event, um, I'm not clear on whether those uh, legal observers were, that information was shared with, with us, um, that they were there and what their purpose was. So I will go back and, and check on that and, and let you know um, what happened there. And that would be one thing up front before the event happens is anyone there that's serving a role needs to be clearly identified for public safety, you know, because things happen quickly. And, you know, if the, uh, for instance, the media person, if their credential was off to the side, you know, that's, that's, you know, part of, part of the uh, misunderstanding of, you know, whether they are media or not. So I'm not saying that happened, but we just need to know um, and have visibly identifiable people are people easily identified in the role that they're they're playing so we don't yeah. have mistakes like that yeah we we just absolutely need to make sure that that yeah. never happens again in our oh community. 
you know, so long as I'm alive, you know, and the rest of my children are alive. Um, you know, those members are there for a reason to protect yep. everybody. You know, like I mentioned, they're the guardrails of democracy, you know. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and I just again, wanted to look that up. And again, I apologize for any, you know, treatment that, you know, they felt was, was wrong. I mean, we obviously um, did the arrests and, you know, we, we need to acknowledge that and, you know, apologize and, and move on and, and learn from it, as you said. You know, I think there might be also opportunities to learn from those individuals, um, you know, Absolutely. know opp opportunities to involve them and, you know, you know, strategizing how we make sure that never happens yeah. again. There be awareness of, of the symbols that they wear and identify themselves or, or a uniform credentialing system to make sure that, um, you know, that those don't happen. I don't have the answers to it. Yeah. They have better answers to that, but I just, I would kind of implore you to please involve them. And, um, you know, I think we have their contact information if you need it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I know um, the chief is planning on meeting with the uh, M Live reporter um, and we will do the same with the, uh, the attorney or anyone that was arrested, you know, it, that we, we can learn from. You know, you've, you've heard a number of people mention as well, I think this was addressed a little bit in the press conference about the National Guard and an yeah. understanding of, you know, why was National Guard called in in early June, but not called in in this instance where we know that these hateful hate mongers were coming to our community. Um, you know, I, I think what I heard from the press conference, and I wanted to make sure to, to verify this as well, that I understood it correctly, is that largely the reason that the National Guard was not called in this as a peacekeeping mission for this particular instance was based on community feedback that the, they did not want the National Guard to ever enter our community again. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that would be part of it, uh, Commissioner Prado. The other part is um, going back to that, uh, I guess it would be June 2nd event, or June 1st and June 2nd. So the June 1st event occurred, it was long lasting, you know, it started around nine or 10. We had, we had to call in reinforcements at that point, um, which would include the jurisdictions that I mentioned and, um, and calling all of our officers in too. So, you know, there's the rest of the city that needs to be, you know, uh, um, in, you know, uh, patrolled, so to speak. And, uh, you know, the, the depletion of those resources on that Monday night led to the decision that we need to have reinforcements to do what we need to do on the and that Tuesday, which was create a, you know, a, a zone. So the National Guard, through an emergency order or a, a declaration of the mayor, was called in so our resources could get replenished and they were ready to do their work that Tuesday and Tuesday night, because again, everyone was called in. And um, in this case, you know, we already had the resources there. Um, you know, the chief said that she increased the number of officers for this event and, um, and our resources weren't taxed like they were on the June 1st and June 2nd uh, events. Another question that I heard enough from a number of people is in terms of what public safety was doing to, to monitor the community and especially neighborhoods. Um, you know, it post um, uh, uh, protest as well in our communities, um, you know, after the event, just to monitor and make sure that folks were safe and that there weren't, you know, um, violent, uh, violent visitors like roaming yeah. around our neighborhoods or other parts of town. Yeah, we had our patrol officers out in the rest of the community. Uh, we actually stood up our emergency operations center. Uh, um, social media was being monitored by our crime analysts and live real-time information provided to us there. And, um, you know, again, every officer was aware of what was going on, but the rest of the community was also being protected through the, the normal uh, patrol officers that we have out there. Yeah. Uh this is the last question, and then I have a, a couple of thoughts I just would like to share as well, if it's possible. But um, so in terms of the relationships with the counter protest organizers, can you kind of like outline that a little bit about, you know, what that process looked like? Um, you know, we, we heard that uh, 
public safety originally heard about the likelihood of them visiting Kalamazoo and I think it was in July. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you could just share in terms of and reiterate that to the community about what that relationship was like with the counter protest organizers, how involved mm-hmm. were they in, in the decision making of, you know, deciding like the placement of public safety or the determination of when they would arrive and if something might happen or those kind of decision making yeah. how that played out. Sure. Um, again, the, going back before the event, preparations were being made. I mean, the chatter around this event happened about a month before the date, you know, August 15th. Um, it was a very, uh, there were like two people that posted on that, you know, so that kind of triggered the monitoring. So we began monitoring. And as we learned from previous protests, we identified as best we could uh, organizers for each side. And we did have the uh, Nathan Dennison, the organizer of, of the, the prayer vigil in the park. And uh, we worked with him beforehand on, with the plan. And we also involve our city attorney, public, public works, uh, public services. You know, it's a cross departmental group too that works on this because there's a lot of dimensions to it. And then, um, you know, we were, the deployment was based on, you know, us having learned that we are, we don't want to be part of the protests. So we deploy off site or, you know, not visible, I guess, to the public, but we're, we stand ready to respond. And that's what was um, prepared for here. And uh, again, that was done with the uh, organizer of the counter protest. We had, she had tried to reach out, or she indicated yesterday that attempts were made to reach out to Prog Boys. Uh, they were able to identify a couple, but they refused to cooperate, so. All right. Um, in terms of that, that pre-planning process though with the actual counter protest group, I mean, was that occurring on just a one meeting basis and then it was kind of done from there? Was there communi- communi- continuous yeah. communication by text and calls leading up to it? Where Were there like periodic meetings leading up to it with those individuals? So as the, as the 15th approach, you know, we learn more and more through social media, you know, intelligence gathering. So there was an actual, uh, the last planning meeting that I'm aware of was, uh, I believe the Thursday or Friday before the event, there had been a, a one before that. And then, uh, Assistant Chief Coakley from Public Safety, he's the one that is that uh, kind of liaison to the organizers. And I know he was in constant contact with the, um, with the organizer of the counter protest, even up and through the event. <clears throat> Looking back retrospectively, is there anything you would do differently in terms of that relationship with the counter protest organizer? Well, I would say that we, we would we should have had more people around the table planning for this. Um, you know, other groups, um, you know, having uh, commission input. I know the commission was made aware of the plan, but maybe that uh, since it would, it was going to be such a, a significant event and very uncertain of what's going to happen. I think, um, you know, involving more people up front, so everyone's on the same page. Um, I, I would say that's something learned from it. Yeah, you know, one just a couple of comments and I apologize, I'm taking up so much air. I'm saying that to my colleagues. Um, you know, I know that you guys probably have questions as well, but I just wanna to share some things and I'm gonna go a little bit slower. So I apologize if I have awkward pauses here because I have a number of notes that I think it's important that I wanna share. Um, you know, first, the thing I want to do is I want to thank you, Jim and uh, Mayor, for learning from early June about the importance of communicating. Um, you know, I would like to see us even communicate real time and as soon as possible. Um, you know, if there is a, a something that we can just put a little uh, mark in, in, the, in the dot in terms of making sure that we constantly revisit, we absolutely positively have to communi- constantly improve our communication. And that's true both in public safety, but that's true from us from as commissioners and what we get. It's true of what we communicate as commissioners. 
It's true of what's coming from city administration and what people hear from our city, but it is absolutely inexcusable that people don't hear from our city in the immediate aftermath of a crisis. And you know, the thing that I recognize is that there are going to be people when we're communicating right afterwards and they're going to say, well, that was just a, a useless canned answer. You know, they didn't answer any of my questions, but they need to see us and that we need to answer what we're able to answer. And what we can answer, we need to be comfortable saying, you know, we're going to get back to you as soon as possible because this is happening in real time and we don't have all the information, but this is what we know. You know, I think there were probably four or five hours that were going past that, you know, the number one comment I saw on social media and people posting and texting to us was, where the heck was public safety? Did they just wake up that morning and realize that Proud Boys were in town? And that could have been a question that could have instantaneously been squashed and people realized that, no, they've been planning for this for weeks. And granted, the strategy might not have worked as well as was hoped, but we we could have, you know, um, you know, conveyed that, nip that in the butt right away. And we didn't have that opportunity to do that. Um, you know, the other thing, too, I just wanted to emphasize with that as well is that, you know, I think I think we improved the communication. I mean, we didn't make people wait till Monday to hear from the city at all. But I think, again, there's a lesson learned that it would have been uh, tremendously helpful to happen in real time as it was happening, somebody at the podium. Um, but also, if, if not, you know, right before the 11 o'clock news so that people can hear directly from our city leadership. And even if it's a message of that, we're going to get through this, that we can unify through these difficult times, people need to see and hear that. Because otherwise, what's happening is people are scared. They're uncertain. They're traumatized from these events. And they need to know that somebody has their hands on the wheel. And I know that the hands are on the wheel, but the community doesn't know that and always see that. And so I just, I can't lift that up enough, the importance that we have to get better at that. We, we have to get better at that. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to, to just say is like part of that, I think sometimes we as a city, and this is just my observation as the newbie who is relatively new. So, you know, if I'm off base here, any other commissioners, you know, please correct me as you get on, you know, get your chance to talk as well. I, my observation since November is that we have a propensity to overthink. We have a propensity to overthink and to under communicate. We think, we try so hard to think about what people want to hear from us and to be so intentional about having every single little fact ironed out that I think sometimes that we forget that people are waiting to hear from us. And I think, you know, we are going to screw things up. We're going to forget to say things. People are going to criticize us whether we communicate or we don't communicate. But the one thing I know is that there are very few instances in my life when there's ever been a crisis, when I've looked back and I've said to myself, you know, boy, we over communicated in that, in that situation. You know, we look to our governor in the state of Michigan. There are days that there have been zero deaths and nothing's changed. And she's just up there saying, hey, folks, just keep remembering you need to wash your hands for 20 seconds and don't forget to wear those masks. But I would say that most people overwhelmingly would say that she's done a damn good job, you know, uh, mitigating the crisis. And it's because she's out there. She's visible. And even when there's not a great reason to be, she's visible. And that person, that figure, that leader is there, you know, assur reassuring the public that somebody has their hands on the wheel. I think, um, you know, we have in many cases, you know, if there's nothing to hide, you know, there's there's no harm if we, you know, if, if we just share what we know, you know, if, if we screw up, admit it you know, learn from that mistake, um, you know, th th we're going to screw up. And the more that we take risks, the more that we innovate, the more that we do things outside the box, that's going to just continuously happen. And we just have to be comfortable with acknowledging that and learn from it. And then, you know, not only changing the ways that we're going about it, but also thinking about how to, how to change those policies as well. Sure. You know, um, I wanted to lift up for a second as well and just remind people, um, you know, one of the members of um, the Michigan Observers Group lifted this up yesterday, but you know, let's be very clear too about the Proud Boys visit. It wasn't just some random date that they picked. This is on the anniversary of Charlottesville and a death that occurred. They were here celebrating a death that occurred with Heather Heyer. I mean, how sick is that? And so, you know, I think that just is all the more outraging from the community when you see that, uh, you know, that nine people are arrested. They're all from the counter protest side of a, of a hate group who comes here, incites violence and is doing so to celebrate uh, the anniversary of an event of somebody being murdered by a vehicle. Um, it just, it, it, you, you start to understand why people are, are so upset and, and outraged. Um, and, you know, I just want to reiterate again, the importance of the media and the importance of uh, those observers there who are, like I say, you know, I'll repeat this again, the guardrails of democracy. They are what are separating us from, 
you know, the, the things that you're seeing in our country where, you know, fascism is spreading and hatred is spelling, spreading. I mean, they are, they are holding us and keeping the soul of this country together. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, I also just wanted to say this as well, you know, I think we just, we, we just have to do a better job of remembering that, that, that the community is at the heart of, you know, everything that we do. And you can't say, you know, there is no public in, in public safety without the public. And, you know, to just reiterate that again, that, you know, uh, there are, there are lessons learned from this and there are such great opportunities to listen and to be, to be visible and to uh, process with people who are a part of it. And, you know, I, I, I still haven't seen those opportunities since early June to get out with the community and connect with the community and get, get their perspectives. And, you know, certainly things have been shared and relayed through us, but I just, I can't emphasize mm -hmm. enough that that has to happen. And if it hasn't happened, you know, there's been a lot going on in the world. You know, there's a lot of crises happening, but that can't be an excuse for why we go much longer without doing that community listening and input and healing together with the community to get through this. Um, with that, I, I yield. I apologize for the, the lengthiness of it, but I just wanted to make sure I get all those things. Uh, Commissioner Prado, I, go ahead. I, I want, Andrews. I'm sorry. Um, I just want to acknowledge your concerns and they're mine too. Um, I know their public safety is concerns. Um, we are going to learn from this. Uh, part of the action plan that we put together back as a result of the June events uh, was hiring a public information officer. We are in the process of interviewing folks right now. And so we will have someone on board here soon. And um, not that that's going to be a you know, cure all, but it will certainly help us in real time uh, be able to communicate in a crisis situation. Are you going to speak again, Commissioner Cradle? Or no, I just i I appreciate that, but i i I need us to be serious about this communication component. You know, I know Eric, that was one of the four things that you lifted up as one of the four major. Yeah. Tenets. Um, <laughs> you know, and I don't think that was by accident. You know, I. Even even in June, when we had our briefings uh, at public safety, I mean, almost instantaneously, it was almost like the universal thing that was almost agreed upon is that we have to do better with communication yeah. with the public. Um, we, we have to. Um, and, you know, and the other thing, too, is, you know, um, you know, I know the public is going to feel strongly about things, but, um, you know, this morning I woke up to a post that was probably one of the most vile posts that I've um, I've ever I have, I've ever read and it was directed towards my children and you know the thing is is it wasn't a proud boy that was making that comment um and I will engage and read every single email and I'll read every single text and I'll meet with anybody who wants to meet but the one thing that I won't tolerate is to lower it to a level to talk in a violent tone about my children won't do it not acceptable if you want to engage with me as a leader, engage with me as a leader. But you know what? I cannot fathom how somebody in the year 2020 who wants to get my attention and talk to something about that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of myself that I'm even giving you oxygen, but I just feel like it needs to be said because I will not tolerate that. I will not dialogue with people who come, with, come at me with, with that level of, of hatred and anger. I won't do it. There's no place for that. There's no place for it for the proud boys and there's no place for it for people who feel on the other side. Um, I just wanted to make sure I, I shared that as well. I uh, appreciate that, Mr. Cradle. I know that you, uh, it is obvious the depth of your, the intensity of your feelings, which is well understood. We had a chance to talk about that a little bit before this meeting. Uh, I mean, publicly, uh, support that statement 100%, and I appreciate that you felt that that you were, that you shared it. I was not sure if you would be able to do that, so thank you. Um, so let me see. I'm sure we're going to have more discussions going on here. I'm just going to uh, just propose something at this point. I see it's nine o'clock. I understand that we do have possibly in excess of, of 80 folks that are lined up to provide comments to us as well. Um, I'm not sure if that number's increased at all since I last heard it, but um, 
One thing I'm just going to propose for thinking as, as we continue on here is that at some point in the meeting this evening, uh, I may suggest that we we recess uh, if it gets too late uh, in the it gets to be too far into tomorrow morning. So I'm just wanting people to think about that. Uh, you know, we have to, uh, you know, to make sure that we are still capable of, uh, you know, making good decisions and and listening and that sort of thing. So we'll we'll see how that goes time wise. But just want uh, folks to think about that a little bit. So. Uh, while we're on this discussion, uh, another commissioner would like to make some comments. I see Commissioner Urban. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I think uh, Chris did a, a good job of perhaps speaking for many of us. And I, I hope that uh, if we have uh, questions and concerns uh, to, to fill in the gaps that he didn't cover, that we will do that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can get to the citizen comments and so we can be learning from our, our, uh, our constituents uh, what they're experiencing as well. Uh, I, uh, uh, I think that we will probably be uh, needing to say uh, something uh, that's important regarding uh, the uh, accountability of the, of the uh, uh, police, uh, the public safety leadership. Uh, it's, it's simply uh, good management to, uh, to uh, back the people that you employ and to hold them accountable. And uh, that's what I am aiming to do. Uh, that's what I've been doing. And uh, uh, the processes that we use to uh, manifest that accountability have to include what we as a city commission do, uh, not just the, the, the uh, chief of police. So uh, we share responsibility to protect her and her staff, but we also must acknowledge our responsibility to be accountable to the people. And on that aspect of it, I think we uh, have been falling way, way short, partly because of the uh, restrictions of the Open Meeting Act, which have good intentions, and the fact that a number of us are inexperienced in actually uh, being in a leadership role in a weak city commission form of government, which does not encourage us to just go boldly ahead and demand that things happen. There's good reasons why we have a weak city commission form of government, uh, but that does not let us off the hook for exercising leadership. And I hope that my colleagues will be uh, attending to some of the things that I'm uh, putting out about how we can go about doing that. I won't take up time on it right now, but I, I just want people to know that uh, there are things uh, uh, I'm, that are being put in place by me uh, to uh, move on the things that uh, Eric Cunningham, Commissioner Cunningham, brought up a few weeks ago. Uh, with all that's happened since, we can't lose sight of the main thing that he was stressing, which is rapid and thorough communication. So that's, uh, I'll stop there and, and you have my time. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Urban. Uh, Vice Mayor Griffin. Um, yes, thank you, Mayor. I'm certainly um, uh, in agreement with continuing this conversation um, after having it now and then continue it after public comment. I'm sure there will be things um, that arise at that time that you know may require follow up. Um, so I just want to briefly jump in and, and kind of state a few things um, and then jump out and, and lean back in um, if need be. So uh, for me, I was not involved in any of the planning of uh, what was going to happen. Um, and I was not present at the event um, this weekend. Um, I just want to make a comment that, you know, I... Uh, for whatever it's worth, good or bad, racism is alive and well here in Kalamazoo. If anyone's ever tuned into a commission meeting, you, you hear it on the public comments. So the fact that people decided to assemble here, you know, wasn't necessarily so surprising. I was more interested, not necessarily in the assembly of people, but who is members of this group that exist in our community just every day? Who are members of, you know, CEOs or, you know, working in businesses that we go to every day. That was really what I was more um, 
interested in with everything, but either way. Um, so I listened to the press conference and I do want to say here that I did ask um, city manager Ritzma if chief Thomas would be here. And I understand that she wasn't able to be here today. Um, but one of the things that, you know, it's, it's, it was okay for her not to be here for me, even though I would have preferred her to be here because the city manager is one of our direct reports, not Chief Thomas. So anything that happened this weekend, I'm comfortable having that conversation and asking those questions of you, city manager Ritzema, um, assuming some of those things, you may have had those questions yourself um, with some of the events that took place. Um, so I'm just gonna start with the preparation for this weekend. And this is just going off of conversation uh, that Chief uh, gave at the presentation or at the press conference. The preparation for this event was based off of what happened at the uh, June. protest in early June. Okay, that was what was explained to us um, at that point. I have a lot of questions about that. Uh, reason being, you can take away the details of what people believe in. Everybody has the right to their beliefs. But when you have a group that is known for a history of violence, that response should be accordingly. And it really concerns me and troubles me that there was a response made that was based on a situation where the parties that were going to be present did not have that history of violence. We're not you know, labeled as such by Southern Poverty Law Center and so on and so forth. So that was the first thing that I didn't understand. And moving forward, I don't understand as, that, as far as that being a learning experience, I don't understand all of the intricacies of public safety and I don't have any judgment on, you know, I, I don't know what their job is supposed to be all the way, but I do know that certain things just don't make sense. And that was one of those things that just didn't make sense. And that's one of those things that, um, you know, I would like to know from you, city manager Rizimo, what did you feel about the response to what happened um, just based on that? And how exactly are we going to be certain um, that that's not gonna happen in the future? And I just wanna say that I understand there's learnings and things that have to happen. Yeah. I, no one is perfect and that always has to be the case. So I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to that. But when the, um, when people's lives could potentially be at stake, um, the, the, the room for error is a little bit different than a normal situation. So just on that basis alone, I'd like to know your thoughts on that, just the strategy. And I do have some other questions after this. Sure. Um, I think, you know, uh, going back to my earlier comments, um, you know, in hindsight, yes, this was a, um, a horrific group coming. Um, the plans that were made, I think the learnings from the previous ones, uh, protests were, um, we prepared according to the event. Um, we had, you know, 100 plus officers ready. Um, going back in hindsight, maybe they should have been staged differently. Um, you know, it was an evolving situation and, you know, it was mobile. So I would say that um, certainly can be something that we learn from um, and just, you know, understand where their concerns could arise. Um, and then, um, yeah, the other learning from, from that, as I mentioned earlier, is, uh, you know, when public safety is present, and again, I'm not saying they should have been or shouldn't have been. Uh, I'm just saying from past experience, you know, they tend to be the, the target. And I think the chief mentioned this yesterday. Um, and, you know, that was certainly in our thinking too about having them down there, you know, in real time. Again, right or wrong, we'll, we'll go back and after action review and, and review that and try to learn from it. I can tell you right now, the, the heart of public safety and the officers is to protect the community. And they did so as best they could that evening, as far as um, restoring order and you know, really reducing the amount of time that this event happened. Um, 
I understand there's a lot of anger out there about what happened and how, you know, we handled, you know, certain components of it, like the arrests. And, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to learn from that part of it. The goal is to keep the community safe and the hearts are there and the minds are there in public safety to do so. And, um, and I just can't say anything more to that other than, you know, we're, we're in it to protect the public and we'll do so as best we can. Um, thank you for that. And so, you know, I, I don't doubt, and you know, this is not about a lack of support um, it, for law sure. enforcement or for KDPS. This is about um, accountability for things that happened and what is going to be in place to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And so, you know, it's not satisfactory necessary to me that just off the top, we are not clear how to treat people, um, whoever the group is that has a history of violence when they come to our community. And I'm just gonna lift up, there was an event that took place at La Crone Park. Um, there was a theater production that was happening. And so I happened to live close in the area and there was someone parked um, very close to my home. Um, I wanna send a huge shout out to Jay Keon. Um, and the reason why this is important to list this is because there was someone set up on the perimeter of the park because they were aware that there was a violent group coming to this community. So if they were aware and had people placed just in case within moments of a situation, just off of want to be, you know, protecting themselves in that situation, people who do this for a living, I, I just had concerns about that, that thinking. And so that was, a, that's a, a, a fundamental um, yeah. concern for me. And again, it does, it's not about the specifics of the groups or the details or any of that because it could be another group and another two months that comes. And if you're not able to discern the difference, um, that, that's just concerning. And I need to know more than just um, a plan per se, how that isn't gonna happen um, in the yeah. future. So just uh, moving on to the next point. Um, My sister, I'm sorry, yeah. if I could, I, I think it's important. I did have a conversation with you know, a long, standing resident on the north side this morning and uh they reminded me and i wasn't here at the time i guess the kkk or a group affiliated came to kalamazoo uh, several years ago and at that time what was the strategy was to have events outside of where they were and um, out in the community and um, that seemed to help alleviate the potential for conflict. So I think that's a good point too, is um, how we might be able to still gather opposition, but not directly in conflict with the group that's bringing here. I, I would love to ban them from coming to the city or any other hate group. Um, but if we can reduce the amount of opportunity for altercations, I think that's a, a helpful goal to, again, to keep the community safe and, um, you know, do what we need to do regarding the, the group that's here. Thank you, City Manager Ritzema. Um, and so just moving forward, and, and Commissioner Pradel touched on this a little bit. And so I was not aware that legal observers um, existed. And so for me, not being present at what happened and only hearing, you know, one side of the story and then having to piece things together. It was very interesting to me that to know that there are legal observers who are on site, who are able to observe, you know, what happens. And so I did ask if they could present to us this evening, because I just feel like that um, it would be beneficial to have input or a perspective from people who are independent and don't have any motive one way or the other for being at an event. Um, and so with that being said, um, it, I'm not sure how we reconcile um, 
the arrest of the media and the arrest of the legal observer. Um, I, I do appreciate, so I am going to accept that there is an acknowledgement of wrongdoing with an apology um, for the arrest. And so with that being said, what are the steps to make sure that doesn't happen again? Um, and so for you, city manager, what have you already discussed or what's in place um, for that? Because the apology is the one, one yeah. piece. And then but what's learn. happening after that? Sure. Um, I think a couple of things. One, that uh, like the legal observers, I'm going to go and check and see if in the pre-planning there was knowledge that they were going to be there and how they were going to be recognized. And because I I went there that morning of the of the uh, protests and uh, met with the 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 organizer of the counter protests and was told that uh, they were there to observe and they're identifiable by the green hats. I don't know if that information was shared amongst you know the the officers that were out there in squads. Um, that's a key piece that we'll need to figure out. And in regards to the media, you know, I think um, just really having media identifiable in these situations. And so what was going on throughout this whole event was um, the, the way the public safety tried to restore order was uh, de declaring police zones. And, uh, you know, we've done that in the past with Bronson Park and uh, even on the uh, north of, or, you know, outside of Western's campus last St. Pat Patty's Day. Um, <clears throat> when there was a big party being planned. So what is done with a police zone is there are uh, several steps that have to be taken. And I'm not trying to, I don't wanna get into a whole lot of detail here. I know there's a lot more, but I think it's important to note that, you know, they announce what's gonna happen before it happens. Okay, so everyone, you know, there's a lot of emotion, a lot of, you know, frantic stuff going on, but, you know, their obligation is if they're going to do something, you know, I believe it's at least four announcements before anything is, is happening. So what they were doing is creating police zones where they either anticipated something happening or where something did happen. So, um, you know, understanding that more, I think, is important uh, related to future events, because if that's a strategy, we need to make sure everyone understands that up front and not rely or, you know, if that's a strategy, we need to communicate that better up front. I, that'll, that's how I'll leave it. Okay, thank you. And just the last point that I'll make um, before we move on and continue this conversation. Um, this just goes back to something that I brought up of a few meetings ago and it continuously comes up. Um, one is accountability and two is where is the opportunity for the community be, to be involved and how they are policed. Um, I'm still not seeing those things happen and those holes are detrimental uh, for the community. Um, as we've seen again, um, we've heard you know, from different commission meetings that there are groups of people who have very um, positive outcomes and positive experiences. And it's not like that for the entire community. And so where are we, when is that going to happen? Um, I feel that we've had repeated meetings, we talk, you know, and, and where is the where is the action on the other end to say, this is going to stop. This is not going to happen anymore. I know you can't make 100% guarantees, but something a little better um, than what we have to go off of. And I'm going to leave it at that for right now. Sure. And, and Vice Mayor, if I could, then, um, you know, that, that was a component of the action plan that I presented in, in June. Uh, the plan with was to have CSPRAB assist in that. Um, that has 
that understanding has occurred and now it's um, scheduling those those times and I will make sure that those are accelerated, you know, given where we at are today and um, they happen as soon as possible. Thank you, Manager Ritzma, and thank you, Vice Mayor Griffin. For now, other discussion, other commissioners? So I'm not, uh, Commissioner Not. Sure, thank you. Was debating if I wanted to ask some questions and make some points before or after um, we hear public comment. So I think I'm just going to build off of what the vice mayor and the other commissioners who have spoken have said, and I apologize, I've been scribbling notes and I'm going to defer to them to keep me organized. But I think if there's a mistake that the city of Kalamazoo made um, in the planning around uh, the Proud Boys coming to town is that we deferred to uh, a white man to help shape our response um, to this, what ended up being a visit uh, to Kalamazoo last Saturday. Um, we ignored um, or we should have rather listened to black leaders in our community who, as the city manager referenced, uh, lifted up the fact that the Klan did come to Kalamazoo years ago and there was a model and a best practice in place in terms of how to deal with the Klan. And instead of le listening to those leaders that in so many words said, don't give oxygen to this group, don't allow them to um, you know, fracture our community anymore, uh, we followed the lead of white leaders um, who established a counter protest um, in the same vicinity as where we knew that the Proud Boys were going to be visiting. Um, sorry, my notes are a little bit scattered. So I, I think a couple of things. If I had a first question for the city manager, it would be, um, when will we have the ability to issue arrest warrants to any Proud Boy members that we have on video uh, that we know have committed an act of crime? And what are we going to do to ensure that the prosecuting attorney um, make sure that he's actually prosecuting these cases and not dropping the cases? Because we've seen countless times where the, the prosecuting attorney has not taken up charges or deferred them back to the city attorney and that's unacceptable. So I think that would be my first question is, there are hundreds of videos out there. When and how are we going to execute the, the issuing of warrants um, to arrest Proud Boy members, regardless of what state they reside in? Sure, uh, Commissioner Knott. Um, as I indicated, there are a lot of videos out there, a lot of footage. I just want to take the opportunity to ask the public if they have any footage they believe will help us identify uh, folks um, to do so, get that to us ASAP. Um, I'm going to defer to the city attorney about the prosecutor and that process of it, but I, I, I understand from what happened in Grand Rapids uh, that Saturday before our events occurred, you know, like May the 30th, um, they were issuing arrest warrants, you know, weeks after the event based on your review of video footage, identifying who that is, and then going and pursuing an arrest warrant. So we will take undertake that as best we can and hold people accountable to the actions that they they made that day that are criminal so it sounds like we are going to have a dedicated team within the department that's going to be reviewing all the video again hundreds of video clips right now probably yep. more will come in um and then there's the identification process where we see a face and then we go to whether it's LinkedIn or you know whatever the yeah. pages are and find these yeah. folks. And yeah. I agree with what the vice mayor said. I think that there's another action step as it relates to who are Proud Boy members that reside within our community that are cowards, that are affiliated with this hate group um, and walk the streets with us each and every day. Pivoting from that, you know, I was, I was stunned, absolutely stunned to have learned that the Michigan People's Defense League from Detroit where Southeast Michigan traveled to Kalamazoo to provide um, armed an armed perimeter around the festival site. Um, and I think part of that shock for me was this counter protest had been billed by Mr. Dennison as a peaceful counter protest, bring your family, bring your Bibles and let's come together and have prayers as the Proud Boys um, march down the street. Um, and so I guess I have some questions perhaps for my colleagues but also towards Mr. Dennison as it relates to one, 
why was this information not shared that armed guards armed with AR-15s were going to be attending the counter protest when he met with the city, um, whether that was with the manager and the chief and the mayor to talk about the operational plan. I think this was critical information that should have been shared. Um, another question would be, Mr. Mayor, I've seen it repeatedly on social media that Mr. Dannison called you and messaged you that homeless folks were being attacked. I'd like to know whether or not that was the actual case. Um, Mr. Dennison has repeatedly referenced um, in social media posts that he is armed and his neighborhood is armed and I'm lifting that up recognizing it's dangerous but this conversation that we're having right now is very important but we forgot two weeks ago we talked about the fact that over 51 shootings have happened in our city. Double digit homicides. Why aren't we coming together as a community and right now talking about how do we stop the next young kid from getting shot and instead we allowed two groups to come together with homemade weapons and with guns, convene in our downtown, um, and we're continuing days after to promote in, in, on Facebook and in comments whether or not we carry. And, and you know, this isn't a Second Amendment conversation. We have a bun, gun violence crisis in this community, and this rhetoric is dangerous. And I don't agree with this vigilante justice rhetoric. My next question, I guess, would be. Um, I guess aimed at Mr. Dennison and again to my colleagues, if you are wondering uh, why I'm, I'm asking so many questions during this time to Mr. Dennison, it's because we have not heard from him other than the dozens of Facebook posts that are out there right now. And again, if we would have listened to black leaders and not given oxygen to this hate group that came in, if we would have followed a proven model from years ago, we might not have had this incident that happened. So my next question is, do you take responsibility for the melee that ensued on Saturday afternoon? Um, and why in the world did you repeatedly use the race baiting word lynching in your social media posts? Um, and so, you know, yes, there were a tremendous amount of mistakes that occurred on Saturday. I'm aware that we have after action and looking at our policies, but at the end of the day, I am, I am stunned with the counter protest being billed as peaceful. Um, and it was anything but peaceful. I, not to suggest that there weren't folks that came down. I know that some of the commissioners had talked about going down, um, but, but this, this was not a peaceful counter protest. Um, and that's not to say that everybody that was down there didn't have their own agenda or weren't there uh, under the guise of bring your Bible and pray and, and stop the hatred from coming into the park. Um, but what we witnessed, again, dozens of videos out there, folks, the, the, the Proud Boys, and if there's a video that counters this, please share it never made it to the park because the park, the festival site emptied and met the Proud Boys in the street. Um, and now here we are. And uh, the community, again, my heart breaks because we are, we are so deeply divided. We were already divided. We already are suffering from um, racial tensions and systemic racism and all the other um, you know, social situations that we've been de debating for months. Um, we're still locked down in a, a COVID pandemic and we know what that is doing to our community. And now here is a, a conversation that really wasn't warranted if we had handled the planning on the upfront and listened to um, leaders that cautioned us about engaging with the Proud Boys. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Knott. Other commissioner comments? I really wanna echo what Aaron just said. Uh, it, it, it is everything that I've heard and been um, thinking about in these last few days. Um, the only thing that I'll say as a former coach is that we prepare for a game. Uh, should we lose that game? We go back and look at film and uh, we prepare again to engage again. And so um, I would encourage us to look at film and then also make sure that the body cam uh, footage is released to the, uh, to at least to us and to the public um, as a method of communication, greater communication about what went on uh, on Saturday. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing the uh, answers to Commissioner Knott's questions uh, about the homeless and how they were protected and whether they were attacked. Um, you know, Winston Churchill said, if you're going through hell, keep going. Um, we have to keep going. This is our community and we are better than this. Um, and I, I would love to see us continue this conversation and see the big picture and remember who we are and remember whose we are, um, to use a bit of religious language. Um, we are one. This community deserves better. And uh, I appreciate my fellow commissioners, 
Chris and Aaron, uh, but you, uh, all of you for speaking and for asking and for holding people accountable. I think we are all accountable. And I think that uh, we continue to have to hold our public safety department to a higher standard. Um, and uh, Vice Mayor Griffin, yes, uh, we do need to learn how to police these communities. Um, I've heard from several of my constituents around the community that, that we want to be policed and they wanna have a say in how they're policed. So uh, hopefully we continue to have this civil conversation in a civil way. Um, tearing one another down does not work. And so again, here, here, and um, let's continue the conversation. Thank you, Commissioner Hess. Commissioner Cunningham. Um, so I reserve my comments to be last um, or as close as last as I can be because um, I was just really intrigued to see where a lot of my colleagues stood and their feelings and their concerns uh, and things of that nature. Um, Vice Mayor, you mentioned that, um, you know, why is it that the response, uh, why didn't we respond to them as a, as an organization that has a history of violence? And I just wanna acknowledge, um, you know, to everybody here that that's a piece of what's wrong with the system is they view African-Americans as having a history of violence. Um, and so whether we bring something peaceful or not, we still get looked through the same lens. Um, and that's a reality, that's a fact, that's not a, that's not an Eric feeling, that's uh, statistic, statistically proven. That is something that I think a lot of individuals are feeling as it pertains to what took place in June and, and what we see now. Um, I don't have many questions, but I did have two for Clyde. Um, so this Clyde, the first question is, you know, for clarification for individuals in the community, um, your office or your office did not review the potential charges against those arrested over the weekend. Am I correct? No, that's not true. Okay. I, I reviewed five cases out of the total number of people who were arrested. Out of those five, what were your recommendations? I did not authorize charges against any of them. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question for you, Clyde, to your knowledge as of right now, can we legally restrict terrorists, um, both national and domestic groups from coming into our city? No, uh, there is, as, as the mayor mentioned, you may not like their speech, uh, but they have a first amendment right to give that speech. Um, and so, yeah, they, they have a right to come into the community. So they no don't have, they don't have the right to incite a riot, uh, but they have, they have the same rights as anybody else to occupy public spaces to voice their message. <laughs> so they have a distinct, uh, so there's no <laughs> distinction between them having a message and them being recognized as proud boys. Uh, and my question behind that is, you know, if, if if a known enemy came into our community from, I don't know, whoever we might consider an enemy from international, uh, you know, we would technically have no ability to arrest them without having a, a direct link to the laws that they broke based on their affiliation. Yeah, I mean, it gets, gets complicated, but yes, they have to actually engage in a criminal act before they can be arrested, as opposed to being arrested for who they are. And then um, with the other charges, have all of them been dropped yet? The other, the, the other charges went to the county prosecutor or have yet to go to the county prosecutor. So I have no idea what those... Uh, charges are how they're being handled. Uh, knowing that, um, and, and I stand behind our mayor, David Anderson, I stand behind his statement that I am asking that unequivocally, every individual who was arrested, every single charge should be dropped. Um, anything less than an unprovoked bodily harm caused to somebody else, every single charge should be dropped, no questions asked. 
Um, and yes, if, if we look at that in the context of what would we do if an officer did something wrong, in a lot of these instances, we would give them a verbal warning. I ask that we give a verbal warning. Um, so I won't really get into the details. Uh, I had an opportunity to actually make it down to the protest. I got there relatively late when the individuals, the Proud Boys were already inside of the parking structure at the Radisson. Um, I won't really get into the details, but I at least wanted to provide my colleagues of you know, some of the overarching things that, that I felt were, were issues. Um, one of which is, uh, city manager, we have to, we have to, we have to get a better way to communicate. I know I was there when they were setting up the police zone. I was, you know, I was 30 feet away. I was 20 feet away. I was 10 feet away and it was barely distinguishable what they were saying. I think a piece of it is, you know, they're using a blow horn and if it's pointed that way, they can hear it, but these individuals can't. Um, also in the same sentence, there is so many different things going on, so many different voices going on, so many, so much noise going on at the exact same time that it's very hard to understand what was being said. So I can honestly say my word alone, specifically being there uh, when that police zone was set up in place on the corner of Rose and Michigan, uh, it was not distinguishable and I was literally 15, 20 feet away. Um, it, even included in that, uh, there was a group of individuals in a circle, one had a drum, all of them chanting the same thing, uh, cops love Nazis. And I was literally just outside of everybody walking by and I couldn't understand. I had to ask somebody else, well, what are they really trying to say? And they explained to me. Um, so it's not just that, you know, I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional, but that was one of the things that I think is very, uh, very uh, noticeable in, not in the, just this instance, but what we dealt with in June. Um, so I don't know if there's a way, but we should figure out a way to be more boisterous and loud uh, with our blow horn or whether it's a vehicle or something along those lines to get those announcements out. Um, what I observed, although late in the observation, so I give a disqualifier that, you know, by the time I got there, the Proud Boys were, you know, uh, you know, jumping in their vehicles and leaving. And it did feel as if we were aggressively approaching our citizens. Uh, but an overarching thing that I think our community took away from this is that uh, they were aggressive with our citizens and passively aggressive with the Proud Boys. Uh, and I think that's a distinct issue. Um, and and I, I truly feel that two of the individuals who were arrested uh, is, is a supporting factor uh, with that statement due to, you know, one being from M Live and another individual being from uh, legal um, counsel just there to, 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 to be a, a viewer. Um, I, I can definitively say that I saw one of the videos and, you know, if there's violence around, I'm not sure why you would remove an individual who's a nuisance um, at best. Uh, and so, you know, to me, um, I know that we'll be doing an after action review, uh, but city manager, will we, I, I would advise and I would ask you, uh, or I'm asking you, will we also add these events to the independent investigation team that will be uh, reviewing the events from June? Yeah, we certainly can. Um, the RFP is still being written, so we can, I believe we can adjust it for that. And like I said, I think the, the major reason behind having an independent body come in um, is one, I even think that this would be a good opportunity to benchmark, you know, how we responded to each other and, or each event, uh, whether it be in June and, and now. But I think overarching, you know, uh, uh, after action review is still an internal investigation of yourself. So how much of that, if, if there's a lack of trust, then the perception would be if even if the police did find anything uh, that they did wrong, they wouldn't come out and be forthright as much as they should be 
or communicating in, in, in the way that they should. So for protection uh, or, or for a better, at least a better outlook, I think it should be uh, done independently. So I appreciate um, that, that piece of the commitment. Um, once again, to my commissioners, uh, the accountability comes back to us. We have a job to do. A piece of that is protecting our community and a piece of that is, is even protecting our city administration. And honestly, we failed at both. We failed at both. Um, and, you know, a lot of you, I'm sorry, you're new to the commission and, and uh, this is, this is a part of the responsibility that we have based upon the decisions that have been made since the beginning of this charter and the beginning of the city commission. Uh, and so once again, I'm gonna drill into you. It's our responsibility. We have to find ways to ensure that our citizens are safe and that our communication is strong and that there's accountability when it comes to the leadership within our city administration, right, wrong, or indifferent. And when we don't have measurements in place or metrics in place, it's hard to say, it's hard to pull something out of thin air and just say you were wrong for this. Um, I can't hold somebody accountable for something I didn't express to them. And that's just a reality. Uh, and, and I know it was asked before by my colleagues that, uh, you know, how do we get the community in on, you know, the, 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 how we wanna be policed. And I think a huge piece of that is for them to give input on the things that's important and how do we measure that? And what does that look like? And I think once all the parties that are involved with those measurements can come to an agreement, then there's, a, there's not just accountability on the commission's part, but there's accountability on the citizens, part, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, and so I, I stand behind that wholeheartedly. Um, and, and I think that also goes into what uh, Manager Richmond men mentioned earlier. I didn't even remember uh, the Mothers of Hope and Commissioner Moore organizing that event years ago when the Klan was here. Um, and so that was institutional knowledge that was dropped along the way. Uh, and I do ask uh, Manager Ritzma that we uh, we input into our, our procedures uh, that this type of event creation will happen in other locations pertaining to, you know, someone who, who wants to do this again. Um, and so I, I ask that that be written into policy so that it is, you know, there's no excuse as to why it doesn't happen again. Um, and then, um, I want to highlight something that Chris stated, you know, that communication piece, um, you know, I am encouraging to the community at large, I am encouraging uh, Mayor Anderson, City Manor Ritzma, Chief Thomas. When these incidents happen, the moment that things are, are, are under control and individuals can go out onto uh, a podium, somebody should be there. And I say that because, you know, Chris mentioned, you know, individuals were asking about one question, but the question that I received, Chris, was, are they still here? And that was going on until seven, eight o'clock. Uh, and I think that that is a narrative that could have been addressed uh, quick, fast, and in a hurry had we just got in front of the camera to say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what we know. We give you what we can and we leave out there what we can. We gotta come please everybody, but I encourage each one of you and I, and I have faith that you won't drop the ball in these scenarios uh, and that, you know, people will be able to better see uh, the leadership that you guys uh, try to provide. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight uh, was again, uh, to you, uh, Commissioner Prado, I am so sorry uh, that you had to endure that uh, as it pertains to your, your babies. Um, I also ran into a scenario where someone brought up something personal uh, and, and made an attack towards me over this weekend and same thing. I don't have anything else to say. You either come to me correctly and we can speak or 
I, yeah, I said what I said, don't do it again. Um, and I don't mind, you know, call me out on my leadership, call me out on, you know, my decisions, call me out on what's not being done. That That's a part of the job that is, you know, you know <laughs> if anybody here doesn't have that thick skin, it's gonna be a problem uh, for your mental health. Um, and so that is something that, that I understand. Uh, for those in the community, uh, those who have worked with me, they know. Whether I agree with them, whether I disagree with them, it's going to be two things that's pretty consistent. I'm going to listen to you. And I'm going to take your, uh, you know, I, I try to be intentional with my time by giving you my time. Uh, as long as you're respectful. The moment you get to cursing, the moment you get irate or, or try to become condescending, uh, well, I'll talk to you later. I love you. And you come come back when you can calm down or better cooler heads prevail. Uh, and so those are kind of uh, the things that I want to point out. Um, once again, I, I, I also want to, the last thing I want to really go back to is what Vice Mayor has really drilled in. Time is of the essence. I'm going to be honest with you to the community at large. I'm, I, I, you know, I want to, I'm moving away from this elected seat. Uh, because I have other things that 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 you know, they are that just as valid and important, uh, and so there are a lot of things that we need to get done. We need to get done soon, um, and I think that this weekend's event is a reflection that we don't have we don't have till tomorrow. Individuals are dying. Individuals are getting hurt. These repercussions we may not see them in the light that 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 we would. Uh, automatically judge, but these repercussions mentally can create long-term effects. Uh, so it may not even be seen for three generations away from now. And so once again, time is of essence. We have to come up with these solid solutions uh, and our, to the community at large. There are so many things right now that are in motion that we need four votes for. I'm calling each one of my commissioners out and I think that, I think, I honestly think that all of my commissioners are on the right side of history, but none of that means anything until the votes are passed. Commissioner, um, can I respond? I, your remarks are spot on. And a um, couple of things that strike me. One, with reference to communication, um, I was in the EOC that night, Emergency Operations Center, with the chief, with Deputy City Manager Chamberlain, with command staff. Uh, we had um, a couple of commissioners, uh, the mayor and another commissioner present. We went back and forth on whether we should be at the podium or not. Um, I can say that during that time, we were hearing a lot of information or a lot of, you know, we're receiving a lot of information of where they are, where they aren't. You know, the last thing we want to do is, and I guess this is going to be something for us to process and understand, you know, kind of the pros and cons, but is to share misinformation about what's happening. Um, and so we aired on that side. Um, we did release a statement uh, later in the day. I understand it probably totally got lost in all of the, uh, you know, everything that was going on social media and with the media. So um, we will, you know, look at that and, um, and definitely err on the side of, you know, sharing what we know that we have available at the time. And then with the understanding that we will provide more information as it becomes available. Right. And I think that speaks to a couple of things. One, um, you know, in those instances, Chief Thomas may not be able to get away from her command post, uh, but maybe that's an opportunity for you or Mayor Anderson to be at the podium. You know, maybe you yeah, can right yeah. outside the door. And yeah. you know, when when we get visual that they're on I ninety four, then you say, to our knowledge, the yeah, you know, we may not be in the clear, but we did visualize them going down I ninety four. Yeah, um, those are the type of things that uh, you know I don't think that we can get wrong if we just give the information that right. we have. And we make that a consistent thing year in, year out. They'll understand. Yeah. The community will uh, essentially start to understand that this is just how the process works right. uh, in that aspect. But um, 
yeah, no, I don't want any misinformation, uh, but I think that we can we can find some intentionality in that space uh, for uh, the, the citizens. The other part I wanted to just speak to a little bit, and you know, this is kind of hard to put in words, but um, you know, as far as you know, investigation and all of that, you know, we'll certainly be able to add that to you know the independent review we were making, uh, we were we're underway undertaking. Um, you know, that was the review is of tactics and policies and and all of that. Were they appropriate? And we want that information. Um, as it relates to what the officers are doing out there in real time, you know, I have a hundred percent confidence in their training, in who they are, in their hearts, that they're doing nothing but protecting the public. And again, it's a very fluid situation. So they need to, I guess, be given a little grace on what they're doing because no one wants that job right now. And, okay. um, and so I, I just don't want to, you know, leave the sense to their officers that they did something wrong. And, you know, to me, a mistake is, is one thing, uh, but it's the heart that really matters. And, you know, people make mistakes, we're all human. So we're gonna need to give grace where grace is needed and hold people accountable, but also understand that in the real time, that's how this all works with public safety is, you got to take into consideration everything that's going on in the context. And so it's so important to, to understand that. And where we need to hold people accountable, we will. But you know, going back and second guessing officers split decisions, you know, is, is really difficult and dangerous. Yeah, and, and I completely agree with you. And I think that's a part of the piece that that I think what you're stating is exactly what the community needs to understand. Uh, and, and I hope that the investigative body has that expertise to incorporate everything that yeah. you're mentioning. Um, but I, I, I know for myself, I just want clarity on, you know, and, and to even you utilize, you know, the arrest of those two individuals who, who I felt should not have been arrested and one of which mm -hmm. we made an apology in regards to arresting. Um, there could be some systematic issues. Did that officer feel that he did it because that's there was a certain command that he received? Uh, did he do it because um, you know he just intentionally was frustrated? Did he do it because you know there's so many different reasons that could right. be out there? But I just want to make sure that it's not a systematic issue that's creating it. Certainly, that we and and if it is, then how do we fix it? And if it's not, yep. then you know, then at least you know. At least we know that it's not. And I couldn't agree more with that. You know, that's what we need to be focusing on. Um, you know, I, I really think body cam footage is going to help us because we can go back and see what was occurring at that time when those arrests were made, whether they're legitimate or not, or they were called for or not. You know, we can go and see what actually, you know, did, did the lawyer do something or cause interference that pre uh, prevented us from achieving our goal of restoring order. Um, you know, they're observers, but did they insert themselves in the event? That's the kind of thing we're gonna need to look at. And uh, same thing with the MLive reporter, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that, you know, this doesn't happen again. And, but we also have to understand that, you know, there's, people that insert themselves into events, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, when we're trying to restore order and they're, they're doing that, that becomes a difficult situation. Thank you, Manager Ritzma. I appreciate those. And I just wanna say that if we allow our discourse and, and our actions and our thoughts to separate ourselves from one another within this community, whether we're separated by race or gender or class or neighborhood, then the Proud Boys have won. And the last thing that I want is for the Proud Boys to win this community. Commissioner Hess. Any other comments for this discussion period? Okay, 
I, I just I, want to clarify, Mayor. Vice we'll, Mayor we'll yeah. pick up, excuse me, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify that we'll pick up on this after public comment time. So, okay, so that's that's helpful, Vice Mayor. So basically, the next thing on our agenda is public comment, correct? And no, that, it's uh, consent agenda. Okay, the next thing is consent agenda. Thank you. You know, this is a team effort, obviously. So uh, uh, keep chiming in uh, on our revised agenda. So the next thing is consent agenda. And then after that is public comment. That's correct. All right. And then after that, uh, a resumption of discussion. That would then go to the regular agenda. Okay. Then we go to our regular agenda, which we have some big topics and important topics on our regular agenda tonight. Yeah. And then a resumption of public discussion or a commissioner discussion, as uh, Vice Mayor mentioned, would resume then at what point? That would be during commission comments. Mayor, Thank would you. you allow us to have an open dialogue like we did in this setting at commissioner comments to follow that up? No. <laughs> of course. Thank you for asking, but yeah, I appreciate that. So well, that sounds good. All right. So, well, then I'm just going to make next thing we're going to then. Okay. Next thing on our agenda is public comments, right? No, nope. nope. consent agenda. Consent yes. agenda. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting that. Okay. So then I'm going to make a little comment right here before we roll into that. And so uh, just, I'll just keep it kind of short. A couple of things I want to illuminate, you know, not just for us, but for people who are watching the community. And one of them is kind of a civics lesson. And the other side of it is a human being lesson. So the civics lesson is this, is that we have what's known as a weak mayor, a city commission, uh, you know, a city manager, former government. That's what we have here in Kalamazoo. And so uh, when we're taught, I, I think that, you know, that's the setup we have. So, you know, Commissioner Pradle, as we talk about, you know, the governor doing a good job and being on TV every day and that sort of thing. Well, you know, that for better or for worse, you know, with our former government is not the, what the mayor would be doing here in Kalamazoo. The mayor is a member of the commission. And <laughs> all of us here, you know, work for a very modest stipend on the commission. And many of us, uh, you know, Commissioner Cunningham mentioned this uh, as well, work other jobs. This is meant to be something that we do as community members. These are not uh, life supporting jobs that we're doing here in terms of the income side. None of us that do this work. So I think we have been more focused and demonstrating tonight that the communication that we have and how this work actually gets done, because none of us are working at City Hall every day, how that work gets done is by talking <laughs> to the people that we directly hire and report to us. And those people are a handful of people and a few of them are on with us tonight. Our clerk, Scott Borling, City Attorney Robinson, City Manager Ritzma, uh, our internal auditor and our city assessor. So that, that is the sum total of folks that report to us as a commission. So having this kind of conversation, although it seems cumbersome, you know, we can't have these conversations out of the limelight. We can only have these kinds of conversations at times that are noticed in advance and while public can watch in real time and while comments can be made. So this, you know, this is the form of government that we have here in Kalamazoo. For all its benefits and all the shortcomings, you know, you're getting experiencing to experience on the civic side how this works. On the human mm -hmm. side, I just want to say this, is that in my opinion, for it to function the best, no one of us is going to have the right answer for everything in any given circumstance or the overarching opinion or view of what's going on. So it, the best job we can do 
is bringing the seven of us together to share our different opinions and our different perspectives and work together to try to set the stage for asking our administration, led by the city manager here, to do the job for the citizens in this community that we desire to be done. So I really, really am saying to my team members here, you know, thank you to all of you for communicating your heartfelt comments, for continuing to work together as a commission. I think that's so important. We have to be a model and demonstrate how people with a variety of backgrounds can work together to accomplish the things that I believe our foundational principles that we all believe in. So thank you for all that. Back to tonight. The next thing now that I've been told three or four times on our agenda is our consent agenda. City Manager Risma. We have 12 yeah. items this evening. First is the approval of a professional service agreement with Jones and Henry for construction engineering services for the super high pressure district elevated water storage tank in the amount of $235,000. Next is the approval of a contract supplemental and month to month contract extension with Omni materials for powder activated carbon in the amount of $511,500. Next is the approval of a contract supplemental and change order to the current contract with Peters Construction for the city's street sidewalk project in the amount of $195,072.13. Next is the approval of a one-year contract extension with Olameter for water meter reading services in the amount of $383,660.12. Uh, $666 Next is the approval of a contract supplemental and purchase order with Peters Construction for the Crosstown Parkway water main emergency in the amount of $725,428. Next is the first reading of an ordinance to rezone 118 Fellows Avenue and 110, 114, 120, and 124 Burr Oak Street from zone CN1 to zone CC and to schedule a public hearing on September 8th 2020. Next is the first reading of an ordinance amending the Kalamazoo City Code, Chapter 2, Article 10, Employee Retirement System. Next is the adoption of a resolution adopting and approving an Act 381 Brownfield Plan for scattered site infill housing located at 110, 114, and 124 Burr Oak Street and 1100 South Rose Street and 2349 Shelter Point Drive. Next is the approval of a memorandum of understanding for the Youth Mobility Fund between the City of Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo Public Schools, the Central County Transportation Authority, and the Kalamazoo Youth Development Network. And next is the, it is recommended that the City Commission approve a grant in the amount of $230,000 from the City of Kalamazoo for construction of a duplex uh, with the City of Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo Neighborhood Housing Services and Open Doors Partnership known as Pathways Home. And next is the adoption of a resolution approving the acquisition of eight tax foreclosed properties from the Kalamazoo County Treasurer under the first right of refusal in an amount not to exceed $199,730.89. And uh, finally, their approval of the following reappointments to the Retirement Investment Committee and waiver of City Commission Rule 12E regarding term limits, the reappointment of Dan Dement for a term expiring on March 31, 2023, and the reappointment of Randy Everts for a term expiring March 31, 2023, and the reappointment of Robert Salisbury for a term expiring on March 31, 2023. Thank you, City Manager Ritzman. Commissioners, the requested action is to approve items one through 12 and authorize the city manager to sign all documents on behalf of the city. Is there a motion? Motion made by Commissioner Hess. 
support. Motion uh, supported by uh, Commissioner Cunningham. Clerk Borling, please call the roll. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Knott. Yes. Commissioner Pradle. Yes. Thank you, commissioners. The consent agenda items are approved. Now, I normally don't comment on consent agenda items. They're on the consent agenda because we don't talk about them. That's how they move through so quickly. But I would like to remind people that while we're having all these serious and important discussions every single day, there's a whole boatload of work that needs to keep happening at the city of Kalamazoo. And while we're talking about this, Jim Ritzma and his staff are doing great work, doing great things in the city. All that work can't come to a stop. So if you're interested at all in what kinds of other things are happening, which we have not spent one iota of time talking about tonight, look through that list and see how many items on that list of 12 have great things that are happening in the city of Kalamazoo to move all kinds of things forward for residents of the city of Kalamazoo. Appreciate that so much. Now, am I correct in saying that the next thing on our agenda is public comment? Yes. Yes, all right. So that said, I have gotten a recent update. So I'm looking at this after 10 o'clock. So we've been at this for three hours at this moment. I understand that there are 99 or more comments that are lined up for us to listen to. And in our Zoom meetings now, you know, back in the olden days, it used to be that people came down to the city commission chambers and lined up, made their comments there. But how it's happening for Zoom meetings is people are calling in and leaving voicemail messages and our deputy city manager plays those voicemail messages. I believe the run time for those 99 comments that I was updated about recently is about 2.6 hours. So that means that we will be listening to 2.6 hours of voicemail public comments when the public comment period starts. So two things. One is since it's 10 o'clock now, I'm gonna to wanna to take a bio break before we leap into uh, our comment time, if that's okay for everybody. Maybe other people are have a stronger constitution than I, but I, I'm ready for a break after three hours. And uh, it doesn't have to be long. And the other thing I wanna propose, so just to keep this in mind, once we get this going, it's about almost 10 after 10. So we're gonna be looking uh, between 12.30 and 1 a.m. when the public comments end. Am I doing my math right there? So, so that said, uh, you know, we have a regular, we've got regular agenda items to get to after the public comments. These are agenda items that have been being worked on for months and months and months. In some ways, I'm very reluctant to start working on those at one o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to propose at this point, if people are open to it, and obviously we can vote, we can turn this idea down, but if we want to, we hang in for these public comments uh, and play those out. And then we recess our meeting 1 a.m. in the morning uh, to begin again tomorrow when, when we're fresher and it's earlier in the day. So I, I'm just wondering now whether people will be open uh, to that idea or, or think about it anyway. Okay, so I'm not seeing anything one way or another. Oh. So that, uh, Commissioner Cunningham. I was just really asking for a minute to double back. I'm looking at the regular agenda again. Yeah, let's, yeah, because so, and, and what I say to my colleagues is the, uh, the number two piece on the regular agenda is the non-discrimination ordinance in chapter 18 of Fair Housing Ordinance. Um, I'm not sure if that be a 
long dialogue between most of us. Uh, I know that I'm pretty solid on where I stand with it, uh, but uh, I will agree with Mayor Anderson to recess it until tomorrow, um, as I do have availability, uh, so that that chapter 18 uh, non discrimination uh, non discrimination ordinance can get its uh, fair share of time and not feel rushed or not feel fatigued. Uh, Commissioner Urban. Yeah, is it, is it too late to consider that we uh, handle uh, uh, the chapter 18 uh, first reading uh, before we go into public comments? Is, is it uh, acceptable to do that? Uh, just Don't we want so that, comments before we go into that? No, no, have the, the hearing, uh, the general, uh, the general agenda, the regular agenda move before uh, citizen comments instead are of after. Are we prepared to do the, that? Well, if, if, if uh, Rebecca and Christina are still around, uh, yeah. So I this would be amending our agenda again yes. then? Commissioner Pradel? I was just going to share. I wasn't sure what you meant by tomorrow morning. I don't know if you mean like recess and come back at like 1.30 in the morning or if you're talking like recess and come back um, at like 8 in the morning. I'm sorry. I should have been clear about that. Yeah. Later in the day tomorrow. Okay. I My only reservation is, is that I wasn't, I, I, I do, like you mentioned, have, a you know, to work tomorrow. And so I have, I would have to cancel meetings and whatnot that I have scheduled even starting first thing in the morning if, if we don't plow ahead tonight, I'm, I guess I'm willing to do that, but I, you know, I got to pay the bills. Sure. I also have work in the morning, uh, starting at eight, uh, commissioner Pradle. So yeah, I couldn't do it in the morning. I guess I would propose that it would be, you know, later in the day, you know, we could come back together again at four o'clock or something like that. I hadn't really decided how that would work. Gotcha. If, I, if I may, may mayor, if, if I may, Mayor Robinson, yes. Under the Michigan Open Meetings Act, you may recess a meeting for up to 36 hours and not have to re-notice it. So you have that window that you can recess a meeting and you just pick it up for where you left off. So that if, if you recessed it, say, 7 o'clock tomorrow night, for instance, um, you would be able to do that. You wouldn't have to re-notice it. And you'd pick up the meeting right after... To, to consider the, the regular agenda, if that's your, you'd have public comments would be out of the way. You wouldn't have a new public comment period tomorrow evening. You would just pick up the meeting from where you recessed it. I hope that clarifies it. Uh, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cunningham. Uh, I would just say, I, I wouldn't advise moving the regular agenda before the, com the comment period, because a lot, of it, a lot of the comments may be pertaining to uh, that particular agenda item. Um, right, and I think right. it's important that we hear that first. Okay. Um, and I'll just chime in and say, generally my comments as far as time and what we do in these positions as elected officials, I'm unmoved if we have to sit here for 12 hours, if we sit here for 20 minutes, I don't really care. Um, that's the job that we all ran for. That's what we signed up for. Um, so I'm fine with that part of it, so long as what we're doing is achieving a goal, because while we all may be very tired, um, and I don't want to discount how anyone's feeling, how anyone, um, what anyone's doing, I know we have new children in homes, and just a lot going on. We're here as representatives of our community who are also tired for a plethora of different reasons, for a whole host of other things. And so... I always grapple with the conversation around um, it's taking too much time, right? Because there's been a sense of urgency with a whole host of things. And at what point and at, well, for what issue, what is the important factor that we will sit here and plow through something? And so um, those are just my thoughts as it relates. I'm just one person. I came here in this position and I'm here for it and everything that comes with it, good and bad. So I'll just state that and we'll figure out where we go from here. Well, I, you know, I, I appreciate that, Vice Mayor Griffin, and I probably lack some clarity in my comments. So I'm trying not to be self-serving about that. 
But uh, one thing I want to be very clear about is that uh, by the time we're taking action on things, uh, you know, important things are being worked on, perhaps we are doing it at a time when there will be not as many people who can watch that work, who also have things that they have to do. And, and I want to make sure that that we're doing it in a time frame when people it is available for people to part you know participate by watching as well and it might be more challenging for folks you know at one or two in the morning so i guess i was totally, more so thinking i know i that. totally agree with that i don't disagree but my only i guess other side to that is i serve on a board that meets at 7 30 in the morning that's a city board um so then that's not necessarily the ideal time for anybody to meet either and so I don't know when the ideal time is to take care of these things. There's somebody who's working a shift who will never be able to actively participate in our commission meetings by nature of the shift that they work. And so fortunately now we're in a space where we're doing things virtually. Um, and that's not to discredit any discomfort people are having from not being able to meet in person, but that allows people to circle back um, to what conversations have happened and, and get caught up in that way. So I just, you know, again, I just wanted to state where my thoughts are with this. Everyone else, you know, will go with what majority rules. Right. Okay, so I don't, I don't clearly have a sense on that. Uh, does anybody have any strong opinions one way or another? Commissioner not. Is it strong, but I'll just weigh in. My preference would be that we get through public comment and we take a recess and reconvene because it, as I've heard from a couple of my colleagues, I think that we'll be, I mean, some of us have jobs bright and early in the morning and we need to be present and, and thinking, you know, about the other responsibilities that are on our calendars that we can't control at this point. I also know that the vice mayor and countless other individuals have put their heart and soul into the human right or the housing, um, the housing ordinance and I want to be fresh for that conversation and make sure that we're doing the work and we're not doing the work at 3 a.m. Um, and, and we regret some of the maybe actions or conversation that we have just because it's three in the morning. So my preference would be that we recess after we listen to public comment. So, you know, I don't want to put anybody on the spot here, but if we're going to do that, uh, Attorney Robinson, we'd have to make a motion, right? And the motion would be to recess until a time certain, correct? Yes. And you don't need to make that motion now. You can make it after the public comment portion. And when, so everybody can kind of consult their calendars and figure out what's the best time. Okay, I appreciate that. So I am going to suggest that we take a five minute bio break and that we can come back and then the public comment portion of our meeting will begin. Okay, uh, I uh, I really appreciate uh, the articulateness. Oh, not now. Anyway, uh, uh, it, it uh, I, I, I'm really uh, am impressed by the the depth of thought that they apply to what they're saying. Um, Com Commissioner Urban, you're not muted. Oh, I tried to move myself. Is, am I muted now? 
You're not muted now. Oh, geez. You're muted now.
All right, this is David Anderson, and I'm thank you so much. So we are resuming our meeting. The next thing on our agenda is public comment, and that is uh, handled by Deputy City Manager Jeff Chamberlain. Uh, Deputy City Manager, it's all yours. Yes, thank you, sir. We, we do have about 100 comments here and, and we will begin to play them. And just to also let you know, uh, we did announce this during the beginning of the meeting and it's also part of the City Commission's rules for public comments that we only play one comment uh, per person. And so there were a couple instances where we received more than one phone call from the same individual. Uh, we will play the first one that we received. Uh, the other ones though will be uh, saved and provided to the clerk for uh, a record of the city commission's meeting tonight. So with that, uh, our IT department will go ahead and start with the uh, public comments. Hello, my name is Sean Wayne. I live at 9653 East S Avenue in Vicksburg, Michigan. I do not reside in the city limits. However, I do travel um, to the city limits often, and I am in full support of our police force. Please do not defund them. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Hello, my name is Linda Bogard. I do not live within the uh, city limits of Kalamazoo. I would just like to leave a comment regarding uh, Police Chief Thomas. Um, I would like to thank her so very much for all that she does to keep us safe. And she is an amazing police chief and a human being and has earned the highest respect. And we salute her. We're parents of an officer and we begin to understand all the challenges that she faces as well as all officers. Please know that we will continue to pray for her and all officers and God bless. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cindy Van Beck. I actually live in the county, uh, but definitely work in the city. And I just wanted to show my support for Chief Thomas. Um, I believe that she has our best interests in mind as far as keeping law and order and keeping us safe. And I very much appreciate everything that she has done. And I hope that you would take this into consideration. She actually has the mindset that most officers need to have and in that line, which is they put their lives on the line every day for each and every one of us in this town, plus visitors. And that seems to be what her mindset is. I appreciate the time to give my opinion. Thank you. Richard Van Beck from Kalamazoo, uh, owner of a business. I want to let you know that I support Chief Thomas. He's uh, great for our community and uh, we're 100% with him. I just wish to express uh, my thank you to him and all the officers in the city of Kalamazoo. Thank you. Yes, this is Steve Asais calling and I live, work and worship in Kalamazoo County. And I just wanted to comment on my support for Chief Thompson and the police in general. I think defunding them would be is an act of lunacy. Thank you. Yes, my name is Larry Van Popering. I own several businesses in the Kalamazoo downtown district, and I want to voice my continued support for the chief of police. She is doing a fabulous job, and we need more people like her in those positions. Thank you very much. This is Laura S. Heights calling, and I am calling about Chief Thomas, who I believe to be for the people I work in the city limits, um, have had to call numerous times for clients uh, due to my job. And I am very impressed with how she stands up for the community and the people. I could not be more happy with her. Um, just wanted to let you know, and I am a very faithful advocate for backing the police department, always will. So I hope that this message gets to her and I appreciate everything that she does. Thank you. Hello, my name is Stephanie Kelly and I live in the township. And I just wanted to know um, when our 
are police officers going to start public policing? Like I watched all the videos done by the media guy and there's no talking, there's no explaining, there's just physical handling. And that alone is causing a lot of friction. And I just want to know when are our police going to start talking to the public, treating the public like we're human so they can be treated the same way as well. Thank you for accepting my question. Good evening. I'm Rabbi Simone Schicker from Temple B'nai Israel, which is located in the city limits of Kalamazoo. I also live within the city limits of Kalamazoo. Temple B'nai Israel is a proud member of Isaac, Interfaith Strategy for Advocacy and Action in the Community. It is as, as a member of Isaac, a citizen of Kalamazoo, and a member of the clergy that I'm calling to ask the City Commission to support the Housing Equity Ordinance being brought forth this evening. I am blessed to have a place to call home, but not all of our citizens are able to do the same. We have children in our public schools who are homeless and who are housing insecure. According to psychologist Abraham Maslow, known as the founder of the School of Thought, known as humanistic psychology, people have a hierarchy of needs. The foundational one is physiological needs, which include air, water, food, shelter, sleep, and clothing. For each child who struggles, we need this housing equity ordinance. Our community has struggled with the issue of homelessness for years, and COVID-19 has only exasperated this epidemic. We owe it to each and every person who calls Kalamazoo home to pass this housing equity ordinance. I've heard from individuals about evictions on their record, which have caused them to be unable to find stable housing. For each person trying to rebuild their lives, we must support this housing equity ordinance. I have heard from individuals who have previously been incarcerated about their struggles to find housing in our community. Individuals who have paid their debt to society and want to start their lives again. We owe it to each one of them to support this housing equity ordinance. There are too many examples of housing discrimination in Kalamazoo to name them all, both recent and throughout our history. We are the inheritors of a racist system of redlining and we must make change. We must implement this housing equity ordinance. I thank Vice Mayor Griffin for her leadership on this issue and ask both our mayor and the city commissioners to support the housing equity ordinance. Thank you so much for your time. Hi, this is Regina Nelson and I live in Kalamazoo. I'm calling in support of the Housing Equity Ordinance. As an educator and educational researcher, I'm keenly aware of the importance of safe and stable housing on children's school performance. In our community, a significant amount of children are homeless and are struggling in school. Given that Kalamazoo students will be starting school virtually this year, it's vitally important that their home learning environment is safe and stable so they can be successful. Please pass the housing equity ordinance so all of our children can be academically prepared to benefit from the promise and give back to our city of Kalamazoo. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jordan Blau or and I live in the city of Kalamazoo. I am calling to encourage the commission to have our city manager and chief of uh, KDPS resign. I believe they've both made it clear over the summer and with their previous actions that their institutes and their positions are not able to handle the protecting of our city and that our citizens are clearly more able to protect themselves. I would also encourage the city of Kalamazoo to acknowledge more clearly what happened to Cornelius Frederick. That happened in our city and happened to a little boy that still hasn't been acknowledged and the city still hasn't done anything to stand up for that little boy and his family. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Tiffany White and I am a resident of Kalamazoo County, um, not within the city limits. I live in the village of Richland. As a community member, my perception of what occurred when the Proud Boys came to our community was that they were not Kalamazoo community members and they came to harm our residents and wreak havoc on our community. This occurred as although there was intelligence indicating their arrival, the police response was slow and late, even though there were 111 officers available. And from my understanding, the Proud Boys were not arrested or cited by any means, although many did not have license plates on their vehicles and that and that they incited violence. They even attacked a man who lived downtown and his house was. He was unprotected and vulnerable. 
This is one of the many reasons the housing equity ordinance must pass. Equitable housing is not currently available to all community members, and the housing equity ordinance is an excellent way to work toward this. The Proud Boys organization was strategic in the selection of a rally at Kalamazoo. This demonstrates once again that our community needs to swiftly change to become an anti-racist community. Even from the outside, it's seen as uh, an area that they could target. Uh, We need to make immediate drastic change. The housing equity ordinance is a huge step in the right direction. And although I very much appreciate that the, uh, the public relations officer is being hired and a diversity officer has been hired, and I appreciate the police chief's apology for arresting M-Line reporter Sam Robinson. However, the perception is one of a black man, clearly a journalist, being arrested for no good reason, no criminal activity whatsoever, while many white men were permitted to leave our community after clearly causing harm. This is what I see, and this is what many other community members are going to see as well. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Pat Benji. I live at 2425 Mount Olivet Road in the city of Kalamazoo. I'm a deacon at St. Martin of Tours Episcopal Church and a member of the Isaac Housing Task Force. I'm speaking in support of the housing equity ordinance that is being considered this evening. I am so proud to live in a community that cares about all of its residents. I am proud that city commissioners and city staff seek out and welcome collaboration with other agencies and organizations that also care about equity for all. I am proud that people in positions of power have been willing to listen and learn the hard story of our history of redlining in the 1930s. And I am proud that these same people in positions of power are recognizing that even today, whole neighborhoods are still suffering terribly from that unfair targeted action. All of this tells us good things about the conscience of our community. City staff, organizations, and individuals have spent countless hours to create a purposeful and workable housing equity ordinance that will change the lives of so many individuals and families in our community by removing barriers to safe, affordable housing. This has been an education for many of us. Some of us were not even aware of the kind of barriers to housing that are a part of daily life for many in our community. For instance, did you know that many evictions are the result of domestic violence? This ordinance will require that landlords look beyond the simple record of an eviction and consider circumstances. My goodness, to not look beyond an eviction related to domestic violence simply punishes the victim twice over as they struggle to create a new life for themselves and their children. Some of us were also not aware of the incredible barriers that people with a criminal background face. As people of faith, as people of good conscience, can we continue to put barriers in the way of someone who has a felony on their record that occurred years ago? And when they come out looking for a new life, are repeatedly denied housing without regard to any other circumstances. There is a reason this ordinance is also called the Fair Chance Ordinance. Commissioners, as people of good conscience, I fully expect that you will support this house. Commissioners, as people of good conscience, I fully expect that you will support this housing equity ordinance when you vote on September 8th. Thank you. My name is Ray Sweeney. I'm a resident of the city. I'm also a member of Isaac's Housing Task Force, and I'm a member of the Wednesday Construction Crew for the Kalamazoo Valley Habitat for Humanity. I'm I'm fully in support of the institution of new protected classes as proposed by Vice Mayor Griffin in the amendments of Chapter 18. There are huge problems in the area of affordable housing. Discrimination should not be among them. I'm delighted that the County Commission is considering a proposal to renew the special millage to support affordable housing at a much higher level of 0.75 mills, especially as there will be more support for people who can barely afford the cost of rent Discrimination should not be a means to limit access to affordable housing. Past evictions and convictions may be 
warning bells of potential problems, but there is no way that anyone can be sure that these problems will predict future behavior. There are two reasons why the city should require landlords to assess the acceptability of a potential tenant. First, people change. Getting into good, affordable housing can reinforce those changes. Second, upon learning the reasons for past evictions or convictions, a landlord may discover that these episodes barely reflect on the character of the applicant. We claim that our past is tainted by racism. People of color bear the scars of a flawed system. It is wrong to let those injustices continue to determine future opportunities. On the issue of application fees, First United Methodist Church has assisted several families to find housing. The burden of application fees is a huge barrier to be beginning a tenancy. We have paid it for those people that we have helped. You have the ability to reduce these barriers for all people. Require applicant fees uh, to truly reflect the cost of application process and stop the use of application fees as a means to weed out those least able to pay. Thank you for all you do for our city. The agenda today is full with items that impact affordable housing. Let the approval of these equity proposals in Chapter 18 be another example of the good you do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kaylin Campbell, and I am a constituent in the Vine neighborhood of Kalamazoo. I'm calling in regards to the comments made by Carrie Ann Thomas at yesterday's press conference. My first question is, if she believes that there are good people on both sides, then who exactly amongst a group of white supremacists and neo-Nazis are the good guys? Secondly, if she does believe that these people are good, I want to know why exactly she and her people chose to defend them, these men, over their actual citizens. And lastly, I want to know how she and the rest of the police force in Kalamazoo are going to be held accountable because nobody who makes a decision like she made should be allowed to be in a position of power in this city. If you agree with these people, then as far as I am concerned, you are one of them, and Kalamazoo will not tolerate Nazis in positions of power. My name is Lindsay. I'm a citizen of Kalamazoo. I cannot share my last name or address for safety reasons. I am calling regarding the disgraceful response by the Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety, Mayor Anderson, and City Manager Ritzma to a designated hate group descending upon Kalamazoo this past Saturday. The Proud Boys hate group is comprised of white supremacists and white nationalists, and this group was present alongside neo-Nazis this weekend in Kalamazoo and at the deadly Unite the Right rally in August of 2017. KDPS was, of course, aware of these details. The events that occurred this weekend in Kalamazoo demonstrate that citizens, particularly youth, operate with courage and integrity in response to hate while this city's officials display ineptitude, negligence, and complicity with hate groups. Mayor Anderson, you cited First Amendment rights in your statement leading up to the hate groups rally in March. Not only was this statement mediocre, it was dangerous. You cannot equate domestic terrorism and a history of violent intentions with free speech. I repeat, you cannot equate domestic terrorism and a history of violent intentions with free speech. Mayor Anderson, step down. Chief Thomas, you apologized yesterday for arresting the media, but that is far from adequate, and this city needs real accountability. Chief Thomas, step down. Officials who work for this city must align behavior with apologies and express values of justice and equity. The performative, empty, and symbolic will not do. Yes, my name is Stephen Tavares. I'm a resident of Kalamazoo in the Vine neighborhood. And I'm calling to comment on the uh, situation this past weekend. And I find it deplorable and atrocious as a resident, a minority resident of this city, at the casual dismissal yesterday 
of many of the points that were brought to you by the young people who attended the press conference. At the end of the meeting, I was totally appalled at the attitude that our mayor felt that he was doing us a favor. And the time was now time for him to either go home and take a nap, uh, watch TV, or that the concerns weren't valid. Number two is that it's obvious that this leader of the Department of Public Safety is totally ill-equipped to handle many of the things that have been going on all summer. The vast differences in approaches and the learning on the job training, I'm not so sure, is something that Kalamazoo needs at this time. Number three, this so-called city manager who cannot manage the city affairs and come up with a comprehensive way of dealing with the community on a fair basis and with the dangers that were here this past weekend makes me wonder exactly what is going on at City Hall. My last comment has to do with what is the council going to do now? Because it's apparent that the way that the Prod Boys activities were viewed here as somewhat not very serious compared to what happened in June. Our city was taken over this weekend, and nothing was done. They were allowed free access to come into town and leave without ramifications. The city needs to know what you guys plan to do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jastro Vadwa Cardenas, and I live within the city limits, zip code 49008. I am calling in support of the housing equity ordinance because there is a need to improve this community's well-being. With that, we need to help individuals and families, especially those with children, as they are a vulnerable population, and even more so during this time of a pandemic. Having stable housing will help them perform better in school, as there is one less adversity for them to face. We need protections in place for community, community members who may have had a downturn of events in their life, but are seeking a safe and equitable place to live so they can have a better quality of life. I ask the commission to strengthen these protections for Kalamazoo residents. Thank you. Good evening. My name is John Royal. I am the current president of the Michigan chapter of the National Lawyers Guild. I do not live in Kalamazoo. I used to live in Detroit. I now live in Charlevoix. But there are members of our organization who do live in Kalamazoo. I'm calling because I'm concerned about the arrest of one of our legal observers at the protest on Saturday. And I'm trying, I want to provide some information about our legal observer program. Our legal observers are especially trained. They are, the purpose of them is to observe interaction between police and protesters and if possible to obtain the names of arrested protesters. They are not part of the demonstration. They are not part of the protest. They don't carry signs. They don't wear slogans on their clothing and they don't participate in chanting. They are no more involved in the protest than our media representatives. One of our legal observers, Mr. Vincent Schumacher, a lawyer from Grand Rapids, was arrested Saturday when he was doing nothing but he was assigned to do, which is to observe the proceedings between the protest, the anti-racist protesters and the police. And he was taken into custody, held for six hours and given a ticket for disorderly conduct. I'm calling to request on behalf of our statewide chapter of the National Lawyers Guild that the charge against him be dismissed. If you need further information from me, I can be reached at 313-962-3738. Thank you for listening to my statement. Have a good evening. Hi, Wendy Shield, and I am a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. I come to you on behalf of the Kalamazoo branch NAACP, uh, wanting to support and acknowledge and thank Isaac and um, TH, TRH Chief for the job that they've done so far in uh, fighting for um, the housing equity ordinance. NAACP stands in full support of this ordinance and the work that they've done, and it is our hope and desire that uh, the vote will, your vote will support this as well. 
The other thing I'd like to make a comment on is I would strongly encourage this community to stay focused. Stay focused on the task at hand. Don't get sidetracked by what happened this weekend. That's just a distraction. We have got to stay focused. We have got to be about our business. We have got to be ready to vote. We have got to be ready to fight for our children's education. We have got to be ready to fight against gun violence because it is destroying our community. Please, it is not like we are not used to racism and have not experienced it. These same individuals that came in trying to tear up our city are the same individuals that we have worked with. We have shopped at their stores. We have purchased from them. So don't get sidetracked thinking that this is new. It's just a ploy. And it's one that we cannot fall for. It's one that we have to stay steadfast, united, always moving forward because we have to get to that target. We have to get to what is going to make a difference in laws and policy. We have to vote. Thank you. Be blessed. Yep, my name is Brianna Combest, and I live in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, I am calling regarding the incident that had happened um, over the weekend regarding the Proud Boys arrival. Um, so my question is, um, what was Kalamazoo County's plan to handle this situation as they were well aware of their arrival in advance, at least a couple days in advance? Um, you are well aware of their exact time, day, location. Um, so what was your guys' plan to handle that? Um, where is this documented um, for such plan to handle this? And is this documentation um, and everything public knowledge? Like, what was your guys' protocol to handle this? You guys were well aware they were coming. Um, so I just want to know, what was your guys' like what was your guys' plan to handle this? Um, because you show up late, um, it seems like to handle it to um to protect the this hate group, but to discriminate against the people. So that's just my question. I just wanna know what prior to the incident, what was your guys' protocol and plan and where is that documented? Thank you. My name is Scott again. I live in Kalamazoo. ordinance being considered by the city, I am absolutely so grateful and thankful. Uh, this looks fantastic. Thank you for the work you all have done, <laughs> period. My, my only concern is that I'm not seeing fair representation of our community among um, if there's a complaint or if it has to be uh, checked out whether something is valid or not. Um, there's no, uh, if, if there should be more uh, diversity and representation, it would be a lot like if only men decided the fate of women or only white people decided what black people should have or where they should live or how they should work, period. So uh, please um, put some sort of accountability um, if, or, or it would be like having a bunch of realtors or landlords decide what people who rent actually need. There's no representation, no true representation, not enough anyway. So please consider that. But 
what you're doing again overall looks fantastic. You have my admiration. Thank you very much. Bye bye. I'm Trevon Hobson, a member of Kalamazoo. I work for K Risa. And I am calling because I support the housing equity ordinance in full support. I live within the city. I've been here all my life. And I know the problem with the homeless is getting very dangerous. So if we can get people in affordable homes and affordable housing, that's only better for Kalamazoo. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jack Judd, and I am a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. I'm calling because I am very concerned with what has been going on with our mayor, uh, Jim Ritzema, and Carrie Ann Thomas. Uh, I'm concerned about the tear gassing that happened in the 1st of June, and I'm extremely concerned with the absolute just dereliction of duty that happened um, over the weekend with the Proud Boys. I think it's time that this city takes a real, real hard look at um, getting rid of Mr. Ritzma and uh, asking for his resignation as well as Carrie Ann Thomas. Um, Neither are able to protect the citizens of this city, um, and neither of them have been held accountable, nor seem to believe that they need to be held accountable. Uh, I think it's a really severe problem. Uh, I am all in favor for a recall of Mayor Anderson as well, and that's why I'm calling, and I will be working to uh, make those things happen. Yes, my name is Stephanie Bourne. I am a Kalamazoo resident living in Cork Portage area. Um, I was at the marches this past weekend, and I have a series of complaints, but first and foremost, I'd like to say that I find it unconscionable that when we knew that a KKK group, the Proud Boys, came to Kalamazoo, we were prepared to do nothing but allow them to beat up homeless, defenseless people in the park and relied upon peaceful protesters instead of police to step in at that juncture. Only later, after you had allowed all of the Proud Boys to leave with their vehicles and unmarked with licenses, you chose to not make a statement. You chose to not stand in solidarity with your community. You chose to not arrest a single Proud Boy. You chose to let all of them go when you could have made at least an attempt to ticket to harass them, let them know that the police are on Kalamazoo community's side. You failed to do that on national television. I've had family from around the world commenting. Thank you. Please fix your racist cop force. My name is Christina Smith, and I live within the city limit of Kalamazoo. I'm calling today to tell the city commission exactly how disgusted I am that the Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety and city officials knew that the Proud Boys, an alt-right racist hate group, were coming here and at the same and at the same time allowing that to happen. Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety stood by idly while the Proud Boys initiated violence against peaceful counter protesters. Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety arrested and tear gassed counter protests protesters, including a journalist and legal observers. Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety formed a wall to allow the Proud Boys to safely leave the Radisson parking lot. Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety did not arrest a single Proud Boy, despite being on the scene when they were using tear spray and throwing punches at counter protesters. Police Chief Carrie Ann Thomas said in yesterday's press conference that there were good people on both sides. The Proud Boys are neo-Nazis, they are not good people, and they don't need to be here in Kalamazoo, and they certainly do not need the Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety protecting them. Remember when you tear gas youth holding a prayer vigil outside of a church? I do too. Yep. And you know what? I'm really sick of you. You all need to retire, and I hope that some of you get fired. Hello, my name is Sarah Jacobs, and I am the Continuum of Care Director at the United Way of the Battle Creek and Kalamazoo Region, and I do live in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, The Continuum of Care uh, has a vision for all of Kalamazoo County residents to live in safe, healthy, affordable homes. 
And uh, we recognize and support the city of Kalamazoo's ongoing efforts to decrease housing discrimination and address systemic barriers to housing. Um, if and when the proposed non-discrimination ordinance uh, chapter 18 and the fair housing ordinance chapter 18a um, are adopted, the continuum of care is committed to partnering with the residents, the landlords, um, and housing support organizations uh, as we work together to build a thriving and equitable community for all. Um, I do want to say thank you to the mayor, uh, vice mayor, the commissioners, and all of the residents, landlords, and community advocates who have led the uh, development of this ordinance. Thank you. My name is Michael Barker, and I do not live within the city of Kalamazoo. I've got a comment, a uh, general comment, uh, regarding the actions of the police department on last Saturday. Uh, it is appalling the way they, they basically provided security service for the Proud Boys and let them do whatever they wanted in part violence on our community, it just stood by and watched that. I myself was a member of the peaceful demonstrations against the Nazis, and I was arrested wrongly. Uh, I understand charges have been dropped, but because of all this and the others that were arrested, we. I feel that the city needs to be held accountable. Uh, I believe we should fire the director, the, the uh, Kalamazoo uh, Public Safety, the chief of police, and the mayor better step up and explain what he's going to do to change the behavior and make Kalamazoo a good place to live again. We've lost confidence in the leadership of our city. We've lost confidence in the safety of going downtown. Uh, this just unchecked terrorism of these violent groups with the police standing by watching can't be left unchecked. We need to do something. And uh, I think if anybody gets a chance to read and listen to Pastor Nathan Dannison, he has a very articulate post that explains things much better than I could. But this is an outrage, and our community better rise up to answer this. Thank you. My name is Paul, and I'm a board member of a local organization addressing homelessness. I'm calling today to comment on two items. First, I'd like to express my support for the Housing Equity Ordinance. The ordinance is absolutely necessary in order to assure that our children can start school in a safe and quality home during a pandemic, to protect community members with criminal background history, with prior evictions, and who don't have the money to pay for application fees as well as to establish a civil rights board with oversight and ability to enact accountability and to protect community members from discrimination. I would also like to address the presence of the Proud Boys in Kalamazoo on Saturday and the lack of public safety that was provided to Kalamazoo, including to our homeless citizens. Rather than protect Kalamazoo residents, KDPS, appeared to be clearing the way for the Proud Boys to go about their terrorist agenda. The Proud Boys are an SPLC designated hate group who were prominent at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, alongside other fascist terrorist groups. This group has a well-documented history of violent intentions and domestic terrorism. I'm appalled at the lack of awareness the city and KDPS has shown regarding domestic terrorist groups and demand to know what is being done to monitor and track terrorist groups' presence and recruitment in our city. Good evening, my name is Erica Brown and I am a city of Kalamazoo resident. I'm calling in regards to the housing equity ordinance and would like to show my support and my favor for this ordinance. Um, when it comes to individuals in our city um, and families in our city, 
Um, it is my belief that everyone deserves um, housing. And although people may have um, criminal backgrounds, although people may have been evicted from previous um, housing rentals, um, although people may not have perfect credit or even um, what would be considered good credit, um, they still deserve housing. And so, um, again, I just want to show my support and um, say that I am definitely in favor of this ordinance and um, am kind of baffled that this is even an issue that is being discussed as, once again, people's value and people's worth should not be determined by something um a past mistake or a past hiccup, um, as housing is um, both a human right and a necessity. So thank you for your time and for listening um, to my feedback. Hello, this is Carrie pickett Irway, President and CEO of the Kalamazoo Community Foundation. I do not live within the city, but at my business and company is, does reside within the city limits. I'm calling in support of the Fair Chance Housing Ordinance. Many of us can't imagine living without a home. It's no wonder the United Nations declared housing a human right. Housing provides each of us and our families comfort, stability, and safety from day to day. We all deserve a fair chance at a place to live. No one wants to live in a community that denies adults and children access to housing because of discrimination or bias. In a recent survey of 700 Kalamazoo area residents, 56% said that they or someone they know had experienced housing discrimination. About 64% of our homeless population in Kalamazoo County is black despite being only 11% of our population. Imagine what our community would look like if every adult and child could access housing fairly. The proposed ordinance will, among other things, create a civil rights oversight board that will foster mutual understanding and respect among the people in the city, discourage and prevent discriminatory practices, strengthen enforcement of discrimination against gender and sexual orientation, evaluate impact of anti-racism efforts, and decide disputed cases of discrimination after investigation by the city manager. The city of Kalamazoo has an opportunity to truly be a place where everyone loves to live. I wholeheartedly support the proposed changes to the housing equity ordinances. I hope that you will vote in favor of this as well. Thank you. Hi, my name is John John. Uh, I prefer to remain anonymous uh, for my own protection. Considering the current climate as a man of color here and throughout our nation. Um, I'm particularly calling in in support of the TRHT housing initiative. Um, that is currently going on. I've learned about that through uh, my community involvement here throughout um, Kalamazoo over the summer, particularly as we deal with um, the Black Lives Matter movement, not deal, excuse me, uh, support and embrace the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, but particularly, I learned a lot about um, the different covert strategies that landlords use in their process of selecting tenants that live in the homes throughout, um, pretty similar to red line strategies that we've seen over decades and decades. And uh, the issue that that causes throughout, that can simply lead to matters such as houses being burned down in certain communities, the racial disparity and the socioeconomic disparity those separations cause for these things and it singles out environments and communities that could otherwise be thriving if they were supported by landlords who allow for diversity and um, in certain racial matters. Uh, I would really like to see this supported and us tearing down certain foundations and institutions that have become the cultural norm here in Kalamazoo. Uh, also, the civil rights boards, if they could have a bit more power and influence and a bit of a voice. Um, as far as in, uh, 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 in the movements with this, as uh, they're simply there, in a, uh, as I've understood it, uh, in an advisory role, how about they actually have some input and influence on the situation? Uh, that would be great, and it would be a huge catalyst for change 
in this uh, very, very important time in our history, not just here in Kalamazoo, but throughout the state and throughout the country. So uh, I think that TRHT Housing Initiative, again, is a, a great cause and a great means to change in our current city. Thank you for your time and have a great evening. Hello, my name is Joe Byers. I live in the Vine neighborhood. I'm calling to uh, address what happened this past Saturday, uh, July 15th with KDPS and city leadership. I'm outraged by the actions of KDPS and city leadership this past Saturday, July 15th. Once again, peaceful protesters were terrorized, physically assaulted and arrested why literal Nazi fascists were allowed to parade through the streets of Kalamazoo. The outside Nazi group assaulted people of color and young people while KDPS was elsewhere. When KB KDPS finally arrived on scene, they were more concerned with assaulting and harassing peaceful protesters than they were about getting Nazis out of our city. Time after time, KDPS and city leadership fail the residents of Kalamazoo. Two and a half months ago, the commission promised that drastic action would take place and changes would be made. What an utter and complete failure. Every person who sits on the commission should be ashamed. Absolutely nothing has changed. In fact, it continues to get worse. There is a complete lack of accountability at every single level. When will the people in leadership be held accountable for complete incompetence and failure? I'm asking my fellow citizens to hold these, those who continue to fail us in every way possible to stand up and not allow this to continue. I am demanding that city manager Jim Ritzema Mayor David Anderson and Chief Carrie Ann Thomas to resign effective immediately. And I hope others will join me in this call. We need leaders who will rise to meet the, this moment and clearly they are not up to the task. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Hoffman and I live on the north side of the city. I work for Open Doors Kalamazoo and am one of the co-chairs of the Isaac Housing Task Force with my partner in justice, Toby Hannah Davies. Thank you, Mayor Anderson, to the commissioners, along with the city staff for working diligently to bring this most important document to the public. Kalamazoo has an opportunity once again to be a leader in our community by standing with men, women, and children who have been unjustly blocked from obtaining housing due to race, class, AK's old criminal backgrounds, credit checks, and domestic violence, which more than not has led to an eviction on one's record. We as a city must remember and honor housing is not only a necessity, but a right. Are you aware of how many individuals could not adhere to the stay at home order because they had no home to stay in? Today, you have an opportunity to make it clear to everyone. We are a city who cares about all of its residents and having a safe place to call home is fundamental to one's ability to live and not just survive. The COVID-19 pandemic has given us a glaring look at the ways racism, classism, and the lack of housing impedes communities of color. One of the most important aspects of the ordinance is the Civil Rights Board, comprised of community members working in tandem with the newly formed Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We must be bold and again, courageous because this ordinance is not just about housing. It is about declaring every resident as valuable, worthy and deserving of a fair chance at housing. It is the beginning and not the end. You as commissioners are who we look to, to lead this city into a new era, an era of social change based on righting systemic wrongs and doing it courageously and emphatically. Thank you again for your dedication to every resident as we become that city that sitteth on a hill that cannot, will not be hid. I especially want to thank Vice Mayor Patrice for her vision and leadership on creating a housing, e housing equity ordinance for all. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sterling. I live in the, I live in the city. 
Uh, my question is for really for Mayor David Anderson. Um, yesterday during the press conference, um, when the citizens of Kalamazoo were asking the question of why were there no police that were out patrolling uh, before the Proud Boys had showed up, and you proceeded to scold uh, the citizens that were president yesterday and speak kind of condescending. And I, I, I still have yet to hear your answer of why was there nobody out patrolling when a group that you said you heard of back in July was coming that three years ago drove a vehicle into a group of other folks? So that's my question. This is Mike Fleckenstein. I do live within the city. I'm uh, writing, uh, calling about the human rights ordinance. Dear Mayor and Commissioner, for months, the core group of concerned housing providers has been asking for a copy of the study that was done to support a request to expand Chapter 18 of the Code of Ordinance. Not only have we not received it, but we have not even received the courtesy of an intelligent response. The gravity is, and far-reaching consequences of this matter demand a thorough review of the data that support this action that demonstrates scientific method used in the development and the proper reporting of the data. Scientific studies use steps to first narrow down the question being tested. This report we saw was all over the place, raising a multitude of questions far from narrow considerations. A study of such importance must demonstrate design to arrive at a solid conclusion. We all know, all we know are the graphics presented. We have no idea what the design or methodology was used to arrive at the conclusions. A copy of this letter is being delivered to you that includes the steps and scientific method. I'm not reading them here for the sake of brevity, but because it matters, you will receive them. The steps are critical to the validity of the outcome. A thorough review of the methods and results should be undertaken. Do we know if this was done? Do we understand the credentials of the study team? Do we know the questions are testable and results reproducible? Since we have not heard any consideration being given to a re review of the so-called study, I decided, decided to do the research for you. In an article published by a respected real estate newsletter, DS News, there's an article summarizing a study conducted by a Harvard social scientist PhD candidate on one cause, one cause of housing disparity. A copy of that article is included in your mailing. In summary, the synopsis of 10 years of data concludes that cognitive skills independently forecast the ability of families to achieve better access to housing. You would, you would know this as education. Where in the ordinance is the requirement for education to support the program? We've heard lip service, but no more. A reasonable person, presumably those elected to office, should conclude that there is a reason to believe that other factors influence our condition. If you believe in the outcome of the so-called study, you, also, you must also believe in the scientific structure behind it. You have no choice if you intend to do the best by your con constituency. Otherwise, you have sided with the, the constituency who generally don't believe in science. And you know who they are. No amount of suppression of documentation will convince the enlightened constituency that scientific analysis and transparency do not matter. We demand access to the hypotheses framed, the data collected, and the scientific method used. As commissioners, you have a duty. Hello, this is Aaron Bensinger calling. I am a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. I'm calling to express my outrage, disgust, concern that Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety has had such a record of violence against protesters this entire summer, beginning in late May and early June with the unwarranted tear gassing of youth, peacefully in prayer vigil outside of a church, after which Police Chief Carrie Ann Thomas turned around and said that the videos were staged, which was fascist frankly, um, but could have been dismissed as a one-off incident, perhaps, if one weren't paying attention. Um, and then now, a few months later, uh, August 15th, Saturday, we had a parade 
of neo-Nazi, white supremacist, misogynist, proud boys come to town, uh, of which the city government and police department were well aware ahead of time. And then Carrie Ann Thomas's people showed up, stood by while the Nazis used bear spray and their fists and weapons on the people of this city. And then the police officers turned around and started arresting and tear gassing counter protesters while standing by the entrance to the Radisson parking lot and allowing the Nazis to get away clean. I wish I could say it was unbelievable, but we have known that this police department and Carrie Ann Thomas apparently have an affinity for and some kind of connection with Proud Boys, neo-Nazi fascist groups in, in this area. It's not... It's not alarmist to say so. The facts are obvious, and the videos this time are irrefutable. It would be asinine for someone to say that the videos this time were staged. It's also asinine that, that Chief Thomas said that there were good guys on both sides. Good guys on both sides. We are talking about Nazis, neo-Nazis. Think about that. Carrie Ann Thomas to force her to resign. Hi, I'm a former resident of Kalamazoo. My name is Malcolm. Um, I uh, I understand that you don't want profanity in these remarks, so I'm going to try to refrain, although I am very upset about what I've seen uh, on social media and in the news about uh, the Kalamazoo Police Department arresting uh, counter-protesters who are counter-protesting Nazis and arresting and tear gassing a reporter. I just hope that you guys understand that when information like that is made public, it seems that you are in fact on the side of the Nazis. Um, I know you would like me to call them proud boys, but I'm sorry, white nationalist and Nazi are one and the same. In fact, the Nazis of Germany took every single thing that they used in order to further their fascism from the example of colonial United States. And I need you to understand that when we, the public, are forced to look at the way that this city reacts to white supremacists in that they are reacting on the behalf of the white supremacists and protecting the white supremacists and beating and tear gassing those who are there to protest the presence of proud white supremacists, that you are taking the side of the white supremacists. You must understand that this is how this appears. Do not contact me. Just know that this many people are upset and outraged and paying attention to the very way you react. Goodbye. Hello, my name is Stacy Caudill. I am not a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. I live in Ashtimo Township. And I wanted to leave some comments in regards to um, the housing right and um, the housing equity ordinance that's going to go up before the city commission this evening. Um, I am on the board of Open Doors Kalamazoo. And as you are probably very aware, we uh, strive to build community and fight homelessness within the community. And one of the things that is so important is and in having this ordinance is so that um, these children have, especially during the pandemic, can start school in a safe and quality home. You know, for children who are um, just trying to learn, having their day to be start in a place where they feel safe and are able to get themselves ready and ready to go for the day um, is so important to a good day of learning. My husband was an educator for uh, 15 years, and he could easily tell the difference between children who uh, had a disheveled uh, living situation versus those that had a home to get their day started in. Um, it's also, you know, very important in protecting community members with a criminal background history. 
sometimes people had made bad choices as they were beginning their lives or as juveniles or um, just something that's on their record. And now the, they're not able to get quality housing or housing at all because of that one-time stain. And that doesn't should not define a person for the rest of their lives um, in that we all make changes. They serve their time. They they. Um, they came through to the other side, and they deserve uh, the right of housing just as well as anybody else. Um, in addition, with the importance of having this ordinance to protect community members with prior evictions, you know, once you have that eviction on your record, it's so difficult for another landlord to uh, to approve you to stay. And so, oftentimes, those evictions are not of any fault of their own. I know of a young man, a single dad, who was trying to get housing, who was evicted not because of anything that he did. He paid his rent on time, um, but his, the place where he stayed needed to have some changes done, <clears throat> and thus the landlord chose to evict uh, the two tenants that lived in that duplex, um, and such that eviction is now on his record, again, to a note of fault of his own, but has decisions of his landlord, and now he's permanently has that scar on his record. Um, so please consider the importance of this, you know, housing equity ordinance that's going to be going. Uh, I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matt Smith. I live in the city of Kalamazoo. I'm a librarian, local historian, and a housing advocate in Kalamazoo. I'm calling to support wholeheartedly uh, the housing equity ordinance. Um, and I urge anyone who hates discrimination and loves equity to also support the ordinance. The protections are much needed in Kalamazoo. But then I wanted to switch and make a comment to the enforcement side of the ordinance. The protections are incredibly needed and amazing, but I want clarification, if I could, on the actual enforcement side, because as we know, anti-discrimination policy is only as good as how it's enforced. So if you could clarify if my reading is correct or not. So all, all complaints go to the city manager, who is a white man, Jim Ritzema. He gets all the complaints and he has the discretion to dismiss, to, to bring to bring to an outside organization or to pass it along to the second white man in control of the enforcement, which is the city attorney, Cloyd Robinson. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that. And he does the actual investigation and that can take up to 91 days. That's three months. And then after he is done with the investigation, he sends the results of that investigation to what's called the civil rights board, which I assume has some black folks on it and they get to review and advise. So their power, the civil rights board, correct me if I'm wrong, is really in a review and advisory capacity. And now who uh, appoints the civil rights board? According to my reading, it's an, the third white man involved in the enforcement. That's the mayor of Kalamazoo, David Anderson. If that's the case, please clarify. I want you to know that there's something fundamentally wrong with that picture. So in 18 months from now, when you're, when you're reviewing the ordinance and whether it was successful or not, if you have a low complaint volume, I want you to know and really pinpoint that that is the fundamental problem, that most of the enforcement power is placed in three uh, white men. There's something fundamentally wrong with that. Then I want to suggest that a 91 waiting period might be too long for someone who is unhoused. Where are they going to be in three months after they have potentially been discriminated against? So that's just my questions. I don't want us to repeat what happened in 1966 when anti-racist uh, housing activists in Calum I want to repeat what happened in 1966, what happened. We passed a fair housing ordinance as according to anti-racist local people, there was quote, no penalty provisions and too many loopholes. So two years after that in 68, there was a very low. My name is Sherry Weber. I live in Ashmo Township and spend both time and money in Kalamazoo City. I am calling because I uh, wish to express my um, frustration with the police's response to the Proud Boys coming into the city this weekend. Um, I think that the city needs to provide complete transparency on all of the activities that took place, the sequencing, the people that were involved, um, and the different parts of the police that were involved. 
A specific question is why Portage police were brought in and why were they brought in at the last minute to ensure the safe, the safe departure of the Proud Boys. I also think that it um, is unrealistic for anyone to believe that the police entered um, and arrested 9, 10, 12 people, whatever it was, and none of them were Proud Boys. I find that um, incredibly hard to believe. In addition, at the um, press conference yesterday, I found it astounding that the chief of police said that they used the same plan as they've used for all the other protests, essentially. You knew ahead of time that the Proud Boys were coming in from out of town. This is a differentiating factor from all of the other protests that you had been talking about. You knew their reputation as a violent paint group. This is different than the other protests from before. If your plan was to treat them the same as other protests, then it begs the question as to how and why you thought that would be effective. Um, and it does call into question your abilities in terms of leading and strategizing and being able to take care of this community. I am asking that um, the people involved take real accountability um, and step down and let other people lead. Uh, the response was damaging to this community over the weekend, and uh, it is time for there to be a change in leadership uh, in these key areas. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andy. I'm a city of Kalamazoo resident. Uh, first, I wanted to call uh, to express my support for the housing equality ordinance. Uh, secondly, I'd like to say a few things about what occurred over the weekend. First, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, one, uh, did KDPS take neighborhood safety seriously, um, especially after the Proud Boys proved their violent intentions? Two, has there been any violent or has there been any follow up on the random vandalism report in the Vine this weekend that fits the Proud Boys MO? And three, why was there no effort to arrest or even investigate Proud Boys when they were literally in a centralized parking garage? Uh, I'm also going to say uh, I know that the city was warned weeks ahead of time about the gravity, nature and validity of the threat. They were planning a national convergence. And we saw Proud Boys there from as far away as, as New York, uh, Texas, et cetera. Um, it is a genuine failure that the city and Kalamazoo Public Safety did not listen to experienced organizers who were giving you apparently intel, more, intel and experience more credible than you know, whatever team you have at KDPS to explain the nature of this threat to you. You should have been preparing for a violent siege, not this idea that the hate group was gonna come in and express their First Amendment rights. We told you this. Secondly, you, you tied the arms of organizers uh, at that vigil. You, uh, it was mentioned at the press conference that you can't restrict ass access to a public park. I know for a fact, Arcadia Creek Festival site uh, has been fenced off. Um, it's been in, it can be um, you know, conditional. Um, why do you not extend the same rights to someone uh, calling for a, Virgil, uh, a permit for a vigil that, that for say like rib fest? Um, and I, I just wanted to add to, there was something that really uh, grinded me about uh, this, this idea that, you know, uh, wanting to avoid risk uh, to officers. I'm just going to say this. The issues with policing go much deeper than this three-minute conversation. You know, the DNA of modern American policing, we're talking about strike-breaking, slave-catching, etc. But they also try to uphold this idea that they protect and serve. They completely failed to do that on Saturday. And this idea that you're trying to protect the safety of officers, there were people down there protecting our community safety in nothing more than plain clothes and cardboard signs. I personally wrote my own will the night before the Proud Boys came to town. I, I understood the risks, many others did also, and they did them anyway. One last note, as part of that will, I ask the city commission to pass the Ithaca resolution. Thank you, have a good night. Hi, my name is Shalana Lewis. I'm the director of the Truth, Racial Healing Transformation work at Kalamazoo Community Foundation. I'm a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. I'm also a very involved housing advocate that has supported the development of the housing ordinance um, as it stands thus far. 
Um, I'm calling in to support the ordinance moving forward, um, but also call and shine a light on the fact that the original community members who fought hard and worked extremely hard to get this ordinance supported had every intention and would like to see changes to the current uh, language that's included um, that has been edited by city staff to empower the Civil Rights Commission to be able to adjudicate and not simply advise. It is so important and we see across the community that advisory bodies are often not able to fully impact in the way that we need them to. It is so important that when we look at these issues of discrimination, we really take seriously how this can really impact and challenge the lives of our community residents, leaving them homeless, helpless, and hopeless. Um, as we see over and over again, when you're denied housing and unfairly discriminated against. We need this ordinance to be strong and we need our community to not be deterred by landlords who leave comments that reflect so much bias and disdain for our community while making money on these residents. I am a landlord myself and I can attest to the fact that there are, while there are concerns and being a landlord is difficult, that is the risk that you take when you make an investment with the intention to earn a profit. We cannot put individuals profit over the safety and well-being of our community, period. Please consider updating this ordinance language to include a civil rights board that is fully empowered with adjudicative power that is representative of the community, not external to the community, and proceeds from any fees that are collected include restitution and damages for folks who pay high amounts for extended hotel rooms, uh, extended application fees, and all kinds of things as a result of being discriminated against and denied housing. Thank you. Hello, my name is Caitlin, and I'm not comfortable giving my last name considering public safety is more interested in protecting racists and terrorists than those of us who pay their salary and live within city limits. Thank you to Commissioner Cunningham for being out there, especially on a day when being visible was dangerous. Thank you. Gratitude to any other city official who I might not have seen on Saturday. I certainly don't recall seeing the mayor or city manager defending the city they claim to love so much. Although I did hear a rumor that our mayor was sitting safely in a car somewhere indicating he knew that there was some level of danger. It's hard to map all the BS, but I really don't recall hearing any dialogue, which Kalamazoo is really in love with, uh, about First Amendment rights when black people in our community express their grief and rage over the relentless killing of black life. I overheard a man ask a deputy on the street if he knew where the fascists were, and the deputy said, I have no idea. When pressed that maybe that would be something important to know about, the deputy had nothing to say. Sheriff Fuller, I know the city is not your boss, but I assume you're listening, so I'm wondering if you think that's a problem or not. Mayor Anderson, it's really hard to know where you stand when one week you're crying about a ride along and discovering racism or whatever, and the next week you're allowing a known hate group to come into our town with no plan to protect the residents who you serve. I think you misunderstood the definition of leadership. From where I stand, you are making stupid mistake after stupid mistake and our community is suffering the consequences. City Manager Ritzma, your request that activists teach you is insulting when you know well, we tried six years ago, you do not care. Read some books, evolve faster, or resign. Chief Thomas, you stated officers were hands off to help protect officer safety. From who? The armed Proud Boys who stated they came to support law enforcement? Couldn't have been them. Do you mean counter protesters? Antifa? Anti fascist? Okay. All I saw was officers escorting Proud Boys and unmarked vehicles out of the Radisson ramp and pushing homeless people, to say the least. To me, it seems either you do not know what your officers are up to, meaning you do not have control of the police force you are in charge of, or you do know and you're okay with their behavior. You don't just get to keep making terrible decisions and messed up actions and offer mediocre apologies for those bad decisions. 
Anderson, Ritzma, Thomas, I do. I don't have faith any three of you will rise to the occasion and course correct. I invite you to prove me wrong or resign. Hello, I am the Reverend Rachel Lonberg, Minister of People's Church of Kalamazoo, the Faith Stakeholder Representative on the Foundation for Excellence Board, and a resident of the City of Kalamazoo. I'm calling in tonight to urge you all to support the amendment of city ordinances, ordinances, the amendment of Chapter 18 and the addition of 18A, which are about non-discrimination and fair housing, respectively. As you know, these amendments and adoptions could end discrimination based on source of income, criminal history, and experiences of domestic violence and eviction. It is my faith that no one is defined by the worst thing they've done or the worst thing that's happened to them. No one in our community is beyond redemption. All are worthy of love and care and equal treatment under law. This is the tenet of my faith, but of many faiths, and a conviction held by many people in our community, religious or not. We believe everyone needs a safe, stable, secure home. This is always important, and it is especially important now as many of us prepare to help our children with a virtual school year. So many houses will become impromptu classrooms, and all of our children need a safe, stable, secure virtual classroom. No child should not have that because of the worst thing their parents did, something terrible that happened to their parents, or because their parents are tenacious, clever, and patient enough to receive a housing voucher. So I urge you to support, offer this ordinance for first reading tonight and adopt it when it comes up for final vote. And I want to thank Vice Mayor Patrice Griffin and all of the good and hardworking and dedicated people at Isaac and TRHT who helped get us this far. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sharday Chambers, and I am a resident in the city of Kalamazoo. I live on the east side of Kalamazoo, to be exact. And I'm calling tonight as a concerned citizen. And what I'm calling tonight about, which I know you guys will probably hear more calls tonight, but I'm calling it out Saturday. Saturday, the incidents that were allowed to take place in our city was very disgraceful and also very painful to watch in person and on the news. And the actions that our police department headed by our police chief Thomas took were not good. They were not good at all. The sad thing is to see our city in such a disarray and to see our officers stand down and not do a good job is very concerning. I don't feel safe under the leadership of Chief Thomas, to be frank, because the actions that I've seen her set up for the Black Lives Matter march, that was a peaceful march, and the way her officers were aggressive and being being aggressive towards people of color and people that came in peace fighting for positivity, she came extremely aggressive. Her team came extremely aggressive for what they had set up. But to see an event like Saturday set up by the Proud Boys, who stated they were coming in violence, that that was their goal, and they were able to accomplish that goal was very very horrible to see and watch it play out because for you to take a new action plan and to basically have your officer stand down and to only come when something arrives, that's, that was terrible because you should have came the same way that you came when the Black Lives Matter movement came, the same way you were aggressive, the same way you came with those same tactics, you should have came even harder because this group said they were bringing violence. And I don't feel safe because if this is the type of action that you'll allow a group that's supposed to bring fear and hate into our community, if this is what you allow, that's unacceptable. And you need to reevaluate your mission and your plans because what happened on Saturday was terrible. It was utterly terrible for the residents 
for downtown businesses. Downtown businesses didn't even feel safe at all. And thank God nothing happened to those businesses and to people that they had to serve on Saturday. But you guys provided hardly any protection. But then if we do a peaceful movement with people of color, you come and you want to be aggressive, you want to block, you want to put snipers on buildings, and this was all, it was all just unacceptable. And I really hope you reevaluate everything that you did because Chief Thomas and Mr. Mayor, if this were to happen again, because right now we're in times of unknown, you guys really have to do better. Hello, my name is Alexa Snell, and I live within the city limits of Kalamazoo. Um, I'm calling because I um, support the housing ordinance, and shame on anyone who thinks that the ordinance, if the ordinance is passed, that they'll have to rent to more people um, that they think would tear up their property. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Haley Stevenauer. I'm with Jacobson Management Company, and my property management company resides in the city of Kalamazoo. I, along with several other local housing providers, are asking yet again for our voices to be heard and to work with you while creating this HRO to be successful in combating Kalamazoo's homeless crisis. When deciding to open a property management company four and a half years ago, one of the reasons I knew I would become successful was because I wanted to help house people. I wanted to treat them fairly, and I wanted them to feel like I wasn't here just to collect the rent. My company prides itself on how it conducts business. The HRO is written, takes any responsibility away from those seeking housing, and is telling the residents of Kalamazoo that there are no consequences for their actions. This places all of the responsibility on those of us that provide housing. As a city, we want to fix the problem, However, the language that is used will undoubtedly create a much larger issue. The proposed solution is that you ask us to adjust our standards in which we accept or deny somebody. During one of the prior meetings, we had asked if we could submit our criteria explaining how we select tenants and whether that could be accepted or given critique that we would be in compliance. In so many words, the answer was that you did not have time to do that for us yet you have time to review every complaint, whether the allegations are true or false. You want to hold us to a higher standard, and yet that standard seems to be a set of vague rules which we have to comply or face penalties without any actual guidance from the people will rule whether we violated the HRO or complied. As a small business owner, my business model is built on how we select applicants that we feel will be law abiding, able to pay rent and collect from if there are damages when they moved out, who will be respectful of their neighbors and community. By choosing to operate the way the ordinance is written, you are setting the current HO up to fail. And at that time will subject us to another vague set of guidelines and expensive fines. I would like to know who pays for the cost of these fines, legal fees, and our time to fight the allegations when they are proven to be false. I am guessing you won't be expecting the person who's pointing fingers to pay because you know you probably wouldn't get your money. I am a business, however, so it's just implied that this will be the cost of doing business now. I would like to point out the way that it is worded and your comments that have been made. You are placing all of the blame on us housing providers. I would like to know what you're going to do about the banks and lenders to ensure they are also adjusting their standards in which people can obtain home ownership. Uh, my name is Stephanie and I live in Kalamazoo. I just wanted to call and say that I'm incredibly disappointed in our mayor and our city leadership and our police for the way that they handled the Proud Boy rally in Kalamazoo on Saturday afternoon. Um, I think it's absurd that they were not there to protect and help defend our citizens at Arcadia Park, even though they knew that this was coming a full week in advance. I think it's disgusting that um, our own citizens were arrested and tear gassed, and yet none of the Proud Boys who beat homeless men um, and women were not apprehended or questioned or even detained. Um, and I also heard them driving, you know, exhibitionist driving down West Bench immediately following the rally. And as a lifelong Kalamazoo liver, I, um, I just never felt this kind of shame in my community and our leadership. And I, I think 
It's time that Chief Carrion is fired. I think it's time that Mayor David Anderson takes some accountability for his lack of decision making and honestly lack of being honest and truthful with us and the citizens. I think I think the vigil organizers are owed a major, major an apology and I believe that the M Live reporter that was arrested by police also deserves a huge apology. Um Again, I just want Kalamazoo to improve, and I think I think we need to seriously see this as the wake-up call that it is. Hi, my name is Tamara Custard. I live in the city of Kalamazoo. I have been here since 2005. I am also CEO of Village in the Valley, and I am calling in on a couple few topics. The housing equity ordinance does need to be passed as housing in Kalamazoo is way too expensive and it is creating a strain as Kalamazoo has the highest rate for homelessness in our city as well as in our school district. I am also calling on the behalf of the recent events with the Proud Boys and charges being dropped on three of the nine and one juvenile. Um, I do not know the names of those, but I would like to get information on charges being dropped on Trevor Jackson, as well as charges being dropped on a minor. I do feel that the city deserves updates on all 10 individuals that have been charged, minus the three that have been excluded. I do understand that there are two within the county lines that we deserve to also get update on. Um, I am also calling on behalf of the KDPS. I believe that there needs to be more information on education on exactly what defunding the police includes so that everyone can be educated and on the same page. KDPS needs to be held accountable for their recent actions once more again letting the city down. Karen Thomas has made it very clear since yesterday. Apologies do not create new outlet. You can only say sorry for so many times and without action and you're continually letting us down and sorry is not going to cut it. Accountability needs to be held amongst our leaders and amongst our public safety because it is a us versus them and the noise will not stop. We will not stop advocating until we feel like we have some sort of form of unity and partnership within our city leaders and the black lives community that we represent. Again, thank you for your time. My name is Melissa Schaffner, and I live within city, well, township limits, uh, no, city on the edge. Um, and I would like to know why the Proud Boys were allowed to invade Kalamazoo downtown on August 15 when it was a planned event. And it was planned long enough that a counter protest was organized. And why did KDPS stay away from the conflict that was happening until the Proud Boys group tried to leave Kalamazoo and then protected them and then arrested their own citizens and no Proud Boys members were arrested. That seems very backwards from the obvious happenings of the event. Also, why were homeless people attacked by the Proud Boys, but no one was arrested from their group? There were so many left hurt after this protest, and KDPS was nowhere to be found. Why did that happen? My name is Emily Connor. I'm a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. Um, calling in firstly to uh, express support for the equity housing ordinance. Um, these are just plain common sense, reasonable measures. Um, high time we adopted something like this anyway, but especially in the context of the COVID pandemic. Uh, with so many people facing a crisis of eviction uh, who may lose their homes uh, and therefore also the ability to quarantine safely and effectively. Um, it's really time we put this through. Uh, but also I, I did want to call in um, just, uh, you know, in the wake of the events of a few months ago when uh, Jalmazoo Public Safety uh, in the, with the assistance of the National Guard uh, unleashed tear gas on peaceful protesters uh, gathered to uh, express their belief in the, uh, the value of black lives. Um, it's just, it's very encouraging. And I want to congratulate KDPS on developing such a profound, healthy uh, respect for the First Amendment. Um, and uh, it, just in time to acknowledge and protect the rights of the Proud Boy, uh, designated by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a 
extremist hate group, which had been announcing and uh, publicly announcing their intent to come to this city and terrorize its residents, specifically its black residents, on social media uh, for weeks. Uh, this was uh, pretty available information, even if it had been left up to you to find it yourselves. But as it happens, uh, many community organizers um, attempted to get this information to you in time to do something about it. And uh, but but you know you, you you made the choice to protect the right to assemble, even of a neo-fascist uh, domestic terrorist organization like the Proud Boys. And it was left to citizens to insert their own bodies in between these thugs, these outside agitators who came here to terrorize us, and there would be victims. And I, I just, you know, I was as I was sitting in the emergency room with my partner's uh, blood still on my hands, um, I found it interesting that the nurses that treated them uh, were able to very quickly discover this information and uh, make an assessment and come to the right uh, opinion about it within uh, a couple minutes. So I really feel like possibly we should be funding uh, nurses and doctors and hospitals better than the police, since they're apparently able to do not only their job, but y'all's as well. Uh, just something to consider. Uh, good evening, City Commissioners. Uh, Jacob Johnson, uh, Kalamazoo City resident, um, wanted to call in support of the uh, Chapter 8 Housing Fair Housing Ordinance. Um, and also uh, want to say once again, um, Mayor Ritz, uh, excuse me, uh, Manager Ritzma and Mayor Anderson, that I look forward to talking more about uh, civil rights and human rights, specifically as it relates to black people in Kalamazoo, in our nation, in our state. Um, the current events in Kalamazoo over the weekend, the overt racial terrorism in our community, um, the ongoing racial disparities that we see in every sector, whether it's education, criminal justice, health, and housing. Uh, and our economy in general is unacceptable, and we must do better. Uh, and it's nothing new um, for Black Kalamazoo residents and uh, Black Americans. This is nothing new. The racial terrorism, the racial disparities, is nothing new. So the question is, what are we going to do about it as a city? Um, we have a chance to be an example, um, and so far we have been far from that. And as city leaders and elected officials. Um, you, you have to do better. We have to do better as a community. Um, so again, I'm looking forward to having this conversation. We need a collective commission, a uh, black commission for Kalamazoo, for the city of Kalamazoo, so we can talk further about a specific black agenda, which should include some form of reparations. Um, the state of Michigan, again, has declared racism a public health crisis. So has the county of Kalamazoo uh, declared racism a public health crisis. So what, what are you doing? Um, and specifically for black residents in Kalamazoo, what are you doing? Um, and I look forward to talking more about that. Um, I have some ideas, um, and I'm waiting on y'all. Um, uh, the time is now. The time is now. We can't continue with this. Um, and again, it's nothing new, and we know this. So um, it's time for some real actions. I want to give a special shout-out to the Vice Mayor, Honorable Patrice Griffin, um, and other folks. Uh, I look forward to seeing what, what more we can do as a city. Um, and I look forward to seeing what more you can do as elected officials. Um, and I think we would need to have some serious conversations about KDPS, Council Department of Public Safety, um, and Chief Kerry Ann Thomas and what's going wrong with um, the unequal serving and protective, serving and protecting of our black uh, community. Um, Yes, we've had some rise in gun violence lately, and I think we need to look closely. I, th I think we need to look at the root cause of gun violence and how it is uh, directly related to white supremacy and racial racism and the long history of that. And Kalamazoo is not free from that. Black Lives Matter. Hi, my name is Cassie, and I reside in the city. I'm calling to voice my concern about KDPS. The response to the Proud Boys on April 15th clearly told us residents where they stand. Clearly, Kalamazoo is in need of some leadership change, including Karen Thomas and Jim Ritzema. We need to protect our residents, not terrorist organizations and hate groups. I read comments from KDPS just days before saying they were ready to act during the Proud Boys protest. Maybe I misinterpreted it, 
but I thought they meant they were going to protect our citizens, not give the Proud Boys security detail. And when they left, they left the parking garage without license plates. How come we didn't pull some of them over? I can't imagine you can drive without a license plate visible. I am very concerned with how KDPS is handling the, the relations in our community. Just a hot tip, I assume you could use some PR advice. Do not play recordings of comments given by people who do not live in the city. We don't care. I'm glad you have your white business in the city and you think police are just perfect, but we are talking about real issues in the community which you are not a part of. It's not a time to stroke egos. It's a time for change, and that means at leadership levels as well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Charlay Davis. I live in Kalamazoo, and I am the executive director of Isaac. Good evening to our mayor, vice mayor, city commissioners, and staff. We are so thankful to Vice Mayor Patrice for sharing her housing brief some years back that she researched and wrote, as that was the needed catalyst for this work and for this ordinance. We also want to say thank you to our vice mayor for staying the course for equity, even when that the voices we heard during our focus group and sessions will not be in vain and that our beloved community members experiencing housing inequities can access safe and quality housing. It's time to stop blaming our community members who are experiencing housing inequities and begin addressing the system. We need a civil rights board to help ensure this ordinance is impactful. Community members need to be members of this board. The reporting and enforcement mechanisms must prioritize transparency and accountability. The time is now. Also, as we know, there were white supremacists and neo-Nazis in our city rallying for hate and violence towards those of us they see as others. Many community members were targets of this hate because of their identities. But honestly, this is not new to us. As community members from marginalized groups, we are taught from very early on as a survival mechanism to be aware of our surroundings and to be careful of where we go. But I must also lift not only this overt racism that we saw Saturday, but also covert, con covert racism, white privilege and power, oppression and systemic racism all need to be dismantled. All are toxic and all can be deadly. The disparities of systemic racism are just as dangerous to bodies, minds, and life chances. The responses to both overt and covert racism have to be better. Showing those of us who are targets of this hate that our lives really matter in word and deed. I am continually hearing community members, including leaders, asking at yesterday afternoon's press conference, asking and urging to be a part of the work that institutions are engaging in for transformational change. I am wanting and ready to see authentic collaborations happen. For those already doing this, community collaboration and brainstorming needs to deepen. The time is now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Trevor. I live in the Vine neighborhood. Uh, so obviously, like a lot of the people calling tonight, I'm upset with the city's handling of the Proud Boys rally. Uh, but more specifically, I want to talk about the mayor and his reaction to what went on. Uh, I saw his press conference and like throughout the whole thing, he just seemed combative and condescending and rude. And I just, I think it's gross. And I think, the mayor is like, it just seems like he didn't want to be there. It seemed that he, he was upset that the community would dare to question him. And I just, it seems like he has a lot of like very little regard for this community. And I think he's a disgrace to his office and he's a disgrace to this community. And I think he should be recalled. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know if you're familiar with the term public servant, but I suggest that you Google it. Hello, my name is Carolyn Bissonette. I live in the limits of Kalamazoo City. I grew up in the Winchell neighborhood. I currently live in the Vine neighborhood, graduate of Kalamazoo Central High School. Um, I grew up in this city and I'm calling in to speak not only about our housing residents, but also about the protests, the counter protests and the response by the police um, over the last few days. So first of all, in regards to our housing ordinance, I think that it is imperative that we do something to pass this ordinance to make housing more affordable in our city, to make housing more accessible. As a resident of Kalamazoo, every time I drive to the supermarket, I go anywhere, you know, I see it. It's on the streets. Those people are in the parks. They're on our corners. They're asking us for help. How can we keep just driving by them and, you know, giving 50 cents? We have to do something. We have to find houses for every resident of Kalamazoo and make that equitable for all. I also want to speak to the way that the police handled these uh, protests and counter protests over the last few days, having attended the Black Lives Matter protesters over the uh, protest over the last few months. I have to say that this Proud Boy event was completely different, and I was shocked to see the difference in how the police treated the city, the citizens and the residents of Kalamazoo who've taken to the streets over the last few months to express their voices. There was a visible police presence everywhere. Um, you know, just telling us almost like we weren't welcome in our own city, that the change we want to see that is imperative, that it wasn't welcome. And then when the Proud Boys came, there was no one. I mean, there there was no one to be seen to sort of defend the residents. And then the MLive reporter and nine or ten others, including a minor, have been arrested. I think we need, need, need to have those charges dropped for those residents of the city who are simply out there to protect the city, to make their voices heard. I mean, we have the right as citizens of the United States to protest. And I understand that's why we let the Proud Boys and you all felt that you, you needed to let them march and sort of demonstrate in the, the very visible, provocative way that they did. But then we can't flip and, on the other hand, arrest our local citizens who are there to counter protest. Those charges must be dropped, including for Trevor Jackson and the minors specifically. So those are my comments. Thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. Hello, my name is Emily Olivares, and I live on the north side of Kalamazoo. I'm calling to urge all the commissioners and the mayor to pass the housing ordinance. This ordinance will stop predatory practices in our community and further protect our vulnerable neighbors. I also urge that the Civil Rights Board to be passed as originally proposed by Isaac and TRHT. The Civil Rights Board must be made up of the community members and have real power to enforce the, their verdicts. If you want a community to trust you again, you will pass this ordinance. Uh, I would like to uh, make a comment about the uh, police action this weekend and to ask the city council to uh, uh, make public uh, evaluations of the performance of the uh, local police. Uh, I live in the Edison neighborhood and I saw online the uh, way in which the uh, police uh, handled the activity on Saturday in Arcadia Park, and I think that the uh, performance of the police is a good argument not for reforming the police or for defunding the police, but for abolishing the police. If they uh, arrested the counter-protesters and they... Uh, sprayed or gas sprayed or pepper sprayed the counter protesters instead of doing the same to the uh, hooligans who invaded the uh, city i think it's a very good argument for abolishing the police and for firing all of their bureaucrats thank you this is ali creamer from the stewart neighborhood the first thing I wanted to say is the last time I watched one of these, we couldn't see your reactions to the public comments. And I'm not sure if you're doing it this time, but I think that's important to see your first reactions to what we're saying um, so we can see how you really feel. Uh, two, I'm obviously disappointed in KDPS, but at this point, what's new? Um, what I'm really calling to say is to Mayor Anderson, um, 
we spent five hours in the streets to get your attention. And after one hour of a meeting addressing our concerns, you started to get antsy. We were outside until one o'clock in the morning. We were out there for five hours just to get your attention. You also thanked everyone for being there um, after staying up until, you know, so late in the morning, blah, blah, blah. We were up late as well. So that's not anything special from your gut, from you guys. I think that was a kind of ridiculous um, to start to get antsy after one hour when honestly you should be willing to be there all night answering our questions and concerns because you work for the city of Kalamazoo and you work for the residents and that's us and you should be willing to hear us out no matter how long it takes. Um, actions speak louder than words and your actions have been speaking real loud. So please get it together. Hi, my name is Joel Booter. I live within the Kalamazoo city limits off of Southwest Najafka. I am calling to vocalize my complete disappointment with our Kalamazoo mayor and our Kalamazoo Police Department. And in reference to the Kalamazoo Police Department, I think it's a complete disgrace that they allowed the Proud Boys, for one, just to have a rally without any permits in our city. And then two, to not protect us from a group that is known to be violent and racist. And it is time that Kalamazoo starts to listen to the Black Lives Matter demands and actually follow through and defund the police and reallocate those funds to the communities that need them most and to social workers that can actually handle issues unlike our police officers. And it's, you're, it, our Kalamazoo is a disgrace to the country and anybody working within it and not trying to make it better should be disgraced of themselves. Goodbye. Hello, my name is Andrew Gray. I'm a resident of downtown Kalamazoo and I'm a medical student at Western Michigan University School of Medicine. Uh, on Saturday, I was um, at, in attendance as a counter protester at the Proud Boys rally in downtown Kalamazoo. And I'm calling today because I want to talk about the inaction that I witnessed by the police. And uh, I want to talk about the actions of the Proud Boys that I witnessed on Saturday. So around 2.15 p.m. on Saturday, while the Proud Boys were exiting from the west exit of the Radisson parking garage, uh, the counter protesters and I noticed that uh, probably over 50% of the cars that they were driving out of the garage had their license plates removed. And uh, myself and others were recording this and uh, uh, pleading with the police nearby with an earshot and invisible in the area to do something about it, but nothing was done. And yesterday I watched the um, press conference with um, the chief of police, Carrie Ann Thomas, and she explained this inaction by stating that traffic enforcement was not the priority. Um, so I, I'm really questioning whether um, anyone in Kalamazoo is actually worried about traffic enforcement. All right, um, I wanna share a story um, of a black man, a six-year-old black man named Julian Edward Roosevelt Lewis, who was uh, recently murdered in Georgia after a uh, white state police officer named Jacob G. Thompson stopped him and uh, it was for a broken taillight and that man uh, was shot with both of his hands on the steering wheel and that police officer is now facing felony murder charges. Um, so clearly, you know, this was never about traffic enforcement and uh, like I said, I don't think anyone in Kalamazoo was actually worried about traffic enforcement against the Proud Boys. I think we are worried that these men uh, who came to beat up homeless people in our city and antagonize, you know, minorities um, here and spread their hate uh, were allowed to be anonymous and leave our city. Um, and I, so I was recording their cars as they were leaving. And um, that's when Samuel Robinson, uh, the, pro, the, the reporter for MLive, was arrested about 20 feet away from me um, for allegedly impeding traffic. Um, and so I want to state that I'm a white man and Sam is a black man. And I think we shouldn't forget that. Um, I never had to worry about being arrested um, by, by local police, but Sam did clearly. Um, and so that's why so many of us who support Black Lives Matter are now calling for defunding the police. Um, I, I think the community policed itself on Saturday more than the actual police did. And there are a hundred plus officers from five jurisdictions, which is what Chief Thomas said. Um, that we spent among them um, had just been directed toward giving the homeless people homes and 
providing them security and safety so they don't have to worry about the Proud Boys or any bigots threatening them and uh, beating them up again. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is Matt. Um, I live in Chicago, but I would like to let my frustration be known that the KDBS stood idly by uh, while Proud Boys started violence in Kalamazoo and arrested journalists and tear gas counter protesters. Thank you. My name is Adrian Wiltzer. I do not live in the city of Kalamazoo, but I work in the city of Kalamazoo. I am concerned that the ordinance proposed by Vice Mayor Patrice Griffin will be against the current ruling for the disparate impact in the section dealing with criminal record and that criminal record should not be a protected class. If it is a protected class, we will be unable to choose which criminal acts or convictions would be against our policy and which ones we are willing to allow. As it stands currently, there is a law for a no blanket policy. That is all that is necessary. Thank you. Hi, my name is Khadijah Brown and I live in Kalamazoo. I'm calling to support the Housing Equity Ordinance Chapter 18 to ensure that historical marginalized communities, black communities, can have equitable and sustainable homes to live and raise families in. I'm also calling to hold all leaders accountable from Mayor Anderson, City Manager Jim Ritzma, Chief of Police Karen Thompson, and Assistant Chief Vernon Coakley, and countless others who uphold the racially historical approach in supporting black and brown communities. Your silence, and action, your silence and actionable solutions have caused our communities to be traumatized constantly with your lack of urgency to care about our basic human rights to survive. We are not pleased and not satisfied with your performative justice and care. Also drop charges on Trevor Jackson, Trevor Jackson and the minor immediately and have a great day. Again, my name is Khadijah Brown and I live in Kalamazoo. Good evening. My name is Tammy Ray and I reside within the city. I'm calling in to voice my support for the housing equity ordinance. As housing is a human right and everyone should have access to it, regardless of their past mistakes, I ask that the city commissioners join me and the many others that support this ordinance. Thank you for your time. My name is Victoria. I'm a resident of Kalamazoo. Uh, first, I'd like to state my support for the housing equity ordinance, uh, an ordinance that I hope will be the beginning of lasting change to the numerous city systems that uphold systemic racism and poverty in our community. Um, thank you for the folks who have done this work. Um, the main reason for my call is related, actually, as we witnessed a horrific display of racism, bias, and ineptitude from KDPS and our city officials on Saturday and Sunday of this weekend. Uh, I had extremely low expectations leading up to what we knew was going to be a, a, a hate rally from violent extremists. Um, and yet I'm still left disappointed and confused at uh, our city and public safety response. Um, I saw and heard a lot of awful things this weekend. And even among witnessing literal fascists attacking my community members, uh, one of the worst was hearing our chief of public safety's reaction. Uh, I heard I heard her say a lot of really confusing things yesterday, actually, uh, but I heard her say that she chose to wait until after a hate group attacked a permitted peace vigil to deploy her officers because she wanted to protect her public safety officers instead of civilians at a peace vigil. Um, I have a lot of things that I want to say, honestly, but I'm positive that my neighbors are going to co cover it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for being uh, being here. Um, Mary Anderson, City Manager Ritzma, and Chief Thomas, you've endangered and traumatized our community, and uh, you should resign. Some of the rest of y'all up there uh, need to kick it up more than a few notches as well. This is Shona Espinoza. I live in the city district and I'm 
me to understand how the Proud Boys were allowed to come to Kalamazoo and do the violent things that they did. And David Anderson and our city manager and our uh, chief was okay with KDPS attacking Kalamazoo citizens and not arresting the Proud Boys for being violent. This is not okay. And in the meeting that you had yesterday, you basically try to rush through and not answer and seem like you didn't even want to be there. So you're the mayor. So you're supposed to protect us and not put us in harm's way. Once again, you put us in harm's way and allow the police to attack their own citizens. So you need to be held accountable and should resign and let somebody else actually do the job that you're not willing to do. My name is Monique Haley. I live in the city limits of Kalamazoo, and I support the housing ordinance and think it should be passed immediately. Good evening, city commissioners. This is Toby Hannah Davies, and I do live in the city. Two topics. Regarding the human, I'm sorry, housing equity ordinance, don't you think that the Civil Rights Board would be much more trusted and respected if the decision-making power were the, from the City Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Dorla Bonner, instead of all by white men. Second, I want you to know I witnessed the neo-fascists marching towards Arcadia Festival Creek with their big flags and huge Trump banner chanting four more years, four more years. I was part of the prayer vigil to say no to hate and I had a front row view. At the beginning, the police were very cool identifiable and accessible until the neo-fascists and the resistors who came to physically fight them started knocking each other down. But then the police were faced with physical violence by the fascists who mostly or all came from out of town and by the resistors who mostly or also all came from out of town. It was not until then that more police showed up in riot gear looking like Darth Vader. Each of us there on Saturday had a different vantage point and saw different things depending on whether we were on Water Street or Rose Street as the fascists changed their course. So you need to know the different perspectives could all be true. Personally, I was very distressed that the first arrest I saw was of a young black man held down by multiple white officers when there were quite a few young white men who were also swinging at the neo-fascists. But I also have a lot of sympathy for the police having to deal with such a violent brawl. Thank you. Yes, my name is Sarah Cormier. Um, I've been a resident of Kalamazoo for the last five years. I live on the south side of Kalamazoo. Um, I have three children, all school age. And my public comment is directed at the events that took place in downtown Kalamazoo on Saturday. Um, I'm absolutely disgusted um, at the innate bias and hypocrisy that was demonstrated by the Kalamazoo police um, during this uh, event, this march. Um, you guys knew that this alt-right group was coming to entice violence and to waste, uh, waste public resources. Um, you rolled the red carpet out for them. Uh, meanwhile, we have so many people who live here who are actually fighting for positive change in the community, um, people who um, are discriminated against and yet still put their best peaceful foot forward to create change. Um, I would like to say that the police need to be defunded 
There needs to be reform. They need to be trained properly. Um, you guys arrested the wrong people on Saturday. You really did. And it was absolutely disgusting to watch as a citizen of this city. Um, I really, really hope that you will do better in the future. Um, the privilege of, of maintaining the status quo um, is something that should not be ignored. The Proud Boys did not have, um, they did not have a mission other than to maintain the status quo. And it was disgusting to see the police um, support them, give them so much support. That is my public comment. My name is Megan Munn and I live in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, I'm calling because I'm extremely disappointed and disgusted and I'm just mad about how the Kalamazoo Police Department and the police chief, Carrie Ann Thomas, have been handling basically everything. I feel like the police were very aware that a white supremacist group was coming in to march in our city and they were present and then the police disappeared. All the information I'm seeing is that the police were not present for this group to march downtown, but as they were leaving, the police then showed up and were arresting counter protesters, but no members of the Proud Boys, a white supremacist group that came into the city were arrested. Um, I feel like um, the whole Kalamazoo Police Department is showing that they're okay with white supremacy and that is what we allow in this city. And we do not care about the uh, Black Lives Matter protesters because we can go ahead and just tear gas them as they peacefully lay down in the street. I'm not understanding what the direction we're trying to take is here. I don't understand how uh, Carrie Ann Thomas is able to just apologize for things like arresting an M Live reporter and just say, oh, sorry, that was a mistake. Um, it was a big mistake. He's a young black man and he was arrested and not one single person who came into the city to incite violence from a white supremacist group was arrested. I'm, I don't understand what direction the police department is taking here. I don't get it. Hello, my name is Cody Sharp. I do not live in the city of Kalamazoo. However, I did want to comment uh, about transparency with the KDPS. Um, Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety, as well as many other police agencies in the county, all of their police traffic is encrypted where the public and the media cannot listen in. And with, with how things have been going, I feel like the regular dispatch frequencies should be made where the public can hear, especially the media can hear. Um, with accountability, um, the media is to is partly to keep the um, government accountable, and if they can't listen in, they can't do their job. So I just, fit, you know, hope that the city commission would consider. Um, pushing through an amendment or something where KDPS makes their dispatch where the media can, can listen in. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maddie Jordan Woods. I live at 902 West Patterson in the city of Kalamazoo. I am calling and making my comments again. I have residents coming up to me in the stores, coming to the office and saying that the North side neighborhood is being held hostage. We are asking, we are, um, I am not gonna say bag. I am gonna ask our commission to instruct our city attorney to come up with an ordinance that is going to hold people accountable. We are talking about having fair housing. What about the people who are living in their homes who feel that they can't even go to sleep at night? So I am going to ask again. At times for constantly having meetings and talking and talking and talking, we need our, the city attorney 
to come up with an ordinance that is going to hold them accountable. We need the commissioners to talk with the county sheriff to say, why is it that the officers are doing their jobs and, and people are being released? So it makes the neighborhood think that public safety isn't trying to help them. Thank you very much. Bye. Hello, my name is Corselia Green, and I live in the city limits of Kalamazoo, Michigan. In regards to tonight's agenda, um, what I want to know is what is the city um, Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety doing to um, protect citizens um, of this city from something else like this happening? Uh, why was the Proud Boys allowed to come into the city and rally such um, a negative rally, although it was um, peaceful, as they say. It was um, hateful. They're a terrorist group, and it was um, negative things towards um, the community and others. And so what are we doing to protect our citizens and the community from this happening again? Hi, my name is Lisa Brenner. I live within the city limits on Montrose Avenue. Um, I am calling uh, regarding just the general comments regarding the Proud Boys who came to town. Um, I just listened to the Kalamazoo mayor speak about how they had not been invited, um, ultimately kind of offering some apologies for what happened on Saturday, although I didn't necessarily hear the apology. Um, but I would like to kind of piggyback off that and ask him to explain if we're going to be talking about the First Amendment and the the right to assemble. There are glaring differences between the Black Lives Matter community um, and protests and these white supremacists that came to town. Um, so I would really like to hear more about that um, and why that was the reaction that we give to the white supremacists, yet not to those who are protecting the civil rights of our neighbors. Hi, I'm Katie Kammer, a resident here in the city of Kalamazoo, and I'm calling today to share my thoughts on many of the issues we have to fix immediately here in Kalamazoo. First of all, I'd like to publicly shame Chief of Police, Carrie Ann Thomas, for the poor excuse of an apology offered yesterday to M Live Samuel Robinson during the press conference. An apology without meaning and changed behavior is useless, as we have seen time and time again from not only KDPS, but city management as well, with the exception of Commissioners Griffin and Cunningham. The apology delivered was read directly off of a piece of paper with no heart behind it. If you know anything about Kalamazoo, it should be that we will not stand for this gaslighting you call an apology and that apologies need to mean something because we won't stop calling until they do. Also, in relation to KDPS and the police chief, the lack of answers on Saturday night was embarrassing. Members from Uplift, Kalamazoo, and other locals peacefully protested for five plus hours in multiple locations in order to even get a press conference. Kalamazoo makes national news and it takes 30 or so people over five hours to get a response from our officials. That's unacceptable. The city even made an announcement that they were planning to protect our citizens on Saturday, but instead our most vulnerable, those without homes in Kalamazoo, were allowed to be harassed and even assaulted by members of the Proud Boys and the other alt-right groups that they brought with them. I seriously beg everyone to watch as many videos as possible on the event. The evidence has shown that the outside agitators were the ones starting violence. The effect that is that that not should not have even mattered anyway, but the police are here to protect and serve the citizens that they swore to. But in today's political climate, the uh, Western chauvinists and self-proclaimed Nazis were allowed to march in the streets of Kalamazoo without interruption. When the Proud Boys finished, then the police came out. As more and more video is posted to social media, it is clear that the lack of police presence until after the Proud Boys left feels like a slap in the face to the residents of Kalamazoo who were actually protecting the community. There is no such thing as coincidence, and the truth will be told. All of the charges brought to the individuals in both Kalamazoo City and County need to be dropped immediately. I'm also calling in support of the housing ordinance. Everyone deserves a safe and affordable home to live in. This is one of many steps we can take to get there. 
thank you to those of the those of you that are doing the work, white people. We just need to do better. Yes, my name is Pastor Jeffrey Townsend, and I stay at two two one six Clark Avenue. And this comment is concerning the protesting that took place on Saturday. I was one of the persons that was there at the protest, and I found that the police department did a fantastic job of responding to the incident and to um, the protesters who were there on both sides. I think they did a fantastic job. Uh, I have that on film, uh, how they responded and also the assistant chief did a fantastic job in answering questions to some of the protesters who were asking him some questions. Why didn't they respond early? Uh, he did a fantastic job of, of answering the questions. And if you would like to uh, talk with me, my number is 269-303-1211. I will be glad to give that information to the city commission commissioners because I was one of the persons who was there on the scene, and what I heard on the news was not exactly what took place. Um, they did a fantastic job in responding, and I'd just like to leave that message with you. My name is Jeffrey Townsend. My number is 269-303-1211. My address is 2216 Clark Avenue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marissa Clee Paragon, and I'm a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. I've called into several city and county commission meetings in the past few months, and each time before now, I provided statistics, synthesized research, and made clear and precise asks. I guess I took this approach because I wanted to believe that my elected officials would listen to facts and act in the best interest of their constituents. But I don't know if I can believe that at this point. I'm too dumbfounded by KDTS's actions on Saturday and the lack of accountability evident at yesterday's press conference press conference. I've read many firsthand accounts of what happened on Saturday, although I was unable to be there myself, and they all paint a picture of a police force that didn't just fail to protect the community it supposedly served, but actively harmed that community while protecting violent white supremacists. I don't understand how any member of our city's government can continue to claim that the police force protects and serves our community. Not when, time after time, we have seen them harm us. And of course, much of that harm has been done to Kalamazoo's black community in particular. I am disgusted and disappointed, but not surprised, by KDPS's violence and by the city's lack of appropriate response. The police don't prevent violence. They enact it. The only way to reduce violence in our city is to reduce and ultimately eliminate the police force while investing in our communities. We must begin systematic divestment of public dollars away from police budgets in the next fiscal year and in each year thereafter until policing budgets reach zero and funnel all of that money into meeting the express needs of communities most impacted by police violence and systemic racism. If you're not advocating for decreased, for decreasing policing budgets, if you're not seriously questioning whether our current police chief is capable of or willing to reduce the harm and trauma that her police force causes, then at this point, I have to believe that you want the police force to harm and oppress the residents of Kalamazoo. I hope you'll prove me wrong. Thank you. Hello, my name is Andrew Gray. I am a resident of downtown Kalamazoo. Um, I'd like to make a comment on behalf of a friend of mine who is also a resident of Kalamazoo um, and who I feel um, their voice needs to be heard. Um, it's in regards to the Proud Boys rally on Saturday in downtown Kalamazoo and uh, the action or rather the inaction of uh, Kalamazoo police. Um, so my friend is a member of the LGBT community um, and her partner is also a transgender member, um, obviously, of the LGBT community. Um, on Saturday, they decided that Kalamazoo was not safe um, because of the presence of the Proud Boys and um, because of who they are and who they love. Um, and so they decided to leave the city and go stay with uh, friends and family. Um, 
yesterday, again, they were posting on Facebook um, and asking us uh, who live here whether it was safe to return and um, if the Proud Boys were actually gone. And again, today, um, there's, they've still been uneasy about returning to the city to their home. Um, and so I, I think that there has been a failure by the city of Kalamazoo and by um, the, the police department to inform the public and let them know and reassure them that um, the city is actually safe and that the Proud Boys are gone and that, uh, you know, vol violence um, against these groups is not going to be tolerated anymore. Um, so I think that it really speaks to um, the lack of communication and um, the lack of confidence that the public has um, in um, KPDS. Thank you. My name is Katrina Davis. Charges need to be dropped on the minor. Charges need to be dropped on Trevor Jackson. Kalamazoo Public Police Department needs to be held accountable for their actions. Housing Equality Ordinance Chapter 18 and Chapter 18A. Hi, my name is Jill Mansky, and I am a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. As the news continues coming out about this weekend's events, and as the response from city leadership continues to be insufficient and in contradiction with evidence and testimony from multiple witnesses, I have continued to lose trust in the leadership of this city, including in the mayor, the city manager, and the chief of police. To be clear, my concerns are not about the First Amendment with regard to the Proud Boys. I am concerned that their violent actions were not addressed and were allowed to happen with impunity. On the other hand, I am concerned that the First Amendment rights of nonviolent protesters continue to be ignored by the same people in leadership who are lecturing us about its sanctity. How have the First Amendment rights been honored and protected for nonviolent protesters here over the past two months? How can we believe that this city adheres to the constitutional rights of everyone to participate in their right to free speech when they continue to respond with militarized violence and inappropriate arrests, including this past Saturday? The discrepancy is stark and very concerning. People marching violently under the guise of a white nationalist hate group were treated passively and permissively, while the counter-protesters and those who were protecting people from Proud Boy violence were treated as if they were criminals. The recent focus on hiring practices of KDPS is insufficient. We need to have policies that hold the police and our city administrators accountable. We need to redirect resources and funding away from violent and inequitable policing and invest it in resources that contribute to real public safety for all of our communities. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hadia and I am a constituent in Kalamazoo. And um, I'm calling to say that we're gonna need at least, at the very least, some accountability, some apologies, and some explanations um, for the events that occurred on Saturday when a white supremacist uh, group was allowed into our town, not only allowed, but protected and allowed to come in and spew their hate and attack people and then just be safely escorted out of a parking garage by uh, KDPS. Uh, we need an explanation for that. Um, and just some, some sort of accountability is absolutely necessary because that should have never happened. And I just need an answer. I need an answer from, from David Anderson because for him to come up and approach me in my neighborhood, uh, as if he, you know, has some sort of, any sort of concern for my life and my well-being and then to sit there idly and let Nazis into our community is unacceptable and I don't feel safe and we need answers. Hello, I'm re I'm calling regarding the events on Saturday in the city of Kalamazoo. As a Kalamazoo resident, I am wondering why we were not protected. Why were brown and black communities not protected from a known hate and racist group? Why were the Proud Boys protected over Kalamazoo residents? 
I have listened continuously to KDPS and city officials talk about how they want relations to be better within the community. But when they are consistently provided the opportunity to protect our community, and especially the black and brown communities, there is constant failure and missteps. We need for Kalamazoo County officials and KDPS to begin to align their words and their actions. Lives are at stake. Hello, my name is Alita Chase and I live within the city of Kalamazoo. The city of Kalamazoo and its officials must be held accountable for the racist and deplorable actions that are continuously committed by those in power. The actions taken this weekend made it horrifically clear that there will be no repercussions to people coming into our community with violence and force. Only our community members will be negatively impacted. And this is effectively inviting them back for more. If our city leadership cannot take action to prevent these types of attacks on our community, then we will need to replace our leadership with those that will. Thank you. My name is James Cavanaugh. I live in the city of Kalamazoo and do business in the city of Kalamazoo and employ people in the city of Kalamazoo. My comments pertain to the actions or lack thereof of the public safety department this past weekend pertaining to the Proud Boys. Um, I'm very, very disappointed in what I have heard from friends and what I have read in comments from friends and their friends that public safety essentially gave the red carpet to these out of town, sorry for the word, redneck, racist people that came in here and terrorized our city. One that should have never been allowed. They should have been escorted out of town when they assaulted the first person. And two, to prey upon, to terrorize our own citizens is flat out appalling. I'm embarrassed to say that I live in Kalamazoo right now. Something has to be done. We are better than this. We are better than this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bridget O'Toole, and I was born and raised in Kalamazoo, but I currently live in New York City. I've been closely following what went down with the protests last weekend, and I'm ashamed at the way my hometown's public safety stood by and protected a racist hate group like the Proud Boys. That is not the community I know and love, nor does it make me want to move back to Kalamazoo in any capacity if this is the kind of community you're fostering. Do what's right for the people of Kalamazoo and instead of protecting the racist hate groups coming to incite violence, hate, and intimidate the residents, think about protecting the people who actually live there. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Valerie Brooks. I'm a resident here in Kalamazoo and a landowner, and I'm just asking if you could please pass the ordinance. I support the housing ordinance, and if you could please pass that as soon as possible. Thank you and have a good day. My name is Wendy Denning. I am a resident of Kalamazoo speaking on the Human Rights Ordinance. For the record, I want to state that since I first heard about the HRO, my 72 moderate price rentals have been sold. I am now partially retired. As a result, the proposed HRO will have little effect on me personally. I am, however, continuing to fight because I believe the HRO as designed will be a colossal failure. With a $4,800,000 LHAF millage, Kalamazoo sits on the precipice of developing a revolutionary program to combat homelessness, something potentially as great as the Kalamazoo promise. But foolishly, you are about to let this incredible opportunity slip by. When drafting a set of rules and guidelines that will govern a specific business, isn't it logical and wise to include the input of leaders from that industry? This failure to let housing providers have input has left our concerns unmet. Yes, Grand Rapids has an HRO. Unlike ours, it is reasonable, workable, and it supports housing providers. 
This HRO has been drafted by a group of well-meaning people, some victims of homelessness themselves. It meets the needs of their perspective only. It is not just, it is not balanced. I mean no disrespect to the authors. My experience in housing the poor is vast and this plan will fail. Commissioner Knott, I wish you would share your knowledge of Vine Ventures and how it failed. What a waste. The concerns of us housing providers and our offers to help have been ignored. Where's the justice in that, commissioners? Is it not your responsibility to adopt rational, equitable laws that will be successful and contribute to the betterment of our beloved city? Kalamazoo has 3,000 homeless. This is not the fault of housing providers. Kalamazoo does not have enough low-income housing. How about you do something about that? Homelessness is not just a housing issue. It's a poverty issue, an education issue, an issue of bad parenting, stupid decision-making, criminal activity, and mental illness. It's one of the most grievous and complicated issues of modern society. Simply giving out LHAF money is not going to solve the underlying causes of homelessness. How can you possibly expect we housing providers can solve the problems of these misfortunate people? We are not social workers. To believe otherwise is naive. And most incredibly, you want us housing providers to help implement this ill-thought-out plan, yet you refuse to let us be a part? It's moronic, short-sighted, and unfair. It's impossible for me to mask my incredulity, disgust, and disgust. I've written letters to each of you, and only two of you have had the decency to respond. You call yourselves my representative. I helped elect you. In my opinion, if you vote for this HRO, it will be a dereliction of your civil... Hi, it's Vidal Wilder again on Southside Kalamazoo. Um, this weekend, you have proven time and time again that you cannot and will not protect your own citizens. You value the First Amendment over the safety of your own people that have voted you in. Now, I, for one, am also a First Amendment absolutist, but when it comes to people coming into our streets, waving. My name is James Bergman. I am a citizen of Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm calling um, basically about my outrage and how, what, what has gone on in my city, um, police response to things, uh, the message that has been sent by how we reacted to the Proud Boys coming to our city. Um, they weren't the ones that were arrested. <laughs> they weren't the ones that should have even been here, in my opinion. It's a hate group that wasn't uh, given any consequences for their behavior so the message that they are given and the rest of the country watching our city is given is that the city of Kalamazoo supports this. If we aren't going to have any consequences or allow that to happen, that's just going to allow people to believe that Kalamazoo supports the Proud Boys. It's embarrassing to say that I am from Kalamazoo if this is how we treat hate groups coming to our town. That said, I'm not one that's wanting to support the police right now at all. It took them seven minutes to respond to the violence that was happening downtown. All I'm hearing is apologies and no actions. I, I know there's a stigma to being a police officer right now. People are saying all cops are bad. And it's hard not to think that. I, I just want to see some accountability. I want consequences to actions. It's not fair that a cop can kill people and have nothing but paid time off, paid administrative leave, and receive disability for PTSD for killing a person because that's what their training told them to do. We just want consequences and accountability. That's all. Thanks. Hello, my name is Kaylee McCraner, and I reside in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, I am calling in regards to um, the events that occurred on Saturday. Um, while I was not there, I did 
um, watched the live video um, that was posted by the gentleman um, from M Live, and I will say that um, he did show credentials. Um, he said it numerous times because they, you know, brought him to the ground to handcuff him and he was able to show them. So, I mean, the fact that you're blaming the victims of what occurred is, um, you know, very disheartening, um, you know, and especially knowing the fact that the Proud Boys came in um, to assault homeless people whom, you know, the, the mayor works for ISK. So he should be very aware of what causes someone to be homeless um, and why it is difficult, um, even with the resources that are in Kalamazoo, um, especially since one of the big resources is the Gospel Mission, which um, does... Um, discriminate based on gender and gender identity. Um, you know, they, they say that they don't and, um, you know, that's a whole other discussion. Um, I would also like to comment on, um, the, um, evictions and, um, you know, what the city is going to do. Um, you know, we already have a homeless problem. We really don't need to make it any worse. And, you know, the funding for mental health services is already being slashed. Um, so right now, one thing that we do not need to do is um, put more strain on a system that is already strained and is already not working the way that it should be. Um, that is all. Thank you and have a good night. Hello, uh, my name is Allie. I live in the city of Kalamazoo, and I'm calling to inquire about what concrete um, steps will be taken uh, as discipline for the police officers, the arresting officers who arrested um, the MLive reporter who was thrown to the ground while clearly stating that he was media. Um, I appreciate the apology from uh, Chief Thomas and Ritzma, but an apology truly changes nothing. Um, I'm asking that there be at the bare minimum something placed in their in their files or some concrete steps taken on a personnel level to address um, the the gross miscarriage um, of of public safety. Hey, this is Chris Wamha, 1407 Bryant Street, Kalamazoo, Michigan. I want to respond because people are going to say most of the things I feel about this. We respond to. Uh, Ritzman is saying that he didn't know about the National Lawyers Guild. Uh, I've organized events in Kalamazoo over the last decade, since 2010. As early as 2013, we've regularly had National Lawyers Guild here. He absolutely does know about them, and that was 100% a lie. Ritzma, Anderson, Chief Thomas, and her VP officer, they need to be taken away from city. They need to resign or they need to be recalled. They have no business running this city. The city treated its own homeless worse than it treated the Proud Boys. It treated Black Lives Matter worse than it's treated the Proud Boys. And it treats every kid in our poor neighborhoods like Northside and Edison worse than it treats them. It's garbage. They need to be recalled or forced to resign. Hello. My name is Zachary Lassiter. I live in the city of Kalamazoo. I have two things I'd like to comment on. First thing I'd like to comment on is uh, I received a $1,700 invoice from the city of Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety for the body camera video of the first round of protests in Kalamazoo where they deployed tear gas and pepper balls and basically went out of control. Um, I plan on paying that. However, in order to help the uh, city with its uh, um, chain shortage that's going on, I'm a, I am uh, planning on going down there this week and paying it all in pennies. So I look forward to that. Um, the second thing is, that's my way of basically, you know, you guys saying screw the citizens, I, I'm saying screw you. 
you know. So uh, the second thing is, since I'm done with you guys screwing the citizens, unless you guys, as a commission tonight, take substantial action to hold the Department of Public Safety accountable, as well as the city management accountable, I plan on taking a leave of absence from work and initiating recall petitions against each and every one of you. It's time, there's no more time for talk. I mean, people are being killed, people are being hurt. This weekend alone, out of the nine arrests that public safety claimed they had made, two were completely innocent individuals. One is Sam Robinson, the media reporter, and the other one was someone that's held 20 hours on felony charges before they figured out they arrested the wrong individual that wasn't wearing a shirt. So, I mean, when is this going to be enough? When are you going to hold public safety accountable? When are you going to hold the city management accountable? Because if you're not, I think we as citizens need to find someone who will. So if there's a small portion of you guys that are going to attempt to make hold the city management and KDPS accountable, good luck, because I have a feeling that's what might happen. And then we'll have the, you know, the majority that just don't care, you know, we'll just, you know, not care. And then I'll end up just, you know, doing recall, you know, petitions on those. But I've had enough. Other people have had enough. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a job to where I can take time off and do this. I'm lucky enough to have a job where I can afford $1,700 in pennies to get the information that we should have access to already. And I'm lucky enough to have a job to where... I <laughs> Hi, my name is May Lanting. I'm a resident within the city of Kalamazoo city limits, a graduate of Kalamazoo Central High School, and a current student at Kalamazoo College. I'm calling to address and demand action on three key issues. First, I wanted to voice my support for the housing equity ordinance on the table tonight. This ordinance is a step in the right direction in ending the legacy of racial housing discrimination in our city. Second, I wanted to join with other community members in demanding that the minor who was arrested on Saturday have their charges dropped and their arrest record cleared. Third, I wanted to speak directly to Mayor Anderson, Commissioner Knott, Commissioner Urban, Commissioner Hess, and Commissioner Pradle. I demand that you publicly and directly acknowledge that the actions of KDPS this weekend were inadequate, unjust, and actively working to protect white supremacy and the status quo. KDPS did not listen to community members and dismiss the Proud Boys as a legitimate threat. They failed to prevent them from assaulting and traumatizing our homeless community members. They decided to escalate violence towards counter-protesters while protecting and practically escorting the Proud Boys out of our city without arresting a single one. And as shown by the press conference yesterday, they continued to deny that these actions were wrong or a symptom of a larger problem of racism within that institution and within Kalamazoo city leadership. I demand that you stand with the Kalamazoo community. Stop using vague language that implies that armed white supremacists are on any sort of equal footing as the community members they are terrorizing and clearly and directly call out KDPS officers and KDPS leaders, especially Chief Thomas, when they attempt to justify wrongdoing deny the impact of racism on their decision-making, and spread misinformation in order to cover their tracks. The double standards are blatant. The trauma is deep, and the path forward is clear. Stand with the Kalamazoo community and cut down white supremacy every time in every single form that it takes. Thank you for your time. My name is Joanna. I live within the Kalamazoo city limits. And I just wanted to say, take the opportunity to say, that we are just hearing a lot of excuses and a lot of back and forth, a lot of back and forth as if this was a learning opportunity. This just seems very intentional. From the moment they arrested both of the people who were identifiable and put them in jail, that was no accident. This is a time to unlearn your bias. If the Kalamazoo Police Department wants to do better, really wants to do better, then they must unlearn their bias because not to get very political, but we know the political climate right now and we know where this is headed. Okay. So if they really want to address the issues and not anger us more, because this is where it is going to anger with the, all their excuses, then they must stand up and address their bias, address that on what side they were clearly on because that's the bottom line they showed us 
with their actions, what side they were on, who was arrested there, who was harassed there. Okay, they came in a threatening manner. They took off their plate. They were unidentified, blocking streets and traffic, and not, nobody was arrested. So please stop with the excuses. Stop with the excuses because we are done with these excuses. There is nothing more that needs to be said. Nothing to be learned except unlearned. Hi, my name is Caitlin, and I live in Kalamazoo County, but I am often downtown Kalamazoo. Um, and I wanted to say that I've been following this pretty closely. And I think um, one of the most important things that has been brought up is, again, that communication and who you're listening to to help organize this. Again, it should have been the Black community, the Black organizers, Uplift Kalamazoo, uh, community members that had experience with the KKK. I mean, that's who we should have been listening to, not the city manager who is a white man or Kellyanne who is a white woman. Um, I think that's really important. Um, also, that communication. Um, I think that it's really important that um, also uh, Ritzma had said something about, oh, the legal observer, we didn't know that they would be there. It shouldn't matter if you know that they're going to be there or not. It's, it, it's, are you going to be on your best behavior if they are there? The whole point of it is that they're there to see what's happening is legal or not. And the police should be able to identify who they are. Uh, they should have training in identifying legal observers. Same with the, the press. I mean, that could have taken two seconds. His badge is to the side. Great. So let's ask him, hey, can you show us your badge around the side of you? Solved in three seconds. The police could have done that. Instead, they booked him. And they took him all the way to the, the police jail and booked him. That's crazy. That's a major communication issue. Um, I did not feel like it was very well organized. I think that's pathetic knowing how violent an organization this is. Um, also, um, I just heard that a lot of comments were about um, just how when we were protesting against police brutality, it was really organized. There were snipers on the top two and I, I, I was scared. I was scared because of the police presence. And then now the police just disappear. When it, there's a white supremacist group, it just seemed like the police were supporting the, the white supremacists. So also, I, I think that Kellyanne should have been here for this conversation. She might have a legitimate reason for not being here, but it just seems inconsiderate. Uh, seeing that the gravity of the situation. Um, also, I just want people to be held accountable for this. I want the prosecutor to be held accountable for uh, the Proud Boys doing warrants. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm just upset with this as someone who lives in this community and we can do better, but we need to take it seriously. And I don't feel like all of the commissioners or the city managers are from this. Hello, my name is Low Timbro. I live um, in downtown Kalamazoo, um, calling in regards to the KDPS response to um, the Proud Boys uh, entering Kalamazoo and the uh, arrest of counter protesters and Lime reporter uh, and a legal observer uh, during the events that happened on Saturday. Um, I'm concerned with. Um, uh, Jim Ritzema saying that there was a plan in advance, but choosing not to um, engage community members um, uh, and display plans appropriate, appropriately and have open lines of communication with the community in terms of what those plans uh, would be. Um, I'm also uh, concerned with why um, steps weren't taken uh, to uh, confront the Proud Boys who had license plates removed from vehicles. Um, although charges were dropped for Samuel Robinson and some of the others that were arrested, um, I'm concerned with why a reporter who clearly stated um, he was a member of the media um, was a, uh, arrested and, um, and also why the legal observer was unable to be identified as a legal observer and why uh, they were also arrested. Um, hopefully steps can be made to prevent future arrests of uh, media and observers, as well as um, taking steps to uh, 
appropriately uh, drop charges when relevant. And I also am concerned with why up of Kalamazoo and um, similar partners had to protest for around five hours just to get a response from the city um, and an agreement to um, a, you know, press release. Um, and also um, would like to agree with um, Commissioner Cunningham's statements uh, in the meeting that this is a good opportunity for an outside review to come in um, and take a look at KDPS actions, both uh, with the June Black Lives Matter protests and um, with what happened with the Proud Boys entering Kalamazoo. Um, again, I do not agree um, that the KDPS did uh, the best job they could in protecting the city, and I understand that Proud Boys should be allowed with their first. I agree Proud Boys have the first amendment right to come here, but I uh, disagree that KDPS didn't take the steps needed when violence ensued and when they came in um, pepper spraying um, citizens and with uh, unlicensed vehicles. Hi, my name is Quincy and I live in the city limits of Kalamazoo. And I wanted to say that I think y'all need to fire Jim Ritzma. Every time that he fails to do his job, he comes to these commission meetings and he says that he didn't know any better and that he's still learning. And Jim Ritzma has been the city manager since 2013, which is seven years. And I struggle to believe that he's still learning how to do the basic functions of his job. And I'm all for a growth mindset and I recognize that learning is a continual process, but the mistakes that Jim makes over and over again because of his ineptitude leads directly to harm in our community and leads to traumatization of people in our community. Um, when people's lives and safety are at stake, he needs to be held to a way, way, way higher standard than you guys have been holding him to. You have the power and the responsibility to remove him from this position so that he can stop harming our community. And I think that you guys should do this and find the right person for the job and stop accepting Jim Ritzma's excuses and just fire him already. Jesus. My name is Stephanie Escobedo, and I am a resident of, Cal of the city of Kalamazoo. Um, I'm calling to demand that Jim Ritzma be fired or hand in his reg resignation. He is incompetent, and he is. there's no more time to learn. There's been too many opportunities for learning and too many mistakes made at this point, and enough is enough. Hello, my name is Anonymous, and I am a tax-paying citizen. I have a question for all of y'all. How did you find the Proud Boys coming to Kalamazoo? Hello, this is your president, Donald J. Trump. I just want to say I support Carrie Ann Thomas bigly. She is a very fine person and supports law and order and is a very, very fine person. And we all love her in the White House. Bigly much. Hi, my name is Bailey Wagner. Um, I live in Kalamazoo Township. Um, I grew up in Kalamazoo City my entire life. Um, I wanted to call and just state that I have a big issue with how things were handled this weekend. I take issue that in June, the National Guard was brought in for peaceful protesters. And that then there wasn't a visible presence this past weekend when the violent Proud Boys came to our city. There was full knowledge that they were coming. They announced that they were coming. And yet, there is no need to call in the National Guard because these are white men with assault rifles. I'm also extremely disappointed by the lack of holding the Proud Boys accountable while continuing to harass our Kalamazoo citizens with pepper spray and arrest. There is a double standard here, and it is a racist one. I am not impressed with Chief Thomas and her work here in Kalamazoo. And I think she should be held accountable for this performance. On another note, I support the housing equity ordinance 
and appreciate the work that Vice Mayor Griffin has worked on for this. Um, we need this in Kalamazoo. We have a homeless problem. And due to the COVID crisis, that's only getting worse. So I fully support this and hope that it passes. Thank you for your time. Hello, uh, my name is Catherine Haley, and I live within the city of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, I'm just calling to um, say that I support the housing ordinance and that I really feel it needs to be passed immediately because there's a lot of people that are without uh homes and I just want them to have a fair chance to get an opportunity to be able to be housed properly, especially those with children. Hi, my name is Dustin McLean and I do live within the city of Kalamazoo. There have been a couple attacks on Mr. Dannison during this call. Um, I'd like to ask specifically commissioner not, where were you a month ago when Nathan was saying that these people are coming here and saying we need to do something and where would you have been if no one else had been there like Nathan had gotten people to be there and the Proud Boys came in and started attacking homeless people what would have happened to those homeless people if no one would have been around and the mess that did happen hadn't happened I think some people may have died so I think you should think about that before you comment on other people that are taking action thank you Bye. Uh, hello, my name is Mike Savina. I'm a resident of the city of Kalamazoo. Uh, just calling to address some of the comments made earlier um, uh, regarding the uh, police tactics used by used during Proud Boys violence, as has already been reported by WZZM 13. Um, and just calling attention to the unlawful assembly. Um, the clear obstruction or removal of license plates as the Proud Boys left uh, parking structure. Um, you know, the Chief Thomas said that um, they were notified they were on private property and asked to disperse, yet in that moment, no one was said, you know, there was no time set aside to uh, take statements or names from any of the people who had like willingly at that point committed crimes, regardless of how it's perceived that the violence started. Um, there were a number of clear violations that could have happened once you saw those actions rather than the ideology. Uh, and with a hundred officers deployed downtown to restore order, there was no one then to monitor communities where a registered hate group might disperse into. Uh, so there are just some really, really glaring uh, in just really terrible, terrible abdication of duty that, that was shown by KDPS uh, in response to this event, uh, regardless of how you want to talk about it, there's just some, you know, once the evidence was made clear, the actions of the police didn't serve to protect the Kalamazoo community. Um, and there were, there were other people, citizens, who had to be on high alert within their own neighborhoods because there was very little police presence there at that time. There were 100 officers deployed downtown to create a police zone. Uh, those are just, I'm just really, really upset. And I also wanted to talk about graphic packaging, but I don't feel like I have enough time. Um, so hopefully the long-term health effects of the residents are taken into account uh, with, with this project uh, as well as, as anything moving forward. Okay. Uh. Hi, my name is Rebecca McCleary, and um, I live in the city of Kalamazoo. I also own a business in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, and I, I guess I have three things that I want to say. Um, first, I want to thank you. Um, I applied for funding through the Small Business Development Fund um, last last winter, and I, it was approved, and I received the funding um, in July, and I was concerned that I wouldn't because of the pandemic, um, but I want to 
you know, I, I want to give a big shout out to Antonio Mitchell and uh, Miss Dorla Bonner, who were both incredible. They are treasures in our city, um, and and I just want to lift them up as such. Um, and thank you all for your your support um, of small businesses. Secondly, um, I'm also an uh, executive director of Center for Transformation. We are a small nonprofit here in Kalamazoo, and we work with returning citizens. So I wanted to call in support of the Housing Equity Ordinance. Um, We have had a significant increase um, in people being paroled back to Kalamazoo uh, because of COVID. And I know housing is always... um, an issue and discrimination in housing has always been an issue, Um, but we have more and more people returning to our community who are impacted by um, their their past um, criminal records. And um, I think, uh, you know, this is the very most basic thing that we can do to help make sure that they have a chance um, as they're coming back to our community, that they have a chance uh, for for equitable and um, dignified housing. Um, the third thing that I wanted to mention is how disappointed I am in the handling of uh, the Proud Boys event this past weekend. Um, you know, we have 78 days until November 3rd, uh, probably 77 days by the time you listen to this message. And um, it's a really a concern. We are looking at a country that is on the, the brink, potentially, of civil war, um, and the fascists and racists will be either emboldened after we learn of our results on November 3rd, or they're going to be really angry. And I am very concerned about violence. And we had um, the Proud Boys came into town this weekend who announced themselves as such. They announced themselves as a violent hate group um, and paraded around as such with their little American flag. And and Chief Thomas couldn't handle that. How is she going to handle things in November? She needs to resign. Thank you. Hi, my name is Drew, and I am a business owner in downtown Kalamazoo and a resident of downtown Kalamazoo. And, you know, I have supported Kalamazoo, and I have loved living here for 10 years, and I have never been so embarrassed as I have been this past weekend. When I have my staff calling me to tell me that they are they feel unsafe being in this city, and I have to close my business early on a Saturday after, you know, being closed for three months during a pandemic. Um, And then just to look out my window and watch just a bunch of hateful people running around downtown Kalamazoo, I don't feel safe. They don't feel safe. And this is the first time where I've truly been embarrassed of my community and not my community necessarily, but of Anderson and Thomas and the way that they've treated this whole Proud Boy rally and letting people into our town that are visibly like hateful. I mean, when we're seeing in the news two days prior to the rally that a hate rally is coming to Kalamazoo and there is no response, that to me is shocking. And then also to watch the amount of snipers and the amount of cops that have been out during the Black Lives Matters protests which were far more peaceful, and then to not see anything here to protect the citizens of Kalamazoo, I am ashamed for you, Anderson, and I am ashamed that you are the mayor of our city, and that's all I have to say. My name is Adam Dennis, and I live within the city limits. I was arrested by KDPS on Saturday outside the Radisson parking ramp. I'll keep this short because the full thrust of my experience was far too drawn out and complicated to jam into the time allotted. My experience gave me no other impression than that the police were on hand waiting for the moment that most of the Proud Boys were out of the way so that they could make a show of force to our citizens. And I feel that the pretense for my arrest was fabricated on site so that I could be used as a proper intimidation against my neighbors. It is a truly sickening feeling. I would like to second the request made by Commissioner Cunningham for for City Manager Ritzma to insist on an independent rather than internal investigation of KDPS officers' conduct. 
the assertion that it was never feasible or lawful for the police to take action against the aggressions of the Proud Boys is demonstrably false. They had corralled themselves into a parking structure after violence had ensued. KDPS knew that there were multiple persons of interest in that parking structure, where a lot of them could have been at least asked for statements. But no, the armored police stayed behind their barricade at Rose and Water until the Proud Boys made their exit before marching on a crowd that was about to disperse naturally. This was strong arming, plain and simple, and you should all reflect on the loss of general confidence that I and my neighbors are feeling right now. Thank you for your time. Hi, this is Jeremy Herman. Uh, I live within Kalamazoo Township, but just as much as the what happens in the city affects the township as well. And during tonight's meeting, what I heard the phrase was apologize and move on. Um, the energy that was put into arresting local Kalamazoo residents not only affects the city of the Kalamazoo, but it affects the surrounding areas and it affects quite honestly, the township, the city of Portage, and you are setting an example for how the rest of the cities and townships can treat people. A statement that I had with a colleague at one point in time was that the, the funding of Kalamazoo department of public safety was needed to protect us from outside racists. That was the argument that was used. Well, clearly Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety and the city have failed um, to do those things to protect us and have ended up arresting many of our own residents. And uh, you, you really let everybody else down. And that is extremely upsetting and unfortunate. And also we should be ashamed of the phrase apologize and move on because until you hold somebody actually accountable, your apologies are empty to the rest of us and the surrounding Kalamazoo County area. That's all I have to say. My name is Jane and I'm a constituent from the Vine neighborhood. I'm calling to voice my extreme disappointment with KDPS and the city manager's reaction to the Proud Boys rally on August 15th. The city's actions gave the Proud Boys confirmation that they can come into our community, instigate violence, and then leave unscathed and emboldened with police arresting counter-protesters while waving them out to safety. The city's action also gave its residents confirmation that we are not adequately protected. With regards to comments made by City Manager Ritzma and Police Chief Thomas and their suggestion that they sit down with members of the community to learn from this experience, it's not the responsibility of a 20-year-old cub reporter to help you understand how not to unnecessarily arrest the press. The black and brown citizens of Kalamazoo deserve better than to be considered a learning experience for a police department that has already repeatedly failed to protect them. Within the last three months, KDPS tear-gassed its own populace, allowed homeless men to be attacked by fascists and shoved down and arrested by park members of the press. The city's trust in its police and its leadership has been shaken. We need to know what concrete steps you will take to change policing in the city, or we need new leadership and defunding of KDPS with reassignment of funding to agencies that can protect our citizens. The time for talking is over. We need to know what you're going to do to change. Thank you. My name is Rain. I live in the city of Calvin's. Calling in regards to the events of Saturday afternoon. I, I I'm kind of done with Kalamazoo. Like as a city, the leadership has disappointed me consistently since I've lived here. Y'all fought us on the Ianelli fountain until it became impractical for you to do so. This is the second time this summer that the police have used violence against the citizens of Kalamazoo in defense of white supremacy. This is the second time this summer that this has happened and gotten our city national attention. I've been all over the news and 
I keep seeing the Radisson in the background of GIFs talking about white supremacist rallies in Michigan and Portland. And I'm watching the comments and I'm just like, that's my city. The police escorting the Nazis out after they tried to lynch our homeless. I'm disgusted. The entire police force is complicit. Anyone who hasn't retired because of what they've had to do, I I don't understand how you consider yourself a human being with a soul at this point. The entire police force needs to be terminated, honestly. And from my standpoint, their jobs or yours. Hello, my name is Austin and I am a resident of Kalamazoo City. I am calling to speak directly to Mayor Anderson. Um, I'm not sure if you are aware or not yet, but there is a major recall effort on the way to remove you from office. It's clear over the last few months and with the major things happening in our city that you're unable to lead, whether it is from just being unwilling to do so at the most basic levels of conducting a press conference or just outright, um, you know, refusing to to take the reins and do anything about what's going on. Um, I commend Vice Mayor Griffin, who is clearly more well suited to lead this conversation that Kalamazoo is clearly, clearly in the need of having. Um, so I just ask Mayor Anderson to please do everyone in the city a favor and allow us to get on to the healing portion of this conversation step down and allow people better suited to take the reins to do so. Um, I know you mean well, but at the end of the day, um, what's best for our city is to have some new leadership up there. I appreciate everybody tonight. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello. Good evening, city commissioners, honorable city commissioners, honorable mayor, honorable vice mayor, honorable city attorney, honorable uh, citizens, I don't know, <laughs> and the uh, city manager. Hello, good evening. Um, I have been inquiring for several months, um, I think since last year, I think it's been since last year, several times, how to hold a protest. Um, I had informed the city police that I wanted to hold this protest and I was informed that if I did, I would be arrested and I was concerned about that. So I inquired more and you have to apply for a permit. So then I went to the clerk's office and asked about getting a permit and I was told to go across the hall. And then they said that I should go back to the clerks, so I went to the clerks. They said I should go to the city manager. City manager said I should go to the parks department. Parks department said no, sent me back to the city manager's office. Went back to the city manager's office. I was told they would get back to me. Nothing, not getting back to me. Um, the thing, the reason why I want to hold the protest, I have been told probably about a dozen times that they're going to set up a meeting with Jim Ritzma and myself never happened. Um, I don't plan on it happening. I don't believe it'll ever happen. That's okay. Um, so I hear David Anderson. I hear Clyde Robinson. I hear a lot of people saying you have a First Amendment right. But when I informed the police that I plan on having this protest, that I'm going to be arrested, and I believe them 100%. I definitely believe them. And I'm just wondering, is there an appropriate way for me to communicate that I would like to hold a protest, or should I just apply for a permit for Arcadia Park to hold a prayer vigil and then invite my friends with guns, or and then just not mention that to you? I know Aaron brought that up in the meeting tonight. Um, and then should I use, should I say it's a prayer vigil and then sit on the police um, board as a prominent pastor in the city and then do whatever I want, 
not at all communicating what I'm doing and then use inciting language. I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed. I mayor, that, I'm sorry, okay, mayor, hey, that, that was the final caller, Mayor. Uh, thank you so much, Deputy City Manager, everyone that helped you manage all those comments. Thank you, everyone that uh, called in, took time to leave a comment tonight. So now we are at the time in the meeting when I am going to suggest that we, uh, since it's 1.37, we still have some things to do and probably some more conversation that we recess to a time certain tomorrow. Uh, I don't know if six would work for people or seven. I'm open to comments about that. Is there any support for that idea? Mr. Mayor, I support Mr. it. Mr. or not, yes. Mr. Mayor, I support it. Six or seven works for, for me. So are you making a motion? I'll make a motion that we reconvene. We recess and we reconvene at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Is there any support for that motion? Supported by Commissioner Hess. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, Clerk Borling, will you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Griffin. I mean, what's the reason for six? Vice Mayor Griffin. I'm sorry, I were we taking the role? I just heard Commissioner Urban ask about the time. Are we just are we just voting on whether or not we're going to do this tomorrow? No, I think it would, the the motion was for six o'clock tomorrow, right? Commissioner not? Correct. Yes. That was okay. the motion that was made in support. Of, so yes. If I say oh well, I mean I guess it doesn't matter what I say, everyone is gonna say what they want, but does Commissioner Urban need to be able to ask that question about the time now or after the motion is passed. Okay, I'm sorry, sure. Uh, is that discussion? Commissioner Urban, did you have a question? He, his picture looks frozen to me. Looks like he's frozen. Can you see me? Six. <laughs> Commissioner Urban. I'm okay. okay I, yeah, I'm not sure. I just didn't want to, I wanted to give him that opportunity to say um, okay. about six o'clock. Um, uh, but yes, I see that my uh, colleagues are exhausted. So for that reason, um, you know, we'll have to do what we have to do tomorrow. Clerk Borling, I'm sorry, you started to call the roll, right? Calling the roll. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Knott. Yes. Commissioner Pradle. Yes. <clears throat> He still froze. I don't know that uh, you were heard, Scott. Commissioner Urban. That is one heavy duty stare we're getting. Uh, excuse me. Did uh, Kirk Borling record my vote? I didn't, we didn't hear it, sir. Well, the, we have, I have an unstable connection right now. Okay. I want to have uh, the record show that my vote was yes. Okay. That's fine. You were the, you were the last one to be called. Okay. Uh, thank you, commissioners. The motion passes. So uh, just a quick little question here on protocol, attorney Robinson, do I then actually adjourn this meeting? No, the uh, meeting is a different language for it. You would say that this meeting is a recessed until 6 p.m. tomorrow evening. All right. Thank you. There's the language. So this meeting is recessed 
until 6 p.m. tomorrow evening. Uh, will there be any information that will be posted uh, so people will be able to access the meeting tomorrow evening at 6? I will work with IT to make sure notice is updated on the city's website. Thank you so much. So this meeting is now recessed. Uh, appreciate everybody for hanging in there. Keep your hearts open. Love you, Kalamazoo, and we'll see you tomorrow. Today, later.